This is Jocko Podcast number 381 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Also joining us tonight is Kelsey Sharon, who was in the Canadian Army. She served in Afghanistan, and she was actually on this podcast before number 288. And you may notice that podcast number 288 is not actually available because after it was released, I was contacted by some of the soldiers that she served with, and they asked if I would edit the podcast to not include some of the names of people involved in this specific operation that we talked about on the podcast because they didn't want some of the details about events that had occurred to be revealed to families of the wounded and families of the fallen. There were also some disagreements as to what had happened in combat and specifically to what Kelsey had done and had not done. And so my immediate reaction was just to take down the podcast um, very obviously because the families of the fallen are the priority. And so we took it down. We tried to edit that out. We also tried to edit out some of the contradicting stories of what had occurred in combat. And so we, we try to take some of those out. And once it was all edited and cut up in the end, after we had removed a bunch of the material, the, the podcast just didn't make sense anymore. So we just, we kept it down. And, I, and, and then because we were kind of gonna put it up and then we didn't put it up, I am at fault for not ever putting an explanation as to why we pulled it down and why I didn't repost it. And it left Kelsey in a bad spot because of my actions. So ultimately, and this was important to me, the soldiers that served with Kelsey, even and these, are, these are soldiers that reached out to me, and even the ones who had a very different perspective as to what had happened during this particular operation, even those soldiers told me that Kelsey had performed very well in her role and they were appreciative of what she had done and were appreciative of what she'd been through. And most important to me, they said that Kelsey had been a good soldier in combat. And because of that, and because I know that Kelsey has helped people deal with their own trauma I wanted to take this opportunity to get Kelsey back on here again and discuss her experiences at a high level and how she has gotten through and managed with her post-traumatic stress that she's been through. So with that, Kelsey, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me back. Oh, I, you like to catch people off guard there, don't you? <laughs> I, I honestly didn't think that was going to happen. Oh, I mean, I just wanted, I, I felt that I never explained to anybody why I pulled the, the last podcast down. And I just wanted to make sure people understood um, why I did and that it wasn't through any fault of yours. And that, you know, we pulled it down, we tried to edit it. It was a bunch of, it just ended up not really making sense. And so I figured the best thing to do would, would be leave it down and, and I know, and I also know that I drag, I kind of dragged my feet on that. And I kept saying, well, let us try and edit it again. And it, it just, it just never came out good. I think to be completely transparent with you, it's one thing to take it down. I think I sh- just should have been told before. Yeah. It went three weeks. And the only reason, um, the only reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is it actually just the saddest part for me wasn't the fallout of like the the loss of speaking gigs, the first book deal. It wasn't the blacklist from people in the community. It wasn't the Reddit pages. It wasn't the one guy that wrote you that email who walked it back after I threatened a defamation lawsuit. It wasn't any of that. It was that I got an opportunity after your show. That was a game changer. And for a podcaster, To get the opportunity to go sit with someone like Lex Friedman was a big, big fucking deal. And 
I had done something during the pullout that I actually wrote about in this afterwards because a lot of things have happened since. And so let me just finish this thought and then I'll go through. I think the thing that fucked me up the most wasn't that any of that stuff had happened. It was that I would tell this person who I just who just met me, who spent five hours recording with me and then took me out for dinner for my birthday, shut a restaurant down and built a friendship with, all to turn around and look at me and say, you lied to me, you used me, and because of that, I'm not gonna talk to you till he puts it back up. That broke my heart. Because I build relationships in this space and this was the first time my character had ever been, ever been questioned by fucking anyone. And so I looked up to, and still do, I, lo like, I looked up to you. Like when I met you, sorry Echo, you're a great deal too, man. But when I met you, it was a big deal because I look up to you from a military standpoint. You're a podcaster and I'm a podcaster and there's levels to that game, I get that. But I looked up to you, the man, the guy, the Navy SEAL, right? And for me, I knew you, what you, you explained to me what you were doing and why you were doing it. But then I had 13 pages of proof and written statements from five different people, including my platoon sergeant, my radio comms, and my medic, who confirmed everything and disproved everything in that email. Everything, every last point. Then I had five videos and then it went fucking dark and I had no one I could get a hold of. That pissed me off because I was like, this guy has his boot on my fucking neck and I've expressed what's going on. I've expressed how bad this fucked me up. And then I got through that and then when the Lex fallout happened, that broke me because I was building a friendship with someone who was willing to take time to help me kind of move through this space in a way where it was like, learn from mistakes. It was like somebody I could trust and I could start to talk to and be like, hey man, I'm doing this episode. Like I'm working on this, Would, you know, how's this edit or like this? Like he was willing to become a friend, not just like a guy's person. I went on a show and whatever, right? So that for me fucked me up. So the fallout actually from Lex was like what hurt. It was more disappointment that I wasn't contacted first because I know how you two roll and I know how this show rolls. And that's not how you guys do things. So that fucked me up because when all of a sudden I started getting inundated online and I got hit and I got drugged through the mud, like I got fucked and I got fucked hard because of this one guy. And after I threatened him with a lawsuit, he shut it down, fucking apologized, walked it back. So then what it actually did give me the opportunity to do because I don't believe there's losses and I don't believe that anybody goes through shit. So there's not a learning lesson on the end of this. This taught me a lot of patience, a lot of patience. I had to learn a lot. I had to learn about how I was gonna to learn to respond to things, so I'm appreciative for that. It gave me the opportunity to go back and call every motherfucker that stood side by side with me and get written statements and put it in this book. It got more photos, it got more videos, it got everything. And then the family members that he said that didn't approve that, I got written letters from them. So Hoppo and McLaren and every dude I say, I've got written proof that I can say their names everywhere I go. So I'm not showing up as this person who, who oh yeah, maybe kind of said she did what she said. It's like, I will beat somebody with this book. There's so much proof in it and evidence is disgusting. So I, it gave me the opportunity to show up for myself in a different way. And it really did. And it taught me a lot. <laughs> patience, patience, so much fucking patience. It, but I won't lie to you when I say when it, the fallout happened, I allowed, I said this on Cleared Hot a couple weeks ago, I allowed the trolls to eat me alive. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, spin me out of control. Like, had to go sit in the jungle in Peru and work on some serious shit because I could not move through it. And what got to me was like all these dudes that are friends of mine who are also mutual friends with you. And I'd be like, I know you're seeing him this weekend. Can you say something? Just ask him where it is. And they'd be like, no one wanted to piss you off. And I was like, oh, I see. So I waited it out. And then finally this year, I, and I, when I say I moved past it, I moved past it. I went away in uh, July, I had to.
I was a walking, ticking time bomb. And all that time that this happened, right after you and I sat down, my husband almost died. And we had to figure out and get a, like a diagnosis of a TBI, go down to Texas, use Defenders of Freedom, go do all this TBI treatment. So he was like literally dying and falling apart. I was losing my business because I lost so much fucking respect in the community. Abbotsford police canceled on me, major universities canceled on me. And it was all until Jocko puts it back up. Even Lex had to put a statement on his episode with me. I am aware that Jocko has taken the episode down and it's to edit out the names of the families. And so like even on my like last stuff. So I had to realize I can't read comments. I can't fucking listen to anyone unless it's five people around me. And if, if they say I'm doing the right thing and I'm focusing and I'm on the right path and I'm being a person I, I can be proud to wake up every morning, to be, then that's fine. Everyone else is just fucking noise. And I, that, I had to learn that. And so as fucked up as this whole situation was, and I know exactly why it happened, can, like it, I know exactly why it happened. This is what happens when individuals who are mentally unwell, who don't deal with their trauma, don't deal with their hurt, don't deal with their war pain. This is what happens when people stay here and don't get help. And then the people that do, that go up here, who have gotten help, that shows, that's just their ego talking. They're pissy because they're not in the situation I'm in. Look where I'm sitting. This is round two. I'm fucking lucky. I know that. But it didn't come from not working. It didn't come from not trying. It didn't come from not putting the fucking effort in even on the days I didn't want to put the effort in. So if you have a problem with me sitting in this chair, don't write anonymous letters. Fucking say it to my face. Because you won't. No one will. No one will even try. Because I can back up everything I say. And I have no issue with it. So it taught me a lot. And I'm okay with that. Now I am. It wasn't for a hot minute, like 24-7 rage. Full rage. Fucking Brady would, I'd just have a smile on my face and he'd be like, what is your problem today? I'd be like, nothing. He's like, you're vibrating anger. Like everything in me because I had no fucking recourse. I had nothing I could do. And then we, this Christmas, Brady was like, we're getting you a new watch. And I was like, whatever. He's like, we're taking old Apple things back. I was like, okay. So I found my old computer, just happened to have three more videos I didn't know I had. And they weren't like crazy videos, but it was like a pan shot with me with every guy I said I was and Major Calhoun and then my platoon sergeant and you could hear me talking. And then there was another one with uh, one of the guys and there was like uh, artillery going over top. And so I had no recourse. So I had to text your wife. She's like, please don't text me anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to do this. But I don't have another recourse other than showing up at your gym like a psychopath. Which was like, this close. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not happy about it. But I'm also surprised that you said what you said. So I, I can appreciate that. That's taking accountability. So, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to err on... Um you know, like f for me, it wasn't even as soon as I got an email that uh, like the families of the fallen, I was like, D pull it down. Like that was it. That's all I need to hear. And that's a knee jerk. Cool. I'm going to knee jerk like that every single time. And then the, everything else, I just had to just try and muddle through. And we tried to get it to where it was like a, a leaner podcast. And it just ended up being sh not very presentable. No, fine with that. But tell me that. Yeah. Tell me that not a year and a half later. Tell me that, tell me that, so I don't spin out of control. Tell me, hey, guess what? We tried, we did try. It was, it's just too lean, it's not, what well, our show's not good enough, come re-record it. And, it. and the only reason I think it was even on the radar is because like, I had to message your wife those videos. I said, mm. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't wanna be doing this. I don't wanna be texting you right now. You might be the last person that ever gets my wife's. Because uh, it's like from a couple uh, years ago. Um, phone number yeah she's she's because she doesn't like this kind of thing and i don't know? like it either i didn't but you gotta understand i didn't like it either man yeah i wasn't happy about it either but i had done the try to go through the friends thing but everyone's afraid of you i tried the no one wants to piss you off and get on the wrong radar literally i had seven separate people we know say that to me so i was like okay i i got no choice i said hey i just got these videos i don't want to bother you but jack's not responding so what do i do so she was like 
here, I will get them to respond. Like 30 seconds, she must have just called them and be like, fucking deal with this. <laughs> so I don't care. What, whatever got it done, got it done. But I can tell you I'm persistent and I won't. It's my name. So why wouldn't I be? This isn't something small. This is who I am on this planet. All right. So you're back. You're here. I am. Let's talk through your life, okay. which is how the book is laid out. Um, starts in the beginning. It does. Canadian girl. Talk to me. Oh, yeah. I mean, fortunately and unfortunately, now it is. It's not as proud to say it as it used to be. But uh, yeah, I'm from a small town, from a really small town called Campbellford. And it's a uh, farm town, born and raised like 45 minutes from there. And um, my parents are truck drivers, just like normal, everyday, hardworking people. And um, I grew up there and I started fighting when I was about four. So Taekwondo and martial arts were my life up until about 19. I took a brief gap there when I was a teenager and then got back into it when I was in the military. But um, my mom decided it was gonna be it was gonna be a thing where, you know, my kids are never gonna just have nothing to do. So they're constantly gonna be in, in, in a sport and then, you know, they're gonna be an athlete of some type. So for me, it ended up being soccer and Taekwondo and then very quickly moved into just Taekwondo. And that became Taekwondo every other day to every day to two a day to coaching to training to national level. And I just, I ran through it. There was something about being able to control the situation yourself and something about for me, it was always the smallest version. I was always the smallest version of like the weight class or like whatever we were fighting. And so it was like, it, there was always that underdog type tone to my life. There was never a, um, oh yeah, the, she's, that's a given, that's a given. You know what I mean? So for me, I really liked the fact that I could have to show up. I like to be challenged and I like to show up when I say I'm gonna show up and that's in, in anything. So, so I moved through that stage of, uh, Taekwondo quite well. I did very good. Uh, didn't lose a lot when I was younger, which was really nice. Um, and then when you did lose, that was a hard learned lesson, which was never fun. Um, I remember the last time I lost, I was uh, kicked in the face. I just woke up on the ground. Mm -hmm. It was like full. What are the rules when you're a kid doing Taekwondo? How does it work? Um, so for me, you, um, oh geez, it's gonna be a little different than it is now because things have changed a bit. But for me, I could fight uh, girls and boys up until like 11, 12. And for me, we couldn't, you weren't allowed to get, at least in my club, we weren't allowed to get a black belt to a minimum of like 11 or 12. So, and that was, you know, you had to start way, it's kind of like jujitsu, you gotta go, go a hot minute with it and work all the way through the belt. So, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of, now it's different because they use an electronic uh, sensor system for the Olympics and stuff like that. So when you're fighting, you have sensors on your, on your feet, almost like a sock, and then your hogus have sensors. And then the head shots are just three points. So the Hogus would, if your foot doesn't hit perfectly, mm -hmm. it doesn't score. So when I was fighting, that kind of came in a little later on. So when I was fighting, if you were aggressive enough and you kicked hard enough, even if someone blocked it and you key up really loud with it, it was like, you know, because there was refs in like each corner, mm. you would you would get a point. The guy didn't quite see it. This guy would mark it. Headshots are obvious. You can always kind of see those. But as I got older and got through that, that started to come into the system. And then um, ultimately in my last couple of years, that was how the system worked and I didn't like it. Can you get in trouble in Taekwondo for kicking someone too hard like in the head? I thought that was part of it. I thought it was like you, do you know this Echo? You never did this? I, I, I thought you couldn't, I thought you weren't supposed to like full on knock someone out. You weren't supposed to kick people in the head. Uh, headshots were super important, they're three points. I mean, you don't kick on the back of the head. Mm -hmm. The back of the head is like the hard no, like you don't try to do that. I don't think you're supposed to try and take someone's head off anyway, but it happens where somebody could be in to do a, like a spin kick and another person could be coming in and it just claps right at this right time mm -hmm. and just hits the jaw. I mean, I've definitely seen people get knocked out oh, yeah. in Taekwondo matches, but it always seemed like it was a bad thing. Like they were like, oh, this guy got knocked out and like it shouldn't have happened. Maybe, really? uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong. No, no, I mean. I, I never did Taekwondo, there so. might, Yeah, there, there might be uh, maybe a, a truth to that in somewhere, but I mean, where I grew up, it was very much like headshots are three points. Like, How much is a body shot? I think it's just one. I mean, I haven't fought in a long time, so bear with me here. Last time I fought, I was 19. Mm -hmm. So, so you so you accumulate points. How like how long do you how long is a round? Is so it rounds? The, yeah, they go by rounds, and then I know once you hit black belt or a certain level or a certain weight, um, like a certain level, you move, you do like three rounds. So it'd be like, for me when you're younger, it was like two rounds, like 45 seconds in between each rounds, like a minute, 
sometimes sometimes a minute and a half. And then there's one ref in the middle and then to be scorekeepers on the corners, then you have your coach and your coach here. And then when you hit like a certain level, then it's three rounds, 45 per second in between, and it's like two minute or one and a half minute kind of rounds. Um, but for me, it was like, I always aim for the head. It's the most points. You know, if you can get someone, you don't want to, you don't want to try to break their face. I mean, head, head mm-hmm. here, this is more of like an ax kick when you're coming down, something along those lines where you slap the face and that's how noses get broke a lot. But um, I was never discouraged it was never like try not to kill someone. <laughs> like don't don't try to go out and like rip their head off, but like cuz you need to be able to pull your leg back so that you can get back at it. But I knew people who they would they would come in, they'd roundhouse somebody, but then they would do this thing where they kind of like take their hip and drag their foot with it so then the head kind of goes with it, which I never liked. I think that was really an asshole move, but cuz um, it was like too much. Yeah, it was You just, already got your points. Hey, it's fucking snap back. The whole point is like quick snap, move, right? Bounce, quick snap, move. And so when when that it just seems it seems silly to me. So you're doing Taekwondo yeah. at your peak. How many hours a day of Taekwondo were you training? Oh, that was national level. So I was fair. I mean, I was like 12, 13. Um, I was doing a minimum of an hour in the morning. So my mom would take me in the morning and it would be me and like one or two other girls that would train with my, my coach. And then my mom would stay and then she would take me to school. And then the odd time, depending on the day, I would go at lunch just to do like a 30 minute, because my school was walking distance to my club, so it was perfect. And then after school, I would do a training session, but then I also did like, I would coach, like so I would train, I would would teach some classes, it's kind of like payment, so once I hit black belt, that's when I could start teaching and just helping out and like supporting the club. So I would train my class, but then afterwards I would stay and like help coach and teach and then I would go home. And then it got to a point where my parents lived 45 minutes from the club, so, what I would do is I'd, I'd bus in or my mom would drop me off in and then I would stay for a couple days a week with my coaches at their house and I would just live with them because they were husband and wife. So at that, and it was, and that was easy. And then they would take me to school and then I would help with their daughter. It was just kind of, just kind of all worked out well. So I was probably at my peak. And then when I was in the military, the last, right before Afghanistan, I fought a little bit, that kid's say, And then uh, I did a little after. And then after that, I'd, I, wait, Weight classes, man. We were just talking about this with Rebecca Rouse. Uh, she's here, and uh, we we're talking about like weight classes and like having to go up or go down. Like that, as a female, once you get past puberty, is rough on the system. And like it's doable, and everybody can cut weight, but it's like at a certain point, it's like it affects your hormones. It's unhealthy, and it's like I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to be in the sauna with fucking suit on. What skipping. weight class were you? Oh man, when I was tiny, I was like I was tiny fin, so I was like seventy six pounds, and that yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then when you move up, I, I think I would have been, I fought flyweight, which I should have been Finn, but I fought fly, because I was like on the bubble, and it was the US Open in Las Vegas, so I wasn't sure if I was gonna make weight. I was like teetering, and I was really struggling to cut. Like I couldn't I couldn't seem to get that one extra pound without it really hurting, like the hydration. Yeah, well, when you're 76 pounds, like mm-hmm. one pound is a lot of weight. Well, when <laughs> I fought in the, yeah, well that was when I was a bit younger, but when I fought in Vegas, it was, it was flyweight, so I think it was like 108, and then the next one down was 103, and so I was, I was teetering at like 103, 104. And I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't seem to get that one pound. And if you didn't make weight, you just don't fight. That's just it. So I was like, well, I don't want to risk it. So I'll just move up to fly weight. What a living hell mistake that was. Because <laughs> everyone is my weight, who's like up to 108, but like 5'7", five, 5'11". Five, so my first round was with a girl from Chinese Taipei. And she just fucking just came out and just, kept me in at a distance with her headshots. Just like a pop, one after the other, pop. And I'm, like, I'm getting nowhere here. So I finally do get inside, but I am i was never really trained with that system. So when I kick, like I can kick hard and I can pivot really fast, but I don't necessarily, my foot doesn't sit perfectly where the sensor's on the top of the foot with the hogu, so it's not scoring. So now I'm just getting frustrated. She just keeps kicking me in the head. I lost my first round, I was like, out. I was like, I don't wanna do this anymore. And that was what age? Uh, 19. And are you, uh, when you're in high school, are you doing good in school, like from a grades perspective? No, I'm the terrible, uh, I'm terrible <laughs> in school. I, uh, yeah, no, for me, for school, like I got into, I just stopped Taekwondo um, right as I went into high school. And it was like the worst time for that to happen, right? Because it was my entire identity, then my coach went to prison, and then I, after that, I didn't trust anyone, so I wouldn't train with anyone. So then I was just angry. And your coach went to prison for um, he, molesting someone? Yes, well, they, so she was my training partner. And she was like a year or two older than me. And it went on for two years. It was called a relationship slash statutory rape. 
So he went to prison for statutory rape of a minor. And then you don't have a coach anymore. Don't have a coach. Don't trust anyone. And that anyone. happened as you went to high school? Yeah, yeah, right at that pivotal like transition point there. So then you get to high school and you're you're not very great at school. Listen, <laughs> I I was because when I was in school, like the deal was like I could do my homework, I could train. My dad was a truck driver, so I would go with him for a couple weeks at a time, and I'd do a book report. The teachers were pretty good. I. I wasn't like a failing student. I was like, if I applied myself, I would have been an A student. But like, I didn't like what I was learning. I never enjoyed it. So same problem everyone else has. So when I went into high school, I went, <laughs> I was in a Catholic school in elementary, but then I went into a, like a Catholic Catholic school where it's like religion was a class and you had to wear a kilt. Girls had to wear the kilts. I don't like kilts. I'm not a kilt person. Sorry, Dean. But kilts are just weird. And so I had to go into this school and I, I was angry. I was super angry. Um, I didn't trust anyone. Didn't trust men. That's for damn sure. And I just thought everyone was going to let me down. Everyone's going to let me down. Everyone's going to fuck with me. And that's just like how life is. Like the person I trusted the most, like he started training me at four, him and his wife. His wife was a world champion. She was a bad dude. She was like such a good fighter. Um, and he was a huge, huge fighter. Like this guy was prominent. Our grandmasters and our masters were coming from Toronto. So I was like, I trusted this guy. And then that just ruined it all. So then I started... Uh, I started playing rugby and then I mean that's where a lot of the rage <laughs> that's where a lot of the rage would come out which was perfect for me because I was small enough that I could be a fly half or a scrum and I could you know I could I could run so I really got into that in high school and then started focusing on that for a little bit and women's rugby I know is the same as men's rugby mm -hmm. is yeah. girls rugby the same as boys rugby Men's rugby the same as women's rugby as girls boys. I th what do you mean? I think so, so I know that women's rugby. Yes, there's the same rules like yes. for instance in in women's lacrosse It's different rules. Okay, and it's a much different sport. Okay in girls lacrosse same thing It's a much different sport women's rugby is the same as as men's rugby right. like it's full-on I don't know if girls rugby is the same as boys rugby, which boys rugby is the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's full on. It's full on it's, just tackling. Yeah, oh, 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 yeah, like you mean like that. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. I, I thought you meant like it was played a little differently, like because there's sevens and then there's fifteens. Mm, no, like, no, no. I meant like, I'd like the one, like um, hockey. Or, oh, like because we can't, we can't, yep. we can't hit in hockey, yep. but men can hit in hockey. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it, women are vicious. Yeah, Rug yeah, yeah, for sure. I've watched uh, women play rugby. Very impressive. Yeah, they'll grab you by the ponytail and just pull you back from that and they'll just palm your face and it, there's no issues with that and everyone just and the you never want to be at the bottom of the scrum with women because they will in, like intentionally take the metal cleats to your face like they they love it um i know women who pop their mouth goes out and like bite like it's it's it gets catty fast um but yeah i played i played nine to grade nine to yeah, after I got out of high school there. So I played for a while, I played for a couple different teams. And what did you, when you're, is it the same in high school in Canada? Like do you have freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and then you graduate at around age 18? Uh, I mean, I started, a, so grade, we went to, mine was uh, one to nine, uh, one to eight for elementary and then nine to 12, and I graduated at 17. And that's your high school? And that's okay, it, high cool. school, so yeah. So that, that is the same as America. When you were, let's say, 15, what were you thinking you were going to do with your life? That's the thing. I didn't have a plan because my whole plan, I was on the fighting path. Like that was my career. I wanted to be an athlete. I didn't, I was told I could do it. So, okay, I'm going to do it. Like that's what I wanted to do. I put my, my life, my passion, my everything into, I wanted to be a Taekwondo fighter. Taekwondo fighter. I wanted to go to Pan Ams. I wanted to go to the Olympics. I wanted to represent Canada. Like I always wanted to do that. That was never in my mind that like, there was not a day. I think I tried a summer off. It lasted three days, four days, and I was doing sit-ups in the living room. My mom's like, okay, you just, we'll just go back. I couldn't do it. I couldn't stop, um, and I loved it. So that was the path was athlete. Now, when I went into to school and things like that, like, yeah, I didn't give me as many phys ed classes as I can get. That's that'll, That works for me. So I didn't have a path. I didn't have a plan. I didn't – I mean, even now when I think back, like, what would have I done if I didn't join the military? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if it would have been good. I don't, I mean, I'm not a type A personality. Maybe I would have landed as a cop. Like, I, I honestly, I can't picture anything else. So you were 
kind of wandering in high school. Super wandering, yeah, yeah. I had to wear a kilt, didn't like anyone. Oh, that's right, because it was a Catholic school. Catholic school. Had to go, had what to kind do of music did you like? Oh, <laughs> I wish I brought photos. That's good. Um, I was into super emo, screamo, Alexis on fire, like that kind of stuff. I used to go to like concerts and listen to like As I Lay Dying and like mosh pits and the whole thing. So I was like, I was a dark, <laughs> angry little mm. ball of a human who just... Who needed an outlet really desperately? I I always kind of ask that question, and I think it used to mean more than it does now. Because when I was a kid, which is I'm I'm I think I'm actually a lot older than you. I mean, you're not that. I'm 51. Much it's just a number. So, but when I was younger, you really couldn't. There wasn't like nowadays. People can listen to a, a wide mm-hmm. genre of music because it's kind of all on. The internet, right. where you can watch anything for free, and you can get into different stuff. When I was a kid, you were basically only going to be into one, <laughs> maybe right. two kinds of music. So if you knew what somebody was into, you kind of knew what they were like when they were. At least you have that part of their personality down. Nowadays, someone could be like, "Oh yeah, I like you know, I like Agnostic Front, and I like the Bad Brains, and I like some country western band, and I like uh, Taylor Swift." Sure. By the way, yeah, yeah. sure. Who Taylor likes, Swift. Who, you like Taylor I don't. Swift? I don't, I was recently on a trip with one of my friends who's their daughter's a huge Taylor Swift okay. fan. And so I was just listening to them talk about, I don't know, and they told me one song that I did recognize, but I don't know any Taylor Swift songs. And okay. I'm sorry, Taylor Swift, if you're listening to this. I just, I'm, and I have three daughters, so it's weird to not know. And I think they were kind of liked Taylor Swift. You're, Am I am I missing I something? Feel no, like no, you, I feel correct. like you probably know one. Like if you no, would hear they, it. They told me one and I was like, oh yeah, I recognize that Shake song. it off. Is it the shake it off Pro- one? Yeah, I think it was something like that. Yeah. I was like, oh, it's a little catchy tune. Shake yeah, yeah. Good but, <laughs> but these days you can listen to like, actually I had, a, I had a really good, you know, as a parent. Sure. I mean, you have some moments as a parent where you're like, all right, we're, we're doing something right. Mm. I walked into the garage gym the other day. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And my 13 year old daughter was in there doing squats mm-hmm. and listening to Led Zeppelin. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so I, I can't walk back down to the house and like high five my wife and I said, we got something on here, you know, we're yeah. going in the right direction. My point is that, okay, so that was you, yeah. you had freaking, you were in the zone. I had, um, I used to have uh, big spacers in my ears. I used to have about oh, 20 dang. different uh, earrings in here. I had three in my tongue, one in my nose. Like, And this is in the Catholic school. Um, I started to uh, I started to do my ears on my own with safety pins. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my mom would let me color my hair, whatever I wanted. What was the purpose for this? <sighs> I liked. I like tattoos. I like piercings. I like, I, I don't know. I was always kind of like, it was also one of those things where it was like, my mom was like, just never pierce your face. Like, just don't pierce your face. And then she took me to get my nose pierced at 14. Mm-hmm. So like, you created a monster. You gave me permission. Now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna see how far that permission can go. And when you look back, was it like a rebellious thing? Like you're trying to show your parents like, hey, I'm a rebel, you can't no. really control me? No, I, I had it's a lot more of- like just what you were into? I just think I was into it. I had a lot of respect for my parents. Like uh, my my mom and I were so similar that we butted heads. Now I see it and understand why. It wasn't like I didn't like her. I mean, she was basically a single mom and my dad was on the road for a couple of weeks at a time, right? With two kids in two different sports and like a boy and a girl and what like- the, What sports did the boy play? Uh, your my, brother. My brother was a motocross racer. Mm. Um, and then what else did he do? Uh, he got into soccer a little bit. He tried Taekwondo, but his hips are locked and they don't, they, sorry, don't, they're so bad. They don't move. Um, and then he got into football, um, but racing moto, moto was like serious in our family. Dad would go with him on the weekends. Mm. Mom would go with me on the weekends. Like it was serious. Yeah. So you're this little kind of, uh, pierced faced <laughs> angry ball <laughs> angry kid and then you graduate high school yeah and now what do you do when you graduate high school so for me i uh, left that catholic school halfway through and i went to another school that was close to my parents um that one was a little different played rugby there that was a that was the farm town that was like the i was like the weirdo <laughs> because i walked into the school and they're all like wearing plaid button-up shirts and they all like work on farms like they you know they all had that kind of vibe to mm-hmm. them um and uh until I started dating one of those people, and then it was like, oh, she's okay. Um, <laughs> and then, as as you do in high school, you have like your your like the worst breakup of what you think is going to be your entire mm. life. And I was like, I need out of this town. And then, uh, wait, what would you just say? I need out of the town. Like, I just oh, need to run oh, away. God, like, yeah, it's yeah. so dramatic. Um, and then I 
I went to uh, college in Ottawa for the first program I could get accepted to at Algonquin, which was travel and tourism, which means nothing. Yeah, I, I don't know what, what that means. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Uh, what year is this? That was 07. Okay. So 07, you're in your first year of college. I, yeah, my first month of college. <laughs> Cause your I, first month of college. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I went to uh, play soccer. I only made it about halfway through the tryouts, which worked out kind of perfect because then I went into my classes, hated them. November rolled around, and then I went down to Remembrance Day, and that's when I met the lady on the bus. And this woman was a uh, military? Yes. And... What was the initial contact? Was it eye contact? What was it? Was it was her uniform and how she carried herself. She was in the Air Force and she just had like the row of medals and she just looked perfect. Like she just looked like you, you when you see in a movie where you have those like weird moments in movies where um, like there's like the catalyst or the, the, the turning point in the movie where mm-hmm. you look and there's like the lights kind of shining on them, the kind of the way they light it. Cause I know you like lighting. I'm talking to you for lighting here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. She's talking to Echo by the yeah, way. For I'm sorry. Cause um, I don't care about lighting. Yeah, he doesn't care about letting. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, but it's like, it's just one of those moments where it's kind of like, ah, like, I don't know. And I was drawn to her. I always, but I had always liked the mil, not the military, but I always like had this respect for soldiers. Like we were, we always did Remembrance Day. Our schools always did it. We always wrote poems. We already participate. We always wear the poppy. You guys don't do poppies, but we do poppies, which is the red poppy on the, on the left. And then, um, I don't know how long we're gonna be able to do that for anymore, but we're doing that still right now. And uh, I just, I wanted to talk to her. She just had this kind of aura about her that just seemed like she was a cool person. And you had like a freaking black concert t-shirt on and piercings in your face. Did you go over to and yeah. say something to her? Yeah, I did. And then yeah. what'd you say? Like, I just said, I, I don't remember the exact words, but I, she ended up talking to me about her life a little bit. And um, she was like one of the first females that could fly and she had, served for like some I mean she was super old mm. I mean she meaning she was probably like 40 no she <laughs> was like like legit like <laughs> did you do time in Nam slash did you do time further on like she shouldn't be on the bus by herself like maybe she needs some assistance kind of elderly type so she was just in her uniform for it was remembrance day oh okay, it was remembrance day it, yeah no it. just because she sits on the bus <laughs> no, and strolls. I was like, well I thought maybe she was active duty no, so God, she was no. older. No, she no, was she much was, older. Yeah, much, much older. Got no, no, no. It. She, um, it was Remembrance Day. So that's November 11th. So that's Veterans Day for you guys. So you mm-hmm. guys say happy Veterans Day, right? I don't, I, there's, there's some level of controversy about this. I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, there's some controversy about Veterans Day, about what you, there's proper salutation and what you should say or what right. you shouldn't say. I think the happy Veterans Day, I think is okay because it's supposed to be appreciative of veterans. So not for us But though. not for Memorial Day, right? So you shouldn't say yeah. happy Memorial Day because it's like a day of remembrance. So you guys have- That is our that day. Is your remembrance, that is our remembrance, so day. you so wouldn't say it there. No, 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 and we don't have a Memorial Day. So we Remembrance Day is like the day of- That's Memorial Day. Yeah, that's Memorial Day, but on November 11th right. for us. So she was down there and I go to those ceremonies a lot. Like I always go. My mom and dad used to take us like just teaching us like we have to go pay respect. Like, this is what we do. You shake their hand, you say thank you for your service and you live your life. Like mm-hmm. it's like an hour ceremony, you stop at 11, everyone stops, that's it. So I was on my way back uh, from the ceremony. So she must've been going the same direction. And uh, I was on the bus and I just chatted with her and I got off and like, again, like this movie moment where you feel this kind of like uh, pulled to something that you don't really understand why and just decided I was gonna join the army. And then you go to a recruiter, like how, how long does that process take? It went fast for me. So I went into the recruiter's office like the next week, did a little bit of Googling, um, went into the recruiter's office in uh, Gatineau outside of the Gatineau Mall there. And I walked in and said, I want to join the military and I want to do something on the front lines. And she was like, okay, but <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? Um, and then she said, but here's the thing, like anything that you... If you do your paperwork, anything that you join, anything that if it's on the front lines, truly like a front lines position, like it's dag red, meaning like we need people, so you will deploy. Would you say dag red? Like dagged red. Dagged so like you'd be like dag green or dag red, meaning deployable, non deployable. Okay. And like for red was like we they needed people in the service because that was rotating the most. Like those are the bases that were turning people every like six months. A new base would go and replace and rip out, and then it'd be a new set of new, new set of Canadians. So. Um, so I picked one of the, uh, one of the jobs initially they said, and they said it was too small. And then I picked artillery and they're like, okay. But I was like, but infantry is too small. 
but our artillery fits. And they're like, yeah. How much is the runway? 100 pounds. Okay. It makes sense. Logic. Do, do you weigh more than 100 pounds? I do now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, I'm at 108. Uh, then did you weigh more than 100 pounds? Or probably around there? Probably around there. Because I still like, like when I... When I was in high school, going into college, like I was still very much an athlete. Like when I, I didn't just like play rugby for fun. Like I still raced moto, I still ran, I still did everything, like stayed really up on my fitness. That was something that like I needed to be doing. It was a big part of my identity. And then I went and tried out for the college soccer team. So like I was fit, I was right. ser- fairly fit for So it. you were good to go. Mm-hmm. And then you, they said no to infantry. Right. Because you're too small. Yeah, I think they were more worried about weight. Just like constant carrying of the weight. Yeah, for sure. It's freaking brutal. Yeah. You know, um, there's no other and, way to put it. And yeah, and if you're, that would be, you know, me carrying 100 pounds is half my body weight. You yeah. carrying 100 pounds is your body weight. It's that means me carrying 200 pounds. Right. Or actually, I weigh 225. For yeah. Anyone that's and gonna then freak out and listen yeah. and be like, well, yeah, yeah. Get it right. Yeah, yeah. Get it right, brother. <laughs> We've been through that before, mm-hmm. haven't we? Uh, so I weigh yeah. 225 pounds. Oh. And. If I that would mean I would have to carry 225 pounds, right. which 225 pounds for me to carry is really, really, really hard. Yeah. That's a lot of weight to carry. So for someone to carry their body weight, it's a ton. So they say no to that, yeah. but then they say yes to artillery, which is also kind of interesting, just because you're gonna still gonna be carrying a ton of weight. Which I did. Hey, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know their reasoning, but they said yes. So I said, okay, cool, sounds great to me. I don't want to be in a tank. I'm claustrophobic. I, it's like a tin can. I don't like that. Mm. The idea of like. Think of like popcorn and like a microwave inside of a bag. I'm just like. The weird thing for you is you'd be like. Perfect. Kind of stoked in a tank. <laughs> I was a RWS system gunner for the T labs. Mm-hmm. So I love that. Yeah. I was in the little, in the turret just fucking underneath and everyone was all tight and I could fit all my gear on and not have yeah. to take anything off. Like it was perfect. How long before you left for boot camp? Oh man, I, J- I, January that year. Like, like how the, long J- from I signed the papers to I'm leaving for boot camp? A uh, month and a half. Okay, just under two months. It was it was fairly fast. That's they, good. They shouldn't give you much time to think. No, about they it. shouldn't. They need to just get your ass in the vehicle and like. Yes. I'm surprised they don't pull you up day of. Like, oh, you want to join? Cool. Sign mm-hmm. here. Boom, you're gone. Yeah. They used to do that. Really? Can do it. They used to do that. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't do that to people nowadays. No. You get sued, sued for something. <laughs> <laughs> you get sued for sure. So a month and a half. Yeah. What did your parents think about this whole scene? Again, they knew I was a type A type A personality. I'd always been more of a tomboy. I had always, you know, wore the tearaway pants and the, you know, the the socks and the sandals. Like my parents were like, <laughs> she's gonna go, she's gonna go do something a little more aggressive. We we expected that. Now we didn't expect the military though, because I didn't hunt. I never shot guns. I was never exposed to them. I never enjoyed them, but they were never part of my life. When you think of the military and the act of war, you think guns. I didn't have any interest in guns. So for me it was more of a this seems like it's a good fit for her because it's going to challenge her physically and it's going to challenge her psychologically. So we support it and they were happy, happy enough to, to they actually dropped me off. So. so you leave now in January of 2008. Is that right? Uh, 2008. Yeah. 2008. Yeah. So do you know when you sign up that you're going to go deploy to Afghanistan? Yeah. So they gave us like, I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know the, the whole, they don't tell you that, but they, they tell you like we're, Canada is involved. I think this speech was like, Canadians are involved in an active military war. We are not a united, like we're not UN. We are part of a fighting force that will rotate. If you do one of these jobs, you will end up deploying, period. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. That's pretty cool. Well, it was more of a, don't be shocked if you go somewhere here soon, like real soon, like in a rapid pace. Yeah, it's good that they set expectations that way, but it'd also be cool if that was kind of a guarantee. And again, I'm just going back to like my own personal life where if they could have told me like you're guaranteed to go to war everyone i know would have been like sign me up i Um, hear that now too though right i hear a lot of people like uh like not to like tangent off of this sorry but uh i went to gauge town what what month are we right now the end of last year Mm -hmm. i got invited back by the canadian military like who never called and then they called last year Mm -hmm. and we're like hey you never got to shoot your last round and as a gunner that's oh, your, is that like a thing? Yeah, yeah. We get to shoot one more, one more, one more pull at the lanyard there, and uh, you never got that. So we want to, we want to give that to you. That's cool. Yeah. So they brought me out and did it, and it was a whole thing. But, um, but that's I talked to, uh, you know, a whole new group of soldiers that were on the range, like rounds down, and we all talked, and they made a huge thing out of it, right? So I was talking to all these people, da 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 da, and uh, I was like, 
I'm like, have you guys ever deployed? They're like, oh no, none of us have. We've all, you know, we're all just kind of waiting, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. So mm -hmm. we just go to the range and we do X's and we train. And I was like, oh, yeah. I, I don't know what it's like to be in when it's not an active war. Yeah. That's they're going to have to maintain the training standards until the next war comes around. And that's what the country needs from them. I've had people that have been guilt, felt guilty. You know, they're like, I was only in from, you know, 93 to 97. I never did anything. I feel like it. And I'm always like, hey, man, you held the line when you did what the country asked you to do. That's right. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And and then for everyone else that's praying for war. And I know you young bastards are out there praying <laughs> for war. We know it. I know it. Just cool. Careful what you wish for, mm -hmm. um, which I got told to, and it never, never, it never pulled a prayer for, for war from my lips one time. So uh, that's the way it goes when you're young and dumb. Um, so you get to boot camp. How's boot camp? Shock? Oh yeah, they start yelling right away. I mean, sorry, Kath. My mom yelled a lot. Mm -hmm. It didn't freak me no out. No factor for you. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like yeah. That was our form of communication, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Uh, legitimately, yeah. So uh, when I got, it wasn't mu as much of a shock as it was that all of my staff were French and like thick accent French. So when they would yell at you though, they would speak really fast. So you didn't always understand them. So you would make nicknames for them and things like that. So it was more of a shock to the system there. Um, now looking back, knowing signs and symptoms of like TBI and PTS and stuff like that. Holy shit, some of my staff were, uh, mm there was some trauma there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were part of like first rotations all going through, right? And they, they had all done like Bosnia before and they had all done, a couple of them had done like uh, a few other type, you know, gigs that end up causing some issues. And mm -hmm. now I understand why they were whipping chairs and hair triggers and it wasn't an act for some of them. For some of it was, it was Yeah, because for some of them it is an act. Oh! Like the, Mar I the Marine Corps is pros. And I know, I, I guess I know more about the Marine Corps drill instructors, but that's part of their thing. Like they, they're going to put on a little act for, yeah. to, to set that image and everything. And they're told, they know what they're doing. Yeah. And that's, and I think that's fine. I think that there should be a, a, a level of intensity that has to be brought forth all the time when someone is training. I think that's what makes people strong is if you, are not used to that level of intensity and you're not used to that and you go into a situation where now that's being presented constantly, you're not gonna know how to work in that. Mm -hmm. So I accept that. I understand it's a part of the process and you have to do it, but it was more, it was, uh, basic was, f was fun mm -hmm. for me. Again, it was a challenge, something I had to learn, things I had to get good at, and I was good at the fitness part. And if you were good at the fitness part, you were fine because we were on the ninth floor of the mega and the mega, the only people who got to use the elevators were the staff. And if you got caught using the elevators, your whole room was going out the window and then you're gonna carry it all up the stairs. So mm. we were on the ninth floor. And um, again, I was physically fit. So stairs were not an issue. So when we had to go down for breakfast, I down and quick up, like when we had to come back in from like PT, I was up quick. So I got first showers, I got to eat first. I was always ready first, just cause I was faster than other people in our pod. So it worked out okay for me. How long is Canadian boot camp? It's like 12 or 13 weeks. They've been changing. Mm -hmm. And you get done with that and then you go to like the advanced school for artillery? Uh, first, uh, we did SQ first, which was like all weapons. So grenades, uh, Carl Gustafs, uh, machine guns, C7s, like C7, C8s, like all the stuff that you're gonna use. Does everybody go to that school? I think anybody who's combat arms Got does. It. I. <sighs> and then how long is that school? Oh, that's only four weeks. And then artillery and school. And then artillery. But we did ours in the same spot. Because most of the people that I was in basic with, quite a few of them were uh, artillery or infantry or, or uh, combat engineer. And so most of us got sent to Gagetown because the combat engineers are above us, the artillery were on this floor, and then infantry were on another floor because the RCR are out there. The W battery is out there. That's where my sergeant, um, Mark LeBlond, he, who was with me in Vecchietta, he's actually posted to Gagetown. He was the one who got the artillery for me to go shoot my last round. So he like organized all that, but he's out in Gagetown. So that's where they're like, the school is and W battery is, yeah. Did you like the army when you got in? I love the army. I love the army. Cause I didn't have to think about what I had to wear. I didn't have to think of what I had to do. And if I could just follow orders enough and show up physically, I was winning. It's not difficult. Just don't be stupid. Shut your mouth. That's it. Just just follow in line. There'll be a time for you to make decisions. Most of the time, unless you're in a leadership position, there's not. So just accept that and move forward with it. But I, I liked the Army because I had...
to show up every day if I wanted to be successful. And that was real. Like if you didn't show up, you fall behind, it's a problem. And then if you're my size and then you're one of the only women in the unit and you fall behind, it's even more of a problem. So you don't be the problem. As long as you're not the problem, then you're fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really liked the military when I got in. And it seems like you did too. Yeah, it was fun. I think, I think if you look back at it now, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but you learn a lot about yourself, right? And I, I like figuring out who I am. I like challenging who I am or what I think my lines are or what I think the standard is for me. Like I like the constant having to figure it out. So it was fun for me at the time. So then what do you do when you're done with all that training? Now you're in your, what do you go into a battalion? So, so we did SQ and then we did DP one. And that's when we switched from, um, you know, people who were other engineers and infantry and things like that. And then we went into where they, um, we moved into just artillery. So then we went to like, not with W battery, but artillery schools there. And then we started to learn the 105s and the mortars. So we did all of that. And then on graduating on the parade, um, the I think it was the RSM of Ekitse came to our graduation and was like, you, 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 and you, and you are all being posted to Val and- What's Val? Vakitse. It's, it's the French base in Quebec. Got it, okay. Yeah, and um, it's a combat arms base, so they have like the Van Duzer out of there. Um, I can't remember what the armored guys are called out there. And then the five Ralk are out of there. So we got posted, and originally I wasn't supposed to be going there. Originally I was supposed to be going to Petawawa, but there was another guy in our troop, our gun troop, when we did the last week of training where we were out in the field and it was really, really hot, his kidneys started failing. And we found out that there was like too much creatine use happening and he was... <laughs> I'm serious. I'm dead, deadly serious. And then Labonte, Mariev Labonte, who was my officer, I kind of brought it forward. Like, hey, can I, can I swap out? Like, because if he's gonna go, he can't be deployed. He can't be deployed. It's too hot. He can't. He can't be in the sun. His kidneys will fail. So they're gonna. He can't go to Val because Val's deploying next. So then what happened was his dad was an officer at Petawawa, and I asked if we could trade. So we swapped posting. So I ended up going to Val, and he ended up going to Petawawa. So then Mary Eve Levante, who was my officer there, she came to Vakete with me as well. She deployed, but she was just on a different gun. So you get stationed attached to what unit? Yeah, so I was I went to Five Relk, the the Saint Aurel C, so it's the the fifth uh, Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. That's where you show up. And that's where I show up in I think it was August. Yeah, August of uh where's, 2008. Where's that geographically compared to where you grew up? Okay, so I grew up in Ontario. So if you think uh, Ontario's here, uh, Quebec's to the right of it, um, and I grew up in a really small town, so I'm probably about eight, uh, eighteen plus hours. Hours. Yeah. So you're Drive. not you're not by home anymore. No, not not even, re- not remotely close yeah. to you're, home. You're not going to be seeing your parents on the weekends or anything. Well, like no. That. Well, basic training was in uh, Quebec as well at Saint Jean. So that one was about five hours. So, because uh, my parents lived two hours from Ottawa, then from Ottawa to uh, there's a couple hours, and then uh, where I was posted was north of Quebec City. So I was like way above where there was any English speak any any English speaking people. So you show up, and then are you guys immediately in a workup preparing to deploy as soon as you get there? It was funny. We showed up that day, and uh, I was with I think there was like three or four other guys that were English speaking. We all show up. They all got put and had to go do duty work right away, and then I got to just hang out. Okay. Mm. How's that? Because <laughs> a bunch of people who like my it's funny because my sergeant and I talk about this now because um, the first time I saw him last year was 10 years like ago. So I saw him just recently and him and I've gotten really close ever since we've, all this stuff is happening. And he said, I remember the first day you came in. Th- they fucked up so bad because they treated you differently right off the bat. They didn't just make you go do work, too. Right. They're, all of you go fucking you're all going to mop the floors. They all had to go like mop floors. And I just got to hang out and talk to all the guys that were on the troops that we were gonna be working with. Yeah, That's right? Really <laughs> <laughs> and he told me on day one, he said like, I don't want you and his broken ass English. I make fun of him for it now. Mm-hmm. But he's like, I don't want you on my gun. <laughs> Cause it, again, I look like I wouldn't be able to do the job. And now that means you're down a person on a gun mm-hmm. and on a workup, that's a problem. But again, liability, asset or liability. What do you more look like? I look like the liability. Mm-hmm. Um, so then how long did it take you to kind of prove that you could do the job? Uh, well, we went out in the field with them. It took a little bit. Uh, they were, the RSM was with us on our graduating time when we were working on the triple sevens. So they had seen us work. 
So it's not like I was incompetent. He saw me work. Mm. It was fine. Um, but it took me a while. We didn't go and shoot the triple sevens until I think we went to Texas for workup. So at that point, it was getting really close. So we ended up deploying in April. So I got there in Aug- uh, August and they said, okay, you got to learn French and you got to take the RWS system in French and you got to take your mortar course in French and you got to take your triple seven course in French. So I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and then you got to be fluent in it on the radio. So when you're on the tower, you can communicate and then you can understand how the gun works in French. So I just learned it all in English and then we got posted there and then I had to go and learn all these courses in French. So that was fun. Um, how are you with languages? <laughs> not, I mean, here's the saddest part is like where I live, it's mostly Mandarin Cantonese or like um, Farsi or Arabic or Indian. So I don't, I'm not great. I spoke <laughs> French in high school a little bit, um, did a little bit of Spanish, but then when I went into a place where there was no English, it actually worked in my favor because I had no choice. So I'd be sitting there on parade just going, and then they would start marching and moving and I would go, oh, what was that? Gauche, droite, gauche, oh, left, right, left. So I would slowly pick it up. And so I started speaking Fringlish. So it was like a really nice mix of French and English. And then I would start to really drive my staff crazy and be like, oh, so Jean say, uh, Qu'est-ce que book en français en anglais? And then they would translate like, word for word like I was asking Siri a question. Um, so they didn't appreciate that. But eventually I started to pick up on like little things. And then once we got to Texas, I started to, didn't take me long to figure out the gun because a lot of the times I would run charges or I'd run lanyard. Um, I only had to load rounds the odd time. If we were short people, I would load rounds. I can do it. It's definitely, I'm going to tire out faster, but I can fucking, I can do it, or you're not allowed to run them. So I would do the charges and- um, How much did a round weigh? Like 80 to 100 pounds. Dang, yeah. So, and there's, mm-hmm. it's like a weird, because it's rounded on the bottom. So it's like, it's technique, really. Mm-hmm. So what my sergeant would do is he would take me to the gym and he would give me like ways to work out where I could take like a heavy dumbbell He would put a chair on one side and then a chair at the other end. And he'd be like, I want you to load it, like grab it like you're grabbing around and then lift it up like you're grabbing around and then walk over and go put it on the chair like you're putting it on the tray. And then pick it back up and do it again. And just start doing that. So I was getting repetition and building the muscles to actually to do the lifting. And then um, a lot of just, he would take, especially in Afghanistan, he'd work with me in the gym and he'd be like, just working on the little muscles on the arms so that like if I was loading, you know, mortars a certain way, like I could use more of one hand rather than my whole body leaning over on the machine. And so it's, it's just about technique, mm-hmm. just learning technique and then really just honing in on that technique at that point. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, but we got to, uh, we went to Wainwright first. Wainwright first? Wainwright first. Yeah, the, that winter. So that was, I don't know if you know Alberta. <laughs> and then you also know winter plus Alberta. Um, it normally equals like minus 40. So whatever that translates into an American. Um, it's fucking cold. cold. It's so yeah. cold. Translates to cold. Yeah, like the guns freeze. So we would do, we did this operation um, called Operation um, Maple Leaf. And it was like workup. And it was like all of us though. It was like all the whole regiment. So it was like infantry, artillery, combat arms, like everyone that was going to be going, we were all doing like a simulated thing. And we had to wear these vests that had sensors on them. Mm -hmm. And then they had uh, other military come in and people who weren't deploying and play the Taliban. Right. And then Mm -hmm. um, you just wear the sensors. But the great thing about the sensor is for me, if I was in the turret, the sensor didn't work. So I could just take the sensors off and then everyone else would die (laughs) and I would not. (laughs) You'd be the Lone Ranger in the uh, turret the laying down Ranger. fire. That's right, exactly. So we went to Wainwright first and we did um, we did our field exercise there. That's when we did our first live fire exercise with everyone, like with, you know, the Griffins overhead firing and like all of us were, we each got like four live rounds. And one of the guys from our unit was sitting in the truck. I don't remember what those trucks are called. Uh, they're like almost like a half ton and they have the big, uh, the green over top and you can put people in them on the bench seats there. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he fucking just fucking had the rounds and he put the buttstock down, <laughs> pop, and it round took off right through. And oh my God, I just remember the hellstorm. I know the guy's name, I won't say it, but I remember the hellstorm and he had to be English too. He had to be one of the fucking English guys that came onto our unit. So it was, uh, it was interesting because it was like, there's only like six of us. Can it not just not be one of us that fucks up? So it was, um, it was fun because my staff were really great. So like, uh, LeBlanc was really great. Uh, Fontaine was really great. Uh, Roby Show, he was this. Roby Show's like, Bombay de Chef Roby Show's like, 
six foot at least, almost 300 pounds, just huge guy, but Acadian French. So like this really thick, cannot understand French. He was fantastic, but yeah, I had I had good staff members with us there, so I learned a lot. And then you went to Texas after that? Yeah, we did one week in Texas. Just one week, it was either Fort Hood or Fort Worth, wherever you guys shoot live from, I can't remember where. But we were, it was one of the forts in Texas. I remember we flew in and <laughs> we flew in and uh, we immediately got walked into a room where we got sat down about all the dangerous animals that we would encounter when we went out in the field and how not to squat down to pee. And then I got the look. Um, and cause we were going out and we were gonna shoot uh, live artillery on the triple sevens, we're gonna do it for the week. And so they're like, you know, if there's not a porta potty, don't squat down. This is what these spiders look like. These are what these snakes look like. If you hear this rattling, don't walk over there. So we got this whole like spiel, like welcome to Texas. Like everything will kill you. Just don't fuck around. <laughs> it's like, okay. So we went to Texas and we did, um, we did live fire, and uh, that was funny. When all this happened, I actually found a, I found a video of us shooting live fire there. It was so it was so fantastic to watch back because it's like it's a different life. It doesn't even feel like uh, it doesn't even feel like the same person. It doesn't. It feels like the, you know that uh, scientists are talking about how like there's like might be like simulation theory, kind of how there's like different parts of our lives going on, but just like tweaks all hmm. across um, space. It's like it feels like it's a different time. It doesn't even compute with me. So when you watch that back, it doesn't look like me, doesn't walk like me, just sounds like me. It's strange. <laughs> it's just strange, yeah. And then how long, did you, did you guys know that you were going to Afghanistan at this point? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't, um, we knew like, like I knew on, on graduation parade, uh, like we knew like in April. A date? They no, gave you a date? No, a okay. date, but April. They said like, you guys are the, the next rotation for the summer. So we knew it would have been April or May to about September, October. That's when you know you'd be leaving sometime in that time frame. Yeah, no, we knew we'd be leaving either April or May. Oh, either April or May. Yeah, yeah we weren't we weren't sure. It just depended on who left first and then which gun was going first. First it was Alpha, then it was Charlie. So we weren't sure which which unit was actually going to rip out first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the military is not quite as squared away on their travel plans as everyone might think they are. It's always like you might be leaving around this date. Well, Canada's doing that right now to the um, the Canadian soldiers in Latvia are having to pay for their own food and travel, and they're not reimbursing it. <laughs> What's up with that? Well, we're on we're on a show of force right now. So Canada is rotating mm -hmm. people over to Latvia, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know. <laughs> we're giving all the money to Ukraine, so we don't have to give it to our people. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. So yeah, they're not they're not squared away on things like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's your what's your final sort of terminal guidance as you guys are getting ready to deploy? You got a little leave time to beforehand. Yeah, we got to think it was like two or three weeks. Yeah, and we could go kind of do whatever we wanted. We went, my whole gun troop went to Cuba. So we decided we were all gonna go to Cuba. Like on vacation? Right before. Yeah, just all of us. We were just gonna all, because a lot of these people are friends and they're like, they're close. The town's small, everyone speaks French. I know a couple people, they speak mm -hmm. kind of English. So you take a whole crew to Cuba? Yeah, we like all went. where in Cuba? We went to uh, like was Veradero, 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 I think it was. Ver yeah, Cuba. Because Americans can't go to Cuba. Yeah, but we can. Yeah. I mean, you can now, can't you? I think we can now. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure. Can we? Echo Charles? Don't know. Don't have the. You guys have an embassy there numbers. now. Mm. Okay, so you're going. <laughs> you're yeah. Canadian. You're like, we're yeah. going to Cuba. Yeah, we went to Cuba. And uh, we went on like just the whole, everyone just got drunk. It was just an absolute shit How show. How long did you go for? A week. Yeah, I almost drowned that day. Like, so I mean, that trip. So, like, I don't. I, that was an interesting trip. Like, it was alcohol rough. plus no, swimming. No, not alcohol. It wasn't. I will. I've never been a big drinker. I've never. Alcohol's never been like. What about a big swimmer? Yeah, I could swim. Yeah, yeah, I swim. So how'd you almost drown? So I went out <laughs> like a dumbass, and I walked. You know when there's like, um, I don't know what it's called. They have these big concrete barriers that go. F pretty far out sometimes into mm. the ocean. And I don't know if it's for like cruise ships to kind of come in or like things to leave. But anyway, there was like a pier and it went quite a ways. And it was a little rough out, windy, but I was like, that's a cool photo. <laughs> so I walked all the way out there by myself and a wave came and knocked me, not into the side where the boats would come, but into the ocean, ocean side. side. <laughs> and it just fucking turned me. And I've never experienced, I didn't grow up near the ocean. I grew up near like Lake Ontario. So that was, so that, so I, I'm not exaggerating. I just like balled myself up and held on. I had a camera in my hand and glasses and I just held on like this and just, and hoped because there was no way I could figure out which way is up, down, like there was no, I'm like, I'm going to have to ride this out. 
and it was horrific. And I don't fuck with the ocean anymore. Like I, I love the ocean, but they're like serious. From a distance. No, I go in it all the time. Serious <laughs> amounts of respect. Just like, if that looks rough, like don't play. Like we were just in Bahamas with our son and uh, it was, the ocean was rocking one of the days and Jack's like, I wanna go in the ocean. I wanna get like pushed. And I was like, okay, you can put your vest on. I'll take you to this point and I'll let it push you in but it had a nasty undertow. And I said, like, don't mess, Bobby, don't turn around, don't mess with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so fucking just come and <laughs> sucks him and just slammed him. It's mm. like, you can't, he doesn't understand, but I learned the hard way. And so it finally did spit me out. Um, I had everything in my hands, but I remembered very distinctly, like, I'll never, like, if it looks like that and you're near a pier, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that ever Did you again. get the picture? I don't even, no, the camera was broke. The ca so that was the thing is the camera broke and that was when I was gonna use on deployment. But the only reason I have any photos from deployment was uh, Catherine Fontaine gave me her little hot pink camera to take with me outside the wire. So I didn't I didn't not have photos. I just didn't have my camera anymore. <laughs> it's on me. It's my own fault. And then that's your pre-deployment leave pretty much? Yeah. And then I drove, uh, I drove back, I drove across the country and then I drove, I drove home to visit with my parents. And the thing was, is they asked me like, do you want us to come on the day of your deployment? And I was like, well, no, it's all the way in. If I could say like, don't, don't bother. It's totally fine. So I spent the last couple of days with them and my brother and my mom and my dad. Um, and I don't think I understood the gravity of what I was going to do. And I don't think anyone else really understood the gravity of what I was going to do because at that point in the war, you guys had already been involved with Iraq. You guys already been in Afghanistan. So America, I felt like started to see more of what was going on in those actual countries. Whereas Canada, it's like, we weren't seeing that. We, at that point we had had a really serious incident um, with Nicola Goddard. Uh, she was a artillery captain and she was in the white schoolhouse attack. And so that was our first female that we lost and our first like, I think, I think officer, not 100%, but she, that was the only thing I, I hadn't heard mm -hmm. much about this. I, I had been told, you know, the fucking, you know, that uh, these Middle East people are, are killing our soldiers and like, that's it. Like we didn't, we didn't get a briefing. Like we didn't get shit. We didn't get like a cultural, hey, this is what Afghanis are really like. We didn't get like, a, this is how they speak. This is how they shake their hands. These are the type of languages they speak. This is the type of food that like, we didn't get the fucking, we didn't get the memo. We didn't get the memo. We didn't get the memo. Um, so when we did finally deploy, it was like this false idea of what we were doing. And, and even when we were there, whether I was with the British or I was with the Canadians or the Americans, I wasn't told shit. So I didn't really know what we were doing. I was just waking up every morning and doing what I was told. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was 19. <laughs> How did you guys get overseas? Big military aircraft, or did you guys fly over there on civilian aircraft? We How did it go flew, So we flew from Quebec. So my parents didn't come. Long and short, my parents didn't come. I I did that on my own, which I regret to this day. Um, and I we got over on a our first stop was a civilian aircraft. It was just us though, so it was like empty. We each mm -hmm. all had our own rows kind nice. of situation, and we flew to Dubai, and that was our stop point. So, and then we, then that's when we got on the Herx and then we flew the Herx from there into Kandahar. And then you get into Kandahar, where do you get, end up operating out of? So for us, we went to Canada House. Like, so on the side where Canada House was, we had um, the officers were staying in like those container like mm -hmm. spaces. I don't know what they're called, but so they had spots there. And then we, we only stayed there for three days. So we came in, we got our, our kit, like we got our kit in Dubai, like our, our plates and our weapons. We got like a couple mags and things like that, our helmets and all that. But then we had shipped everything else there. So that's when we got our big cases that we had shipped months ahead that we were going to bring with us out to the FOB. So we weren't staying at CAF. We never stayed at CAF. That was not our spots. A lot of officers rotated in and out, but we didn't. So two of the unit, two of our uh, our gun troops went, uh, went, went to Massam Guard, one went to another Canadian FOB, and then... My my guys, uh, Alpha, went to Fob Ramrod out in the Maywan district. So we were the only ones from our regiment working with a non-Canadian set of people. Mm -hmm. We were with the, uh, there was 101st guys there and the just like Americans going in and out. And then uh, now I know, <laughs> now I know what I was looking at. And then there was some like special operations guys going in and out that just looked had beards and mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant mm -hmm. back then. I didn't understand what special operations community was yet. So that's where you end up is at Fob Ramrod. Yeah, I was at Fob Ramrod and at 
Kandahar, what we did is we did like a half day where we did like an IED overview training of like what we were finding and kind of what we were seeing. So they brought us over to like a, an open area and then they kind of had it set up where it looked like there was like some garbage over here, some rocks over here, some piles of stuff over here, and then like another wall here. And they'd like bring you around and be like, this is like, uh, you know, cigarette butt package where they took two tinfoil pieces and wrapped a wire here and you stepped on that. So we would learn about, okay, these are the types of IEDs we're finding, then like daisy chains on the walls. And we were starting to see this is what they were currently seeing in country. Mm -hmm. And then the next day we did a briefing where we went into a room and then we looked at like what suicide bombers look like and what it looks, looks like when they blow up. And we watched slides of like, this is what we're seeing in country. And if you see a vehicle born, if you see like donkey born, like we're seeing these and this was just kind of like, this was your situational awareness that you were being given. And then we got like a couple booklets to keep in our little pockets that were all in French about <laughs> Afghanistan. Did you still not speak French well enough to like, be I, okay with it? I, I spoke enough. I remember the moment where I it clicked that I understood a sentence. I was being yelled at. I remember it very clearly. I very vividly. Was that during boot camp? Was that during No, that was in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan is <laughs> yeah. when you started to finally I, I felt really the click think happened. a little bit in French. Yeah, you know when, yeah, I don't know if, do you speak another language? No. Okay, do you speak another language? He speaks at all? pigeon. Mm. Okay, but the, there's a. We speak pigeon. Sure. I was just going to say, <laughs> we. <laughs> Be inclusive, Jocko. We, uh, there was a moment where I, I felt almost like a, I heard someone speaking, and I was like, oh, I got that. I got, I got it all. I didn't get like word, word, word. Mm. I was like, oh, and it was a moment after my sergeant was pissed off, and he looked at Bomba de Chef Roby show, and he was like, something. It was something along the lines of like, I can't believe she just fucking did that. And I went, je comprends, sergeant. And he <laughs> stood up and walked into the tent and slammed the door. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. That was worse. I made it worse. I understand, sergeant. Yeah. I just let him know. I understood what you just said. Je comprends. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I had a guy on that was with the French Foreign Legion and and I've read books about the French, but that's what they do. They just, you go there, you, you doesn't matter what language you speak. Uh, Spanish, English, German, mm -hmm. they're gonna speak French to you and you're gonna learn French and that's it. Yep. That's how it goes. Yeah. So. Joel, uh, you had Yeah, a, Joel. He, he um, came into my office uh, right after I did your show last time. He walked into my office, knocked on the door, and he was like, is Kelsey here? <laughs> and then my girlfriend, Tally, was like, why, why? Why? Um, and then uh, he's like, oh, I've done Jocko. I want to drop off a book for her to read. Oh, right and on. so he lives near me. Yeah, I've oh, right got his book. He's a nice guy. Yeah, he, he reaches out from time to time. I think he wrote, he did. He wrote another book. Mm. And I, I'm sure we'll do it at some point on the podcast. I think it's called Seville. I think it's called Seville. Maybe it's about like the civilian transformation okay. or something. I haven't read it yet because he sent it to me, but good stacks. You get a lot of books. Um, so then what's your job in Afghanistan when you get there you get up to ramrod I was a triple seven gunner So tell everybody what that means So it means I ran a 155 millimeter howitzer that shot a hundred pound round max 40 kilometers so miles I speak kilometers too, okay. so we're good perfect great fantastic <laughs> um, and uh, So we provided fire for the uh, infantry and those people that were within that distance of Fob Ramrod So the Americans what had happened was um, there was a Canadian reservist unit that was at Fob Ramrod prior to us So we ripped them out those people left us a noose as a welcoming gift on our tent um, Wait who that was an American unit you said no, it was a Canadian reserve unit Okay, yeah and they left you a noose, just yeah. welcome. Yeah, it was a, it was really lovely. Dark humor, yeah. military dark humor. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, and so your job is how? So how, are you staying to watch? Are you doing twelve hours on the gun? Are you no, 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 only so, working at night? Like, how's it go down? Okay, so when we got to Ramrod first, we kind of got the overview of what was going on. These are the Americans, and here's the tricky situation: most of these French people don't speak English, and so when you're dealing with the corner of our fob that we were on, we were responsible for one OP tower. The rest of the, the other three, I believe, three or four that there were, I think there were three, um, were, Amer were <clears throat> American run. We did not run those at all. So our job was to provide individuals for four hour shifts on that OP tower. And there'd be two people at a time. So there's two guns there. And one from each gun would go at that time frame. And you would do four hour shifts together. So my shift often was 12 to four or four to eight. 
I liked the four to eight because I could sleep, get woken up, and then my sergeant would let us go back to sleep for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. If you did the uh, 12 to four, they would make you get up with everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so it worked out all right. Um, so for me, what we would do is we, right as soon as we got there, we started doing shifts. Like the second we land, it's like, okay, they're leaving. And we got to get on the rotation. So we had the rotation board up and then we would have to do, one of us would have to do GD with the Americans every week. So at that point, the triple sevens were running when we were called to run. So we were on call for anybody in the area and any of the Americans that were leaving. And we would kind of, our staff would know like, hey, this is happening or we're going to be a little more aware or no one's doing GD like this week. Like there's an operation going on. Yeah. Everyone be on standby. Yeah. So the, so you guys wouldn't sit at the guns. No. And then when something would happen. Run. Boom. You'd get to the guns. Yeah. And so it was a little more of a dramatic kind of job because it, for the most part, if we weren't on the guns, we were either servicing the guns, working on them. I was the T at uh, the T lab gunner, so I was in charge of the T lab. So I had to do. We would do GD, and then we would do uh, the tower work, and then I would be responsible for making sure that that machine gun's serviced, and then that RWS system. If we go outside the wire, I'm good to go on that. So I was in charge of that. And then otherwise, they would, our sergeant, because he knew it wasn't good for anyone to be bored. It was not. We need to keep people mm -hmm. constantly on a schedule. So he would make work tasks. We're moving gravel over here. We're going to make this look nicer on the tent here. We're going to, you know, blah, 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 make work shit. And then we would all, all of us, unless you were sleeping, unless it was your turn to sleep or however it was scheduled out, if you heard the, like the mission call, you ran. So if you're in the shower, you fucking goodbye. If you're working out, you sprint, like it didn't matter. You're on the guns. Unless you were on GD or you're on the tower, you run to the guns. That's just how it works. Middle of the night, doesn't matter. Guns. And it's all of us, right? So it takes a lot to run those mm -hmm. guns. Um, you can run them. Like if you're doing, um, for example, we were doing a, a night shoot and it was scheduled plan operation. The guys were going out. We knew at 12 o'clock and for the next, it was like the next three hours, every 20 minutes we're firing loom on the dot. So then three of us can do that. So then my sergeant would be like, hey, you, you and you, we're going to do this. Or what he would say is like, hey, we don't need two people in the tower that night. One can go. And then what you'll do is if it's your shift and we're running the gun, you come down, just fire, and then go back up to the tower. So you would just constantly have this rotation. Um, I liked doing those ones too because those were kind of interesting for me because I got to listen a little more and learn a little more from like listening to the radios rather than when you're in like a, you know, just rounds down range, just too, too, too. like you don't learn anything. You're just kind of in that muscle memory mindset. And then... How often are you firing rounds, do you think? Ugh. Like every night are you firing rounds? Or is it like it, every no. three nights, every four nights? It just depended. It mm -hmm. honestly just depended. It depended on people in the area. It depended on how much the Americans were doing that were close enough to us. We fired a lot of loom. Mm -hmm. We did do a lot of loom for a lot of night stuff, like a lot, a lot of loom. I know that the other guns, uh, Bravo and Charlie, because my girlfriend's Ben and Sab were on those guns. They ran, they fucking ran rounds downrange, mm -hmm. big time. They were in a more centralized area we were yeah. hell and gone um but we did when we did fire we fired we were rounds down range like we if we were doing a fire mission we were doing like 10 at least and that's on each gun and we were hammering them out and then we're kind of waiting um but i <laughs> there's stuff i found out that i can't talk about but it's wild to learn afterwards uh what you were doing because i didn't know what we were shooting who we were shooting for what were the rules of engagement? I didn't know what rounds down range, where they were going. Like, I just fire the fucking gun and do your job. That's it. And so it was interesting to kind of learn a little bit more afterwards about what we were doing at Ramrod and how that worked as Canadians with Americans and like the dynamics and stuff like that. It was interesting. Yep. Yeah, um, people on the ground really like to have artillery support. That's for damn sure. So that's pretty cool. Well, it was, uh, it was great too because I really took a liking to the gun. I don't know why. There's something about, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm, I'm really small, but there's something about the big boom, the big impact, the idea that you can be a small person on the other side of it and still do massive damage is just like, I don't know, it just felt powerful. And like we were actually supporting something and doing something that was meaningful. Um, and so I knew when people called us, like if we got a call in the middle of the night, like <laughs> Bombardier Chef was in our tent and then Sarge was in the other tent. But like, Watching a 300 pound man get up in his boxers and sprint in the middle of the night is probably one of the funniest things I'll ever see. Like it is, you knew that when you were, when you were getting a call, somebody needed you. It yeah. wasn't like, oh, for fun. Did you guys have a standard of like how long before you got rounds down range? 
Were you guys like, hey, we need to get this done in 30 seconds or we need to get this done in two minutes? Did you guys have a standard? It depended because sometimes we would get a call and it would be like, Missy on set, like, let's go, fire, fire, fire. Or it would be, hey, everyone get ready. Stand by, wait two minutes, wait for the call, and then fire, and then fire. Like, it it just depended. It just, it was very. Who are they calling into? Are they calling into like a a comms tent and then the comms tent's relaying you to to the grid coordinates? Yeah, so what's happening. you guys are plotting them, making the adjustments and firing. Yeah, so what's happening is the foo up front, forward observation officers, that's attached to the infantry units. Um, They're artillery. So like Hoppo and Daniel Ventur um, were the British ones that I was with. That was my first experience of being under artillery. Um, so I watched, I got to see the other side of it. So they would call in a, a, a like a grid coordinate that would relate to our tent with where like Fontaine was. And then she would plot it and give us the grid and she would give us, and then she'd spit it out to the, uh, the comms and then we would hear it and then Sergeant would relay it. And then the guy on the sites would, would move the big mm. wheels and then we would hear how many rounds, and then one guy would prep the rounds, then one of us would prep the charges, and then one of them stand by the lanyard. And sometimes we were having issues uh, with hydraulics. When that happened, things got messy fast, because then you have to pump it manually. And if you've never done that before, it's really hard to articulate how difficult it is. It's like, because the, the more hydraulic fluid you get in it, the stiffer it gets, but you have to get it to a certain point to be able to get the recoil to go, or it won't kick back, right? So, and depending on the grid, the closer the round, the higher that gun's got to go, right? The further the, the angle goes. So if something went wrong with the hydraulics and you're doing that manually, like that's a, that's a whole job on its own, just mm-hmm. trying to get that. Um, and so we, we had that happen quite a few times, which was an interesting experience. Um, but being on the other side of it was wild too, uh, because that is uh, truly terrifying to be underneath. Indirect fire is a horror when you're on the receiving side. <laughs> That's for damn sure. I just, I don't know what I expected or thought it would be like. Cause like, I think the goal for me would ultimately to be a foo. Like that was, it's the best of both worlds. I get to go with the infantry units and do what I wanted to do, but I get to call artillery with the thing that I love to do, right? So getting to witness it and then be on the other end of it is just never something I actually thought I would get to experience, let alone in Afghanistan, like that quick. So, so eventually you get picked up for to be uh, to go out with a British unit. Yeah. So at that point, uh, it was I believe the beginning of June. I don't know when they started talking about it. It's just when I got notified mm-hmm. about it. So it just came down the pipe that there was going to be uh, an operation that they needed some. Uh, now I understand the CSTs for, so females to go and get attached to the British units, um, and they needed to be able to speak English too. So. At that point, my sergeant said no, because he used to be infantry, and he was like, no, this is not a job I was trained for, this is not a job I'm prepared for, this is not something, she can do it, because we were really lucky, again, I was really lucky. When I went to Val, um, Mark didn't really let us rest on like, some people would get to like have the weekends off or whatever, like a day off or so, but he would be like, and eh, we're gonna go, we're gonna go work on shooting. We're gonna go do level four. We're gonna go do house clearing. We're gonna go do a little more than we need to be doing, but just a little more. Cause we are going to war and he's been there and he's done it a few times. He understands like unexpected things come up. So if you know how to move and shoot better, you're gonna be better and it's just gonna be better for everyone. So he put the effort into us, like the days off in Texas we were supposed to get, we climbed a mountain because fucking climb a mountain, I guess. So better be better, go better. So we did everything we could to be the best soldiers we could when we deployed. And that's the only reason I didn't get killed was because he sh- like legitimately taught me how to shoot and move. He taught me how to go in a house and move properly so I don't get myself killed. He taught me how to grab people. He taught me how to put people up against the wall. He taught me how to zap strap people. Like if he didn't go and do that, like just extra shit, I would have been a living nightmare. <laughs> and that was who? That uh, was? My sergeant, sergeant uh, Mark LeBlanc. He's an officer now, so I I refuse to call him by that. Mm-hmm. We'll he's, just, he'll just still be a, an e dog. Yeah, he's a dark side. <laughs> uh, so now you get how far deep into deployment are you when you when when they asked you to go out and do this operation with the Brits? Two months. Okay, so you're at least acclimated to the, the heat and the heat and the weather. And yeah, everything. the weather and then the the prayer and the the noises and like how the country how the country works. Mm-hmm. Meaning, like within my fob, I understood how the country worked. Um, I understood by watching like 
this one family in a compound here, I understood because we brought Afghanis in to work for us mm-hmm. who would build, you know, the concrete pads and things like that. And then we had a situation with that. That was a whole, that was a whole thing. Um, and then being the, the weak link, the woman there, I got, I was the target for that one. So that one was fun um, to be able to diffuse a situation because I was able to recognize the situation again because I would somebody took extra time to make sure that I understood and I wasn't an idiot so Mm. um and then I got the call they said yeah you're going like it's not really a choice at this point like I've tried to keep you here but I can't so the least that we can do is like we'll go zero your weapon because you zero it when you get in country but then it's been sitting Mm -hmm. I'm not using it so we go and zero the weapon and then he just stripped his c7 and just fully tacked mine out so I didn't know how to use half the shit on this thing (laughs) And I don't know why we needed to add the weight, but he's like, well, you're going to need this. You're going to need this. And then he ended up stripping all his, his his kit and gave me like his mats, his extra mags and all of these things and grenades. And I had never carried grenades at this point. Like I had sh- thrown them in like SQ, but I'd never carried them on my physical body. That's a whole new level of weird and uncomfortable and I just wasn't prepped for that. So just like tape over the spoons because that was, they made fun of me for that. But mm-hmm. I felt safe and comfortable. So that was fine with me. Um, and then I got dropped off. Uh, so what happened was the Chinook, uh, the Chinook came out to pick me up the one day because they were picking up people at different FOBs. And they came out to get me and they took fire. So they turned around and went back. So then they're like, if they don't come tomorrow, then you're not going and they'll have to find someone else because they need, they're they leaving on this date and you need to be there a day before because you need to go meet with the RCMP. You need to be able to get zap straps. You need to be able to get told what you're allowed to legally do and then kind of walk through that. If you can't do that, then you can't go. So what happened was they, they tried again the next day and they were able to pick me up. So then I got picked up and I left and it's weird because I you know, fully thought I'm going back to the, mo- everything else is there, I'm fully going back to that gun. I went back to that gun, ended up being for like a week and then I was gone again. So I never, I never really stayed at that fob much longer after that. Um, so they picked me up, they dropped me off at CAF and then they just brought me to the RCMP. So the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they do deploy. They do have people there that do deploy to do investigations and things like that, like military police as well. And so they brought me there and they handed me <laughs> paramechanics wear gloves and some zap straps. And they're like, do you know how to do the, put somebody in duck position? I was like, no. They're like, let us show you how. Do you know how to like, uh, if you have, if you had to take somebody down, can you do it? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay, show me. So then they would show me other ways that like, you're not supposed to put people in this position. And mm-hmm. if you're gonna zap strap them, they have to be able to sit. They can't be, can't tie your hands and feet. You can't put bags over the head. Like just, just how to do it legally so mm-hmm. I won't get myself in trouble. And then I was just told, my sergeant was like, don't fuck it up. You don't have a boss. No one's going to tell you what to do. You're going to have to make judgment calls. Go do it. And you're still 19 years old at this point? Mm Mm-hmm. And then you link up with the Brits. Yeah. And then I went and and linked up with them. They're at a different side of uh, CAF. They have their own gates and deal Mm -hmm. and flag and that whole thing. And do you, are you there for like the mission briefing so that you know what's happening? No. So (laughs) I got dropped off that night. (laughs) It's fine. Everyone laugh. It's cool. <laughs> Echo's more just sad. It's just sad at this point. Um, I got dropped off and uh, I walked in and I met um, a couple of the different higher ups. Um, I don't remember exactly who it was at the time, but they just said, you're going to go with us. We're, we're going. You're going to follow these people and uh, we're going to leave it at, at 0100. So go get some rest. When everyone gets ready, you get ready. Follow along. It was women and children. You're That's gonna it. be talking to women and children. Women and children. You're gonna take, you're gonna, here, there you go. We don't often have women and children stay there. Normally if they know we're coming in and this has been a planned op for a while, we know that the women and children are gonna leave. We understand that. They flee most of the time. We don't often use you. Like I was straight up told that. I was like, okay, well this shouldn't be too bad then. And at this point, I don't give a shit. I get to get off the fob and I get to go do something. So I'm super excited. So more than jazz to go. So we go, um, I couldn't sleep because these are all new people and I'm excited to go and I should have slept, didn't. And then we all pile into a school bus and we drive out to the airfield. And then that's when we got on the Chinooks. So we got split into the different piles that were all gonna go on Chinooks. And um, that's when I met the, the bomb dog that I was gonna be near, which was Benji, he was a black lab. And uh, the guys that I was gonna be near to start with. But they said like, we don't normally use you, 
So if we need you, we'll move you around. There's only one of you and there's three, there's like, it's like Alpha Bravo Charlie. So we're gonna move you around. And that's how it's gonna go. And then I didn't realize how much I was actually gonna get moved. And I got shuffled like a deck of cards. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, we took and it was off. a Hilo insert? You guys flew in? Yeah, we flew in at night. Um, I just know I was on the floor. I was on the floor and I was like wedged between people. And there's a guy sitting, not on my legs, but between my legs, but enough where it was like my legs were going numb. So I was like, but we were, out, we were out there for like 45 minutes, like a good, it was a good flight. Um, and then we landed and I couldn't feel my legs at all. Like I couldn't feel, like I stood up and my adrenaline just started, you know, you like that feeling and you, you know both what I'm talking about. When you, when you step off of something and you just start running, well, the bottom half didn't, mm. didn't agree that we were going to run. And so somebody grabbed the back on our, t on our vests in Canada. We have like a, these, the mesh, but we have this handle. Mm -hmm. Just grabbed a hold of that and just fucking just. Drag handle. Aye, let's go. Just some, one of the mixed accents and just kicked my ass out the door. And it was uh, the most uh, shocking to the system, eye-opening and overwhelming experience I've never been put in a situation since where I've been so disoriented. It was like pitch black. I had an NVG on that I barely trained with. I was gonna say, did you have much experience on night vision? No. When we first got to the FOB, there was no NVGs in the tower. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have them for the first couple hours of the shift. And people gave me so much shit after your show last time. And they're like, of course they had them. What are you talking about? They would never put people in a tower with NVGs. Do you know Canada? <laughs> Shut your mouth. We had no NVGs for a little bit. Um, I remember having to call down and be like, can we get some NVGs? This is a night we can't see anything. So I had, I didn't have very much training at all with it. So that's a trip, right? When you start trying to figure out your footing because things look like holes that might not be holes. Oh, it's yeah, just, yeah. No, it definitely takes time to get used to walking on nods for yeah. sure. Yeah, so, and it's just the one, right? We don't have like the... There are both. It sounds like you had a monocular one, yes, which is only monocular. one. Yes, yeah. we had those. Yes, yeah. so that was that was. I think it would have been better with both, but I think that tripped me out a bit. You know, hearing this story, uh, actually, believe it or not, you you were actually blessed with the fact that you knew less about what was going on. If you would have known a little bit more, you would have been even more I know, terrified. I know. You know, if you actually knew a little bit more, you'd have been like, "What the hell is going on? This is like." Luckily, you didn't quite, you knew just, you were like just at the surface of understanding, so that's probably a good thing. Otherwise, yeah. it would have been even worse for you because you've been thinking, wait a second, I don't even know where I am yeah. in Afghanistan right now. No, and I didn't. And that's not good. No, and that's what blows my mind because I talk to a lot of people now on my show, right? And I interview a lot of high-level people like yourselves have been lucky enough to have conversations with and they tell me these i just had a guy on the other day who wrote the book a few bad men and he's like giving this operational overview of like yeah, we're going to the situation this is the equipment we got these are like just all these details and i'm just sitting there going what the fuck? how like how little i knew have you ever parachuted before i have have you ever free fall before no well i free fall but i was tandem okay how many times only once. Okay, yeah. It's a really good example of like the first time you ever do a free fall, you, what you notice and what you see is like really, really small. Mm -hmm. And then the more you do it, the better you get and the more you see and the more you understand what's happening. And right. the, just like it's, it, and l then you get to like be Andy Stump who has thousands of jumps. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, like he's going to be way more aware than he was when he had you know, mm -hmm. four, mm -hmm. you know, I remember my first jumps, you know, I like the only thing I remember, and it wasn't like I was panicking. I was, I wasn't, I wasn't freaking out, but I was like, okay, altitude, look at my ripcord, altitude, look at my ripcord, like look at my instructor, look at my ripcord. That's pretty much what I noticed. Like ripcord, altitude, um, instructor, yes. just that's what I noticed. And then by the time you get to 10 jumps, you're like, oh, there's like a cool mountain range over there. And doesn't it look cool from up here? And you get to see more and more. Yeah. And you get to understand more and more. And it's, it's similar in combat. You know, the more you do it, the more you're like, okay, I understand what's happening. Right. And if you've gone through rigorous training, mm -hmm. even that can allow you to be very open-minded and absorb a lot of information. And you have a lot of experience. Like, I mean, God, by the time I got shot at for the first time, I was like, oh, cool. Like, I... I <laughs> I was like, thank you, like, this is fine. Like, I, I wasn't, because I'd done so, I'd done, I mean, I didn't shoot my weapon at the enemy for the first 13 years. I was in the SEAL teams and I'd done oh, wow. all this training, you know, from 1990 until 2003. And that's a long time to prepare for something. Yeah. And so, but for you, it's like you're 19 years old, 
your artillery, you're with a different unit, you're wearing nods that you haven't really trained with, you, you're, you're getting in a helicopter with people you don't really know. Like there's a lot of things that, and it's your first time. Yeah. <laughs> so you add all those things up and it's definitely, there's a lot lacking. And from their perspective a little bit, like I did ops with what we would call strap hangers, no offense. Do you, have you ever heard that term before? Yeah, I have. Yeah, so like you'd be a strap hanger. Yeah. Like I brought females that were strap yeah. hangers and it's like, you're not being derogatory because sometimes you had like a computer guy that's a strap hanger. No, I know had, what you mean. So we'd have strap hangers and I've taken strap hangers on where it's like, okay, you give them two handlers, like they're gonna watch them, they're gonna make sure everything's good to go, mm -hmm. they're gonna get them to do their little job, whatever their little job is. And they don't really, but, at least we would have them in the brief. Like I would say like, hey, here's where you're gonna be in the in the convoy, here's where you're gonna be on the target, here's where I want you to sit. If anything goes bad, you go back to this vehicle. If you don't know which vehicle go, go to go to, go to any Humvee and <laughs> any. walk up to the driver and say like, hey, I'm the strap hanger, tell me where to go, right. and they'll take care of you. So we had at least a, mini a minimum amount of planning to make sure, which by the way, that came from a lesson from me where I did take some strap hangers out and didn't work out good mm -hmm. and, and mistakes got made that I should have been more attentive to and I should have put more guidance in place, which I did after that after that happened. But yeah, so I can kind of see someone thinking, oh, you know, we got this girl, she'll be, you know, if we need her, we'll bring her up to the front, we'll bring, we'll, you know, we don't expect to see a lot of females. And also what happens is, they don't know what you don't know or they don't remember what you don't know. So if I was to go on a jump with Andy Stumpf right now, he'd be like, oh yeah, like, uh, hey, just just do this. Yeah. Expecting that I know how to do it when mm -hmm. I'd be like, hey dude, I don't know how to do that. Or, or you know, expect me, hey, when you come in for the landing, just make sure you do this, you know, triple Lindy on the, on the approach. And I'd be, and he thinks, he would legitimately think I would know it. Right. And I'd be like, hey dude, I don't know how to do a triple, triple Lindy. But, if I didn't say that, or if I didn't know to say that, or if I didn't have time to say that, or we're in a freaking helicopter, and he's like, Trap all that day, and I'm like, you <laughs> okay. know. So that could be problematic. So I'm just trying to, I, I try and figure out, you know, the situation that you were in from like a mental perspective, and it's not good, you no, know. No, I'm like a golden retriever. It's just, I'm just happy to yeah, be here. Yeah, you're happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and that's cool when you're going to a happy place. It's cool when you, yeah, when it doesn't end up being like where the grounds are filled with IEDs and people don't like you, especially women, and they don't like women who have guns and they think that you're a little boy that's taking their, their daughters and their children into a room. Yeah, they don't like you very much mm -hmm. and you learn really quickly. It it didn't take me long to switch my brain on. Once, the, well, the day we landed, we, we sat in the dark until morning prayer. That was like the, we're gonna, all hell's gonna break loose. That's when we're hitting and moving. So we got told like, they're gonna go now. So morning prayer happened and then a group went forward and breached that first compound. Once that happened, I got called up right away, right away. And so Benji, who, um, that's the dog, um, and his handler and I went, went right up to the houses and it was already like everything had already calmed down, but they had the women and kids over in one area. And I went in with my helmet on and I had a scarf on as well because it was freezing, which also no one tells you how cold it gets at night. <laughs> Just FYI, if you're ever deploying, can someone tell someone what the degree at night it becomes? Because it gets fucking cold. So we're outside there, outside the wire in the middle of the night, and I'm just shaking, thinking, just like wearing a t-shirt and my just button-up kit with my plates and then my vest. I'm like, oh, it's freezing. It's it's fucking cold. So we we went inside, and they're kind of all huddled to the side, and I had the big scarf over, so my hair was blonde at the time, and my braid was tucked in. You could not tell that I was a woman from Adam. Like, you, there was no way you would know. And so when I went to grab the women and kids, and at this point I'm pretty calm and I'm pretty gentle, so I'm like, come with me into the room. <laughs> like, not creepy, not pointing guns, just we're going to – we're gonna go in here, I'm gonna search you, and it's gonna be fine. They're looking at me terrified, and the husband or the, the elder of the family freaks the fuck out, cries to grab a hold of me like this, and a bunch of the guys start pointing the gun at him, and they start, the, the interpreter comes over and starts yelling, he thinks you're a boy, he thinks you're a man, he thinks you're a man, take your helmet off. So, and I was taught, because at this point, uh, Trevor had already, we had a Canadian who had an ax put into his head. Um, and he's the reason why Honor House exists, but long and short, he sat down in a prayer circle, and this was back when the SOPs were different, took his helmet off out of respect, Taliban never came up, 
act in the head. He lived. He's alive. He lives on the island of Vancouver. He's amazing. Um, but we we were always told you never take your helmet off. So I'm kind of looking around, like looking for someone to tell me what to do because that's what I've been trained to do. And I'm like, oh, fuck it. I'm by myself. Take my helmet off. And he calms down once he sees that I'm a woman. Everything kind of chills out. Then I go and I do my first experience of like searching people. But the difference is these people are real rule, right? They're not like... Kabul educated, you know, girls that are, you know, these are no running water. The only men they ever see is like their elder. That's the word of God. They learn everything from them. And so they're, they're a mess and they're terrified and they're crying and the kids are crying. And I'm not, I don't know what the hell I thought would happen, but it wasn't like, I didn't expect like the fear. When you see that amount of fear in a small child's eyes, that's like a thing that sticks that you were. And maybe now, because I, I've done so much I can look back at it this way but like that the fact that I was the thing of someone's nightmares makes me sad inside Mm -hmm. yeah so that was a that was a weird that was a weird first exchange didn't expect I don't like it I don't know what I expected right because again I just happy to be here (laughs) right right and then so you guys end up you're in the field for a total of what five days I think something along that lines I don't know everything blurred and it's you're in multiple contacts. Um, yeah, a lot. A lot of contacts with the enemy as you're moving from village to village doing yep. clearances. Uh, there's an incident where there's a, a big IED. Yep. You have one soldier get killed, mm-hmm. another soldier get really badly wounded. That's a, a nightmare mm-hmm. to, to work through. Um, and this this whole time you're like you said you're getting shuffled around you're moving to the front you're moving to the back you're moving back to the front you're I was never in the back I was just moving to front I was moving front to different different parts of villages so it was like I was never just like sitting waiting the only time I ever like stopped or we weren't in firefight is that night and then I got to sleep for a three hour chunk like the first night that one was the I remember because I slept in the my sergeant gave me that like it's like a you put it over top of your sleeping bag to protect your sleeping bag it's oh baby like, sack yeah thank you mm-hmm. and so what I did is I just wanted privacy so I got inside of it and I tied it up really tight at the tight and then I put it up the meat and then I changed in that and then I slept in that while my stuff dried because it was wet um, and so the you know the whole the whole time I was there again it's not like war isn't difficult shit's not hard people don't die stuff doesn't happen it was just weird situations i was in awkward placements for meaning like we were moving from one village to like one of the videos i sent to you was the artillery going over top of us well what had happened at that point when we were moving from that village was when you look at the right hand side of the video you can see there was a there was a tree in the way of the sniper so some of the engineers came over and blew it up so they could blow the tree out of the way okay but while we were waiting for that, we were all starting to push forward. Once the sniper got in place, we were pushing forward along this. There's like a, a mud wall. When you step upside, there's like a mud wall. But for me, it was like probably up to my shoulders, right? And so we're pushing forward and I'm going ahead with a couple of the guys and I'm like third, I'm third behind them. Cause at this point we had been in some contact and I had moved fine enough where they just stuck me in with everyone else. They weren't like, hold her back, then we'll bring her forward. It was just like, we we're finding women everywhere. She's just go from here to here to here. So I'm moving forward with one of the guys and um, we got close contact, like close contact, closest I've ever seen, never experienced anything like that before. And it was to the point where we were taking rounds and one of the guys was like, we have to push, 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 push back. And I was like, what do you mean? We, we were, what? He's like, run that way again. And I was like, okay. So what happens was, he covered fire and I ran and I remember, I just remember this big hole in the ground and I remember jumping over it and it was one of those like slow motion moments because like there was rounds coming down and it was my first real like taking fucking hand, like handgun fire. Um, so we, we retreated back and I, where I took the video from, we were sitting in the ditch on the right hand side and we were waiting for artillery to come down. And that was the first time they were calling rounds over top of us. And I was like, that's close. And they're like, sure is, sure is. And that's when I could feel the ground just, and I was like, oh my God. Cause they used to say to us in the training, like you're the hand of God. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna find out. And I found out (laughs) and I loved it. As soon as first lanyard pull, I was like, that's an addiction. That's a, that's a thing. I want more of that. I want more of that. That's, that's something special. That's like all the hair on your body raises and the ground moves and you're like, what you just sent down range is going to wreak 
havoc and make somebody have a real bad day. Yeah, I can't imagine that there's anything better for an artillery person than to be in the field and see the impact of what it's like to have artillery utilized, yeah. you know, for the, for the folks on the ground, for sure. Yeah, it, it was cool um, just because the power of it. And so that was, that was all like one thing. So that was my first kind of like uh, experience to like actual like popping over my head of rounds coming. Um, and then the second one that like, again, I was just, they were, we were moving from like one village to the next and we were pushing forward and Stephen Noble, um, he was my platoon sergeant. He was, he had pulled us back and shoved us into a compound and put some of us on the roof because there was girls screaming. They heard screaming in the next compound ahead. So they put us on the roof. I'm one of the only people that don't go on the roof. The medic, the bomb dog, and the CSTs. We don't go on the roofs. We don't do sentry at night on the roof because there's only a few of us. So I got put on the roof, which, again, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be shooting my rifle. I'm fucking stoked to do, to do this. I get on the roof. We're taking rounds, um, and we're shooting. There's a guy beside me, myself here, and another guy here. And so the sni- um, they call them sharpshooters, uh, the British. Mm-hmm. So the sharpshooter that was with me jumps down off the roof to grab more ammo. He lies his rifle, which is the entire length of my body, and I have a photo with me holding the rifle and the round we pulled out of it. And we get three rounds that come from the left side and smoke the buttstock of his rifle and just, just by that just covers my hip because it's the length of my body. And uh, we all get down off the roof and we look and it's, he's got like an AK round like in the buttstock and so he duct taped it up and I said, can I have that? And he's like, no fucking chance. And I said, can I take a picture of it? He goes, yeah, absolutely. So I took a picture, I put it on my leg and I took a picture of it and then I tattooed it on my finger. So it's like, there was just situations and when the IED went off, I was in the group and we were waiting for that, those two people to go clear the road. And so on the compound on the right-hand side, we had a group of guys that was back a little bit with a sniper on the roof. And then there was a a, a mud, like a compound mud. When I say compound, I'm talking like mud walls, real rough, ruggedy, not fucking a compound like a marble. Um, And we're leaning with our backs up to it. And on the left-hand side is, um, in a little ways away, is a gray putt. And then if you go down the road a little to the right and you, there's a ditch and then there's this road that goes up to the great putt. And then on the right hand side of that road is just a whole open clearing. And so we were waiting for it to be cleared. And there was, we were just sitting still and everything was calm, everything was quiet. I calm chatter, nothing, everything was perfect. And so we were just sitting there and I remember I was looking over talking to a couple of the guys and the ground fucking shook like, Something, and I remember just whipping my head around and seeing the worst thing that I'll see for the rest of my life. So uh, that was a situation, again, that I shouldn't have fucking been in and shouldn't have been a part of. But Noble said, you, you, and you, go. And I don't know, I mean, what, what does go mean? Go, run, now. And so um, Craig Hardy, the medic, that was with us is dealing with the first individual and what had happened is the blast went off and there was somebody at the door and he took the brunt of the blast, blew his kid off and just wrecked him. So we were dealing with that and then afterwards, three of us uh, run down off of the road into the ditch and sprint towards the great putt. And then we get to the road that's right adjacent to the great putt and they give the, okay, one, two, three, run. So, and at this point, all hell is broken loose. Now we're taking mortar rounds. Now we're taking we're taking small arms fire and things are getting out of control. And so what they did is the Taliban used that moment to be, uh, you know, wait for everyone to come and then secondary, just, you know what that looks like. So we get inside the gray putt and then I was with Stephen Noble and a couple other guys and that's the moment I, I say often like my light switch goes. Like the switch happens when I find out that there's this is what's left and you're you're cleaning it up and we're running and we're moving. And so I just blacked out and did what I was told. I didn't think about what I was doing or touching or grabbing. I just did what I was fucking told. And then and just after that, I didn't feel anything anymore. Like there was not anything I could feel. There's not anything I could do about it. There's nothing that I could switch on or off. It was just like I was fucking gone. Like a part of me was like, see you later, wall. And that that's just how it worked. And so... Once we finished that, we all put everything we could onto the stretcher 
and then I carried the two individuals' helmets and one of the rifles, and I slung my rifle and I carried his rifle, and it was all twisted. I'd never seen anything like that happen to a weapon. I didn't. I obviously know they're malleable, but I had never seen it in person. Um, so the gravity of the situation did not punch me in the face though until we got the stretcher back into that compound that was down on the right hand side of where I was sitting where the snipers were and we went inside of there and at that point that's when the um the Pedros the guys came in the Blackhawks and one came around and unleashed hell like out of those like mini guns and just fucking I I'd only heard that once when we were in um Wainwright when they were shooting over top of us for the first time but I had never heard like I was like oh my god and so at that point they got everybody on um, the flights and they had taken off and then the fire had kind of dampened down Um, and that's the moment that like uh, Craig sat with me and he was the medic and he just kept asking me if I was okay because at this point I was obsessively rubbing my hands like I didn't have my gloves on for that. And so I had some stuff all over me and I just kept rubbing my hands really, really aggressively, like just trying to get it off because I would rub my kit and my kit was covered and had dirt on it. So I just keep rubbing and it would just keep getting worse. And so I just kept sitting there and I would sat on the ground and I remember it because there was a, inside there, there was like a, not a room, but like a cutout and the other guys were sitting over there and they're all kind of, a bunch of them were sitting in a circle and they're all smoking. And I was like, I want a cigarette. And they're like, you're not starting now. Like, we're not giving you a cigarette. Like, this is not how this is gonna work. And then he gave me like hand sanitizer or like some type of something and like just just like just wipe it off. Just like it's cool. Just wipe it off. Like this isn't his first deployment. Like this is this guy is a hardened medic. He had he had done some time um, other places. And so he could see that I was not coping and something it was off really, really fast. And then at that point, it was like within 15 minutes. They're like, OK, up we go. Push on. That's it. And I didn't know what to do with that. Fuck, am I supposed to know what to do with that? I, like, the thing that got me is like, all of these guys, it's like, of course you can't sit there and wallow in it. But like, what the fuck are you supposed to do with that? And it's funny, because since our last conversation, I've talked about you on a few shows, because somebody, quite a few people asked me about this story. And um, I talked about it in length on um, my podcast with Danny Ventura who was friends with one of the guys that we lost. And then I talked about it with one of the family members and I said, can I talk about this? And they said, the reason we want to talk about it is because it just keeps his, their names alive. And I was like, okay. So Danny and I talked about one of the situations and he said, you know, when you handled that, like, how do you think, it, do you think it could have been better? Do you think it could have been different? Do you think you could have, you know, anything? And I said, it's funny that you say that because when you asked me last time I was here, like you asked me very clearly and this has stuck with me and it was like, If somebody would have sat you down and said, hey, what you're feeling is normal, what you're experiencing is normal, how you're reacting is normal, this is okay, you're gonna get through this, instead of slapping medication on top of it and then having to exit the country and then eventually exit the military, do you think you would have been okay? Yeah, I fucking think I would have been okay. But I think at the time our leadership didn't know how to deal with mental health. It was still too early in Canada's involvement in 2009. And our staff, like my sergeant tells me to this day, I didn't know what to do with you. I didn't know how to help you. I didn't know what you were going through because I had never been through an experience like that. So if the leaders I'm going to have never experienced it, and I'm glad that they never had to experience it because no one should have to experience that. But war is war and that's what happens. That's the reality. So if he didn't know how to help me, how, how am I supposed to get help? Like, I didn't have anyone to be like, hey, this is normal. This is okay. So, you know, that, 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 that was the moment. That was when they, when they, when you look at my TBI paperwork and like the, the stuff from Veterans Affairs, like that's the fucking check in the box for them where they're like, yep, that's where that, that IED, that situation, that body clearance, that whole thing, that was the moment. And then the rest of the op just went fucking downhill from there. Yeah, the um, that conversation that we had last time you were on, and because the whole time, you know, I was sitting there, kind of like I'm doing today, of like just pointing out the fact that you were young, you were not trained for this, you weren't aware of what was happening, you know, overall in the big picture. You're getting like a five minute brief about what you're going to go do. There's a lot, and then your follow on to a traumatic situation is like, okay. Cool, clean your hands, we, we're going to the next village. 
and all the and then when you get done and we'll get into that Mm -hmm. but yes um i I had a connection at some point in my life where you know i'd get these these when i was training mma fighters and the mma fighters they would be very confident and then they would go to the fight and they'd get like especially quite frankly in the ufc when it's the UFC. And it doesn't matter, you do a bunch of shows, amateur shows, you've been wrestling your whole life, whatever, you've been in fights, you, you're, you're, you know what you're doing, you always, you don't get nervous, you don't get nervous anymore. After a guy has wrestled his whole life or boxed his whole life and now he's gonna go, they don't get nervous before a fight. You know, a, a, a collegiate wrestler doesn't get nervous before a wrestling match, like they get over it. Okay, and maybe they get a little bit nervous, but, but they get over it. Mm. And all of a sudden they show up at UFC, and it's a real thing. I think they have a name for it. They call it something like UFC jitters or something like that. And what I realized is if they didn't know what it was, mm. they'd be like, oh, there's something wrong with me. And at some point I said to myself, oh, the same thing happens in combat. Mm-hmm. The same thing happens before combat and the same thing happens after a combat. Oh, before combat, you're nervous and it's okay that you're nervous. It's okay that you're sick to your stomach. It's okay that you're, well, not sick, but your stomach is in knots. It's okay that you're, you you may be even like, I've seen guys shivering, like they're shivering, they're scared. And it's like, if you go, hey man, that's all good. You're supposed to feel that way. It's your body getting ready for combat. Right. Don't worry about it, it's fine. Yeah. And they go, oh, okay. And it's the same thing before they get in the cage. It's like, hey man, what you're feeling right now is you're being prepared for combat. And the same thing on the other side of like, Oh, you you have some uncontrollable emotion because you lost one of your friends? Yep, that's totally normal. Like, hey man, I've lost a bunch of friends and it's like, oh yeah, sometimes I'll just start crying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, that's that's that and it's not like I don't I don't think to myself, "Hey, I had a heard a, you know, actually I I would the the cliche is like I heard a song, but that oh, doesn't actually yeah. happen. <laughs> I don't like hear a song, but maybe there's be a picture I'm looking at. Yeah. Or I'll read something. And you know, go read old, old emails. That's a real freaking smart move on a freaking <laughs> Saturday afternoon. But you do that, and you can be like, "Oh, okay. Oh, now I'm sitting alone and I'm crying." Yeah. But for me, I'm like, "That's totally normal. That's what you do, and it's okay." And I, I don't think that that message gets to people to say, "Oh, yeah, you lost some of your friends, and you're 23 or 19 or 27 or 32 years old, and you're going to be bummed out about that." Yeah. And there's going to be some uncontrollable emotions that you as a grown person are not used to because there's nothing, you know, oh, you get mad at the supermarket because the line was long or you get mad because your computer printer didn't work or you get sad because you watched a movie, but that's all different compared to, "Oh, I lost one of my really good friends." And it's a different kind of emotion that I'm not used to. So what they should be thinking is like, oh, that's normal. I'm sad that I lost some of my friends. And instead what they think is, I'm sad, it's uncontrollable, there must be something wrong with me. And that becomes, I I think that becomes the beginning of a problem. Like where no one says that. No one says, "Oh yeah, you you, you should you 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 cry." Oh yeah, you uncontrollably cried like yesterday afternoon while you were sitting uh, in your room by yourself. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's you lost one of your good friends. That's gonna happen. Yeah, okay. I I do that when I hear Dane Cook. When I hear Dane Cook, I think of Chris Gould. I think about our friendship, mm-hmm. and I think about that and like the fun, like listening to that and doing laundry and well, talking about stupid things. Like I think I hear that and I'm like, I'm just gonna cry. Like I, I did that. <laughs> I did that on. Uh, it was Memorial Day. I was out for a run um, and I was listening to something and it popped on and I came around. Brady was in the cul-de-sac with our neighbor who's an ex firefighter and I came around the cul-de-sac and I'm just screaming and I'm angry and I'm bawling my eyes out. And they're like, What's wrong? And I'm like, I'm upset. <laughs> like I just it fucking punches you and it's like feel it accept it sit in it sit in it and but you then have to move through it that's the difference is you can't hold on to it the anger and the sadness it's okay to feel it it's necessary to feel it but we don't teach anyone that it's important to feel it oh, it's, no it's fine it's fine something nothing's wrong nothing's wrong who's that helping you need to feel it or it's going to sit in you and it's going to hurt you long term you have to move through that shit but I was never taught that. And that's why I said, like, when I've been interviewed since, it's that's been a question. It's like, do you think anything could be done different? I said, the first thing I say every time is, Jocko asked me this question, and I think it illustrates exactly what went wrong and why in a really small sentence. Because no one pulled me aside and said that. And it was really no one's job to either, right? I wasn't, 
I wasn't supposed to be there. It wasn't supposed to happen. Like all these things happened. Like these were all things that happened in war, but situations just went wrong. It just was worse than they thought it would be. Mm. I mean, it's not that I think they wouldn't have brought me, but it just was worse. Yeah, and then you get done with this, yeah. and instead of decompressing with these guys and unknowingly venting and unknowingly like processing all these emotions, yeah. you wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, hey, everyone, we're gonna get together and we're gonna rehash and, and let out our emotions and go through our emotions, which, Guys do that without, it's not like a plan. It's just like, oh, we're freaking telling stories. Guys are like, oh, okay, okay. so you're crying, you're laughing, you're crying, mm -hmm. and you're processing all those things. That's pretty normal, very normal for that to happen. But you didn't do that with these guys. No, and that I have found out since, because a friend of mine, um, Jacqueline Scott, her name, her nickname's Jax, she was a CST. She's a uh, warrant officer special operations and she's been downraged and i said to her when i told her my story she was like oh yeah that that happened to me you go and you get attached to these people but the cst's like so i just did this jacks act that protects and gets mental health help for cst's but that wasn't happening for all of GWAT. So it's like if you were a CST, you were ripped away from the unit you were just with and then dropped back to wherever you are. To people who don't understand what you just went through, frankly, my guys didn't want to fucking hear about it. They were pissed off that I got to go in the first place. So coming back and then having that conversation was, and frankly, I was silent when I got back. So that's, that. if you know me, that's a problem. If I'm- Yeah, I can't really imagine that actually. Oh, well, it's okay. <laughs> You'll never have to. How's that? Um, so it, there was this idea that uh, you're just dropped. And so when you have no one to talk to, people that don't understand, haven't been there, didn't experience it, don't believe you. The fuck are you supposed to do with that? You stop sleeping. Okay. So then I would pace at the boardwalk. I would go down the boardwalk where the Tim Hortons is and um, where there's a bunch of like ridiculous restaurants in Afghanistan. And I would pace. And I would just walk and I would stay awake. And then Benji's uh, handler and Benji would hang out with me. And then one of the other Brits would come around and they would kind of swap off. Some of the guys would come hang out with me that I was with during that whole situation. They would come and hang out with me um, at night and stuff like that. Because I think it was like the green bean or the, that other coffee shop was open late. So I would get tea and I would walk around and pace. So now I'm not sleeping, but I'm not sleeping during the day either. So now I'm getting real irritable. Not only am I getting irritable, I'm starting to have issues with loud noises and like unexpected bangs and all of these things. Now I'm just crying in the shower on the floor. This is good. Um, and it gets to a point where I can almost talk about it like a separate person now, it feels, compared to like, like two years ago when I was here versus the way where I and like just the amount of work I've done since. It's like I can almost talk about it to a point where I don't fucking feel hysterical. It's like I can see it from an outside perspective. It's like, oh, God damn it, there was so much wrong. There was so much wrong that no one caught on to. No one paid attention to. And if they did catch on to it, it was from like a, an authoritarian, like you're in trouble now situation. Like I, I ended up getting put at the QMs with quartermasters, which again, even if you didn't deploy, even if you did deploy, and you were in the clerks, or you were mailing us, or you were getting us ammunition. You're a part of the team. But when you go to the QM and the quartermaster, who's a warrant officer, who hasn't set foot outside of CAF, looks at you and go, your ponytail's too high, where's your, where's your full magazine? The response isn't gonna be like, oh, ajda, it's no big deal, blah, 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 blah. It's gonna be like, go fuck yourself. You've been sitting at this CAF, you don't do anything but drink coffee and eat fucking Tim Hortons, and you wanna bitch at me about my ponytail right now after two days ago I was picking up some dude's body pieces? Get the fuck out of my face. Like, the response is not going to be met equally. It's mm -hmm. going to be intense and over, like, I hadn't slept. These are problems that are starting to come out. No, we don't recognize that as a problem. Instead, we go, mm, to punish her, we're just going to make her count pens. Yeah, and from a leadership perspective, you take that individual and you're like, hey, dude, I got a job for you over here. Yeah. You're going to come over here and you're going to hang out with me. Yeah. And everything's going to be cool. Yeah. And you're not going to get any trouble. And it's going to be all good. Yeah. And we're going to debrief some stuff. And you protect your people to make sure that they're not getting exposed to that kind of you know, authoritarian behavior, which they're not gonna respond well to. You, no. It's very difficult to respond well in those situations because everyone kind of comes out of it like, I literally don't care. No. And so you don't have any authority over me mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do whatever I want. And you gotta let them work through that 
Otherwise, you gotta you gotta keep them basically a little bit separate and, get, and let them decompress a little bit so that they can get that out of their system and they can come back to normal. You know, in this case, you know, uh, garrison life because mm-hmm. you can't. It can be diff, It can be difficult for people to go from into the in the field to garrison without having issues. So it's really the responsibility of the leadership to go. Yep. Oh, oh yeah, I, I got Kelsey. Yep, she's she's gonna be she's with me. She's gonna be with me for I got a, I have a special assignment for she's gonna, she's working on some stuff with me. And I'd be like, hey Kelsey, can you over the next couple of days we gotta prep this brief? And right. Can you help me with it? And you'd be like, I don't feel like doing that. I'd be like, yeah, I know, you don't want to, but cool. Here, put it together, and you know, right, all good. And I've done that with a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I've done that with a lot of, with a lot of people. Um, where it's like, hey, come, you know, JP Denell. He was when he, we got home from deployment. He went. He got pulled out of his platoon because he had a hurt shoulder, so they put him as a buds instructor. Mm. That wasn't a good move. <laughs> that was not a good move. <laughs> and Poor so, kids. yeah. And so, you know, after a very short period of time, I got the word, and I was like, "Yep, he come work for me." And yeah. brought him, you know. And then, it, then it's good because we are not going to expose him to stupid stuff. And it's okay. And no offense to people that do stupid stuff in the military <laughs> or that get, you know. And also, like that, whoever that guy is, whoever these people are that are, they don't. It's unfortunate. Oftentimes, you should default to, hey, if I see someone that's not doing the right thing, my default should be, what's wrong? What's going on? I mean, mm-hmm. if I'm a, in, an, a, in a senior le- or in a leadership position and I don't know you, right. and I, I'm walking across base and I see you and I'm like, hey, your ponytail is a little bit out of hand, uh, and you go, hey, fuck off, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be like, I'm going to punish you. I'd be right. like, Hey, hey, wh- what's going on? Are you, are you, how long are you in? How yeah. long are you be at this base for? Is everything cool? Like I wouldn't be on the attack mode. Right. I try and figure out what's going on because people that's not normal. And I can it doesn't take an, anybody. No one in the military is walking around telling people to fuck off. No. It doesn't happen. So when it happens, some there's that's like for lack of a better word, it's a huge cry for help or at least a yeah. serious indication that you're going to need some assistance right and so that's it's it's horrible to hear that it's horrible to hear that and again we got to do a better job inside the military of like teaching people how to lead instead of teaching people how to be authoritarian idiots because it's very easy to slip into that and it doesn't hit it's it's not hard um it's not hard to see it too i think a lot of these signs are really simple when people know what they're looking for unfortunately at the time that i was there Number one, these guys, most of them are French. So when I would speak to them in English, they, like, if it was like an agent, like a warrant officer, or like someone above, like, it was not, you speak French, like, you speak French to them because they don't speak English. And then so then they get frustrated and angry at you if you're not, you know. So anyway, mm-hmm. so that would happen, shit like that would happen. And then it'd be like, oh, your magazine's uh, empty. And I'd be like, used all the rounds like what the fuck and you would get you would get written up for that and then i remember one time uh, I, I got set when i finally got to go back to my fob um at that point they had put me on a laundry list of medications and didn't tell my staff so they put me on drugs <sighs> heavy drugs um for sleep and all these other things and like fast acting stuff and then they sent me back out to the fob but didn't tell my staff. So my sergeant, Sergeant LeBlanc, had no idea what was going on. And finally, at one point, you know, I would just kind of walk around like a zombie. I would go do my workouts, I'd do my run, I'd go do the tower stuff, but it was just very like slow moving, kind of quiet, like, didn't, didn't talk to anyone. And at one point my sergeant sat me down and he was like, you know, if you want to, you want to be a part of these, these, this group, you need to participate. And I remember just being like, I don't fucking care. Like, I just, you know what I mean? Like, these guys were already pissed off. I went and got to go and do something that they wanted to go do. They were bored. We weren't shooting at the time. Like, I understand it. Like, I get it. You're, you're on a fob day in, day out. That can get, repi- like, the repetition there. And, like, you're going to war. So, like, you're supposed to be fucking fighting. And, like, when you're not, it's it gets boring. And I get it. But I'd come back. And at this point, you know, some of the some of the stories of what had happened had kind of made word around. And then like one of the girls I knew was like, don't fucking talk about that. Like people think you're crazy. No one believes that. Like no one believes you. And I was like, awesome. So I like went back and he was like, you know, if you want to, you know, be a part of the group, you got to like, you need to try and be a part of the group, you know, this whole thing. And he was trying. And that night we ended up shooting 
uh, it was like night, early morning, and we were doing rounds down range. And I mean, like normally we would pop like a couple pop, 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 and then we would stop for a bit. We would do another fire mission. But at this point, we were like, boom, 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 and we were just cranking. And at about 10 rounds, because I had they give me the sleep one that you put on your tongue that dissolves really fast, fast acting. I had taken that. I was told you take at this point in my life, I was told you take your medication when you're supposed to take your medication. And uh, and so I'm not even waking up to this. And our tent's right beside the triple sevens. I'm just feeling the vibration and I'm just like, okay, no one's coming to get me. No one's saying like, I didn't hear fire mission. I just know rounds are going down. So I finally got up and I went out there and they're cranking rounds down and now we're cranking mortars and they pull me over to the mortar and they give me a round. They're like, let's go. And like, so one of the RSM starts yelling at me in French. And I remember freezing with the mortar and just going like freezing. And he's like, let's go, tabarnak burns, let's go. He starts yelling at me and I'm like, I was so fucking out of it that by the time I finally put the mortar and let go, I just started bawling my eyes out. I had no idea like what was going on. Like, and my sergeant said to me, he's like, we were looking for you. We went up to the GD. We thought you were on GD maybe. Like, like I always come running to the guns. Like I, I'm always one of the first ones there because I like certain positions. So if you get there first, you can put <laughs> you know? um, So, you know, but I didn't move. And then I remember I pulled him inside the tent. And it's funny, we talked about this and he says it to me all the time. And I, I think he feels really guilty. And he'd be like, I remember the moment you lined up your pills and you showed them to me. He goes, hey, T Burns, fuck. And I said, yeah, I've been on these since I got back. And he just, you could see like, this is not good or okay. We have to do something about this like right now. And then the tower situation happened where I racked around and it was a kid and I didn't pull the trigger and it was a whole situation because I... Thought she was waving. She was waving. She was, but I was so... After what happened with the IED, my tone changed. My empathy was gone. My ability to see Afghanis as human beings was fucking over. Like, I didn't care if you were a kid. I didn't care if you were a woman or you were a Taliban member. I didn't fucking like you. I didn't want to see your face. Don't fucking look at me. Don't talk to me. Don't try to fucking grab at me. I was forceful. I was violent and I was angry. So like when that happened and I went down off the tower and I told them, they were like, yeah, you're, you're, you got to go back to calf. Like this is a problem. And they had worded it to me like, don't worry, you're coming back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Don't worry. We'll see you soon. Like, don't take all your stuff. <laughs> Just take what you need. Just take what you need. Um, and then I went back to calf. And uh, yeah, that was the last. Uh, that was the last time I saw that fob. That was the last time I ran a triple seven. And um, that was the last time I saw everyone except for my sergeant. And I saw him by chance when he was going on his HLTA. So his break, I was at CAF when he um, was, was rotating out to go on his holiday. So he saw me, and I remember it so clearly. He was in a truck. He was on the passenger side. And he was jumping in the truck, and he's like, "You gotta fucking give me something." Give me something. What is going on with you? You need to give me something. Like, talk to me. Talk mm-hmm. to me. I was like, I don't know. I have nothing. I'm not feeling good. And then um, that's when they made me see the doctor more often. And then I went on my HLTA. So they sent me out of country on holiday mm-hmm. to I end up going. I was meeting my mom in the Dominican. And so I went through um, Dubai, Heathrow, Toronto to Dominican. And I was out of my mind on these, you know, psychiatric meds, sleep meds, anti-anxiety, antidepressant meds. Um, they don't tell you really like what you can take with it, or what you can't, or they don't really tell you contraindications. They don't really say like, don't drink alcohol or like, don't party. <laughs> like they don't really give you a briefing. So you leave, I go. And then I was in Dominican for almost three weeks and it was just, my mom didn't know what to deal with me how to deal with me what the fuck was wrong with me it was there'd be loud noises I would crouch down and start screaming at the top of my lungs while we were gone we had lost some more Canadians that I had done training with out of that were Van Dues so it was like I just need to get back I need to get back I need to get back I don't know what the fuck I thought I was gonna do but I needed to get back so once I did get back into country they brought me back to the um to calf and then they kept bringing me to the doctors and now I had standing appointments where they were assessing me And that's when they assessed me in country and diagnosed me in country. So 
um, that at that point that triggered the system to send me home. So I ended up going home. I think it was like about three weeks before everyone else went home from my gun troop, and I never saw anyone again. I didn't see the Brits, I didn't see the Canadians, and I didn't see the Americans again. It's a good debrief you got. Yeah, it, was, it was super solid. It felt uh, felt useful. Felt like it was uh, tools in my so toolbox. What did they tell you? They're like, okay, we're sending you home early. Mm. What's their reason? Uh, they end up dying me, uh, diagnosing me at the time. It was acute PTSD. So it was on a severe scale. They were hoping it was acute, meaning mm -hmm. like, we'll work through it. It'll get better. It'll go away. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they just said, you're going home and you're going to go to report to Vakitse. You're going to meet with the RSM and your RSM is going to give you your papers and you're going to go to the hospital in Ottawa. Because that's where they want to send you to the closest spot of where your family is mm -hmm. for support. And my the closest spot was where I swore in, which was Ottawa, which was uh, about just under three hours from my parents. Mm -hmm. So I was the closest they could get me. So did you go back there as like an inpatient? No, at first it was outpatient and they kept me as originally they were, cause they don't do a lot of inpatient in a lot of places. So they put me as outpatient. So I went to the RSM first. I flew into Quebec, like middle of the night, 2 AM, empty airport, no fucking clue how to get to and from. So I called uh, an officer I knew, woke him up. I was like, would you come pick me up? And so he took me to get a coffee and then I went back to the regiment and I had to wait at the regiment because the housing that I was staying in was on the base and they were renovating it all. So I had nowhere to go. So I just went to the regiment. I got there in the regiment. I'm in my uniform and my boots that are still fucking held together with duct tape and blood all over them and went up to the RSM's office and he handed me a piece of paper and he said, you're going to Ottawa. And that was it. And right before I had left Afghanistan, my major sat me down, took all of the medical chits that they had been doing while I was there, threw them at me and told me that it would be better if I just died. It would have been less paperwork. Now to have come to find out that piece of shit <laughs> has been kicked out of the military for sexual assault, like by seven different mm -hmm. women. So it's like karma sucks when you're that person. Or it's kind of good. Or it's kind of fantastic, but I'm trying to be kind. <laughs> yeah, there's that... Uh that saying, I believe it's a Native American saying. Can you say Native American? You have to say indigenous for Canadians. Um, and it's the diagnosis is a curse, right? Like mm. you get diagnosed with something, it's a curse. Mm. And and then the other thing is, we did a podcast. We have another podcast called the Underground Podcast, and we we talked about this experiment. And I I I, I need to memorize these details, but basically they took kids kids that had a little bit of a speaking impediment, it's a little bit, like a little bit of a stutter that are seven, eight years old, and they said, hey, this is really bad and it's gonna get a lot worse. It's gonna be a problem in your life. And sure enough, all their freaking stutters got way worse. They took kids that had a little bit of a stutter and they said, oh yeah, this is normal, it's no big deal, You're, you'll grow out of it. They all grew out of it. They took kids that had no stutter and said, the way you talk indicates that you you have a tendency to start stuttering and you need to pay attention to that and they developed stutters. And this was this was in, ah, I, forget, I wanna say the years was like maybe the 30s yeah, or something you, like that. You can't do can't that, do that now. Anymore. And they call, it, they call it the monster experiment because it was monstrous what they did to these kids it and is. they ended up suing. And But you know, isn't it interesting, you know, even if, just to say like, oh yeah, Kelsey, you know how you feel like really bad right now? That's, first of all, that's normal. And second of all, you'll you'll, process through it over time and you'll be okay. And guess what? Everybody has people die. People's, your, everyone's parents dies. Everyone's grandparents dies. It's normal and we deal with death and you're, you, that's what you're feeling. You're feeling it a lot more right now because most people don't have to deal with people that are their age dying. It's sort of a war thing. Occasionally it's a drunk driving thing. Occasionally it's a, you know, it right. does happen. But you feel really bad right now, and that's what—that's the way everybody feels. And that what you're feeling is normal. And over time, it's going to process. It's going to get better. I don't know how many people I have had reach out to me. Um, we did a podcast, and I was talking about overcoming grief, and I did this whole big thing. It was very dramatic. <laughs> no one's shocked. V very dramatic, but you know, I basically described when when you lose someone, you get hit with waves of emotion that you can't control, and they're gonna be bad and it's gonna be a storm and it's gonna feel like you're never gonna get out. 
that's the way it feels and we, it feels like that because we're as we grow up we get control of our emotions and all of a sudden we don't need to you know we can push through things well all of a sudden you get hit with emotions you can't control boom it's a wave it's a storm you think it's never going to end well it does end and then when it when that kind of dissipates a little bit you're still going to get hit with more waves you're still going to hit with other storms they're not going to be as bad they're, and then over time, they're going to become less and less frequent. Sometimes people feel guilty because they think, wait, I was so heartbroken and now I'm not. And there's something wrong with me. No, no, no. You're just processing the information. So I think it's terrible as I'm hearing you talk about this. It's like the curse of a diagnosis of being like, oh, you have something wrong with you, when it should be like, oh yeah, you're experiencing what everybody experiences that goes into combat and loses people. Yep, that's normal. Yep, well, yep. Here, put yourself in the normal box, and here's what's gonna happen over the next six months to a year, might even be 18 months. The horrible feelings that you're feeling right now are gonna dissipate over time, that's normal. If sometimes it feels like they're not gonna dissipate, it's okay, the harder they hit you, the more they're gonna dissipate. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be okay, you're gonna work through it, you're gonna be okay, we all, we all that have been in combat and lost people, we've all been through it. You're going to be good to go. Like that would be such a nice thing to understand. It's amazing how much rewiring has to be done to individuals after deployments if they are not held in that box and said, hey, this is normal. This is good. I've seen it now in some of the stuff I do and the work that I do. After I did your show, I got inundated with people who just needed help after we talked about the psychedelics and ways that I was starting to heal and things like that. Um, just the amount of people that were like, that hurt me to hear so much because I heard myself in you. And once you had the, you and I are having that conversation, it's like, it made so much common sense. Like this is the amount of rewiring, the amount of work that has to be done all because of really terrible, uneducated leaders and nothing more than that. Nothing more than people who just didn't know any better or did know any better and didn't care enough to put the effort into their people so that they could end up coming out of this. The amount of people that have been medically released in the military that have lost their jobs because they were given a diagnosis. And this is something I... Last week on one of my lectures, I was learning, I'm doing a integration coaching. Like I'm, I'm doing a program so I can work with heroic hearts to help with other veterans. And the one of the lessons was on, particularly was on this kind of topic about things like 12 step and AA and how it's like the conversation is once an addict, always an addict. Well, no, 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 no. That's putting somebody in a box to say, this is your diagnosis. This is who you are for life. That's not true at all. You can learn and you can heal and you can grow from these things so that you do not have to stay in that box. But we're told so often that that box is where we're held and that in order to work through that, you have to stay in that box and you can't really push too far outside of it because, well, we don't, wanna, we don't want anyone to relapse or we don't want anyone to struggle. It's like you have to see yourself outside of that diagnosis or you will live and eat and sleep and breathe that diagnosis. That's just the way it works. How you talk to the mind and the body is how the mind and body are going to to respond to you. So if you keep saying, I'm so-and-so, I have PTSD. I'm so-and-so, I have a TBI. You're hearing that. And that is being reinforced in your wiring. That's why things like, that's why I use psilocybin. It changes the wiring. Change up the tone so that you can start thinking differently so that the new pathways can be formed. I'm not Kelsey and I'm, I got injured in Afghanistan and I have PTSD. I'm, I'm Kelsey, I, I deployed to Afghanistan, I served, I came out with PTS and I'm doing pretty fucking awesome. Like it doesn't have to be everything, it doesn't have to be your whole life, but we have to stop this, you are the diagnosis. Cause it's really what's holding people back and it's really what's honestly killing people long-term. So you get home and you get, did you eventually go into inpatient? No, so I so didn't. So they kept you in outpatient. Yeah, but I had to go like multiple days a week. So I was like two, three days a week. I just had to get on a bus, go down to the Ottawa hospital, which is also a- Were you getting paid active duty? Like, are you still in the army at this point? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you're yeah. in the army and your only job is just to like- Get your shit together. Right. <laughs> just get it together. Um, but it at this point though, there was a gap. So when I went to Ottawa versus when someone called me was a six month gap. What were you doing in the six months? Stuff. Just, just like, like not being a soldier, traveling. 
and you were spending all the money, spending the money, and they weren't how checking on you. Mm-mm. That doesn't seem like a very squared away system. It wasn't a squared away system. A lot of people since then have been like, there's no way no one called you. I'm like, oh, yes, there is. There's for sure. And when they did finally call, the conversation was because um, I had the doctors I was seeing, but it was not, they were not military doctors, mm-hmm. right? They're like social workers and those types of people who are just following up on paperwork, making sure their medication is being dosed out and that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there wasn't accountability with them. Mm. I'm like, you're not authority to me. Are you still taking all the drugs that they're giving oh, you? Oh, yeah. What, like, what's the major drug that they're giving you? I don't know a lot about drugs. Well, I, I wish I actually have the list because I just recently had to... My TBI diagnosis just got turned on by Veterans Affairs because they said it was not service related. So I am having to fight it. So I actually saw for the first time the laundry list of medication mm-hmm. written out that I was on and it was like clozapine and Zoloft and Percocet. It was like, it was just nasty, heavy, contraindicated type of drugs. And just like numbs your brain? Oh my God. It, it flatlined me. Andy asked me that last week. He goes, what, what's it like to be on an SSRI? I've never been on SSRI. I was like... If you take somebody's, you know, the heartbeat, the EKG and all this thing, just flatline it. Everything, emotions, uh, happiness, sadness, sex drive, like unbelievable amounts of just numb. Nothing made me happy, nothing made me sad. Nothing made me tired, nothing made me awake. I was always kind of groggy. I was always just kind of humming along. So it's like a chemical lobotomy of sorts? It felt that way because I had so many other different drugs though. Right. And so now I understand like some of those drugs should not have been taken in conjunction with others. Like I didn't know that, though. Mm. Um, And that just goes to the conversation between the doctors and where were the gaps. Right. Mm -hmm. Who was talking to who? Who was prescribing what? Um, So anyway, I, I had a gap there when they did finally call. They said, hey, we're going to try and retrain you, meaning we're going to post you to a unit in Ottawa. You're going to go two half days a week. Tuesday mornings and Thursday mornings, and you're gonna work those hours. We're gonna give this a go. And so I went to Connaught Range, which is in Ottawa, which works with the Hill, works with RCMP, and it's one of the largest Commonwealth ranges around. Mm-hmm. It's massive, massive. We do everything I said we did there. We do all the types of training people say that don't happen there, just because you don't know it's not happening doesn't mean it does not happen in there. Okay, so we do all different types of things there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the whole thing was work the radios, so when somebody was calling to make the range go hot, I would just run them through the, you know, the speech and then, yeah, range hot. Da, 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 da. And then I would go clear the range. And then we also were attached to a protected wildlife kind of sanctuary. So we had like a little hovercraft and we had like, we would go out and we would see if people were fishing that weren't supposed to fish. And we had a couple big birds. We made sure that they didn't fucking electrocute themselves. One did. It was, you know, it's just, I drove around. It was menial task, mm-hmm. nothing exciting. Um, but there was a situation where finally I was, I was starting to kind of get into a flow of things. Um, there was a situation, though, where I went to clear a range and I went to step on the sand and it just uh, I reverted backwards fucking fast. And I just dropped and they're like, nah, you're done. This isn't going well for anyone. And so then they decide to discharge you from the army? Yeah. So at that point, then they brought me, I went to like the board, the medical board, and they started to look at like, Okay, doctor's appointments, medication, retraining, how is everything kind of going? And then, because at that point I had signed a second contract, so I was on my fourth year. Um, and so they were like, are we, she's gonna stay? Or are we keeping her? What's happening? And then they decided they were gonna give me a 3B medical release. So an honorable discharge, but a 3B med release. So a full med release uh, for the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And then what's your next move? So now you're out of the army, you're still getting a paycheck. Uh, I, I was, yeah, I was still getting a paycheck. Um, and then what had happened was, uh, I got the, and, and mind you, I tried not to leave. Mm-hmm. I tried to stay. I said, just post me to where I want to be and I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll work a reserve unit. I just, I don't want to leave. Um, and they said it's, they, the, the I remember the social worker being like, you're not going to work again. Like you're done. Like you're not going to work ever again. Um, and at this point, uh, I was dating Brady, who's now my husband, and he lived in British Columbia. So I got released on the 23rd of May, and I was on a plane on the 24th. And then I went up to British Columbia. And then I'd, I've been there ever since. And then at that point, I had um, was waiting to kind of get a doctor out in British Columbia. And then I was switched over to the Operational Stress Injury Clinic, who I end up seeing Dr. Mock and Dr. Greg Passy, who's now Dr. Passy, still my doctor to this day. 
Um, and then we just worked really, really diligently, really hard. And those were the really dark years. Those were the years where like the suicide was every day, the thoughts of it were every day, the planning of it were every day. And I was numb and it was super fucked up. And I would, I was riding mountain bikes and we were doing all these other like, you know, things to stay busy. And, you know, life was good. Like I had a good life. Um, and it looked good on the outside, but I just wanted to die every day. And that's hard to explain to people when you're 21 years old and like you have everything and you get to live in this amazing province and you have a, you know, a great boyfriend and everything's going awesome and you get to go to Whistler and do this and do that. And it's like, yeah, but I still want to fucking die every day. I don't want to leave my bed every day. And I fucking hate everyone. And anybody who looks like they're Middle Eastern, I... I'm terrified of like to the point where it's like I'm a dog who's been abused by them where you come near me I'm gonna snap like it's like I'm fearful what I'll do when I'm around them like I don't I can't be pulled over by a cop that looks brown or I'm gonna like I had my doctor's number on speed dial because I used to drive to his office to Vancouver right and I live on the border so I used to drive the 45 minutes all the way downtown but there's a stretch on the freeway and um, it, there's always traffic like dead stop traffic but it's right beside two Muslim schools one for girls and one for boys. And I would always get stuck in the spot. And it would, I would, coming home from a treatment, and it would just fucking send me into a rage. So I'd always go down into the HOV lane. And I would tell my doctor, I'm always going in the HOV lane. If I get pulled over, I'm calling you. I'm going to call you. Because if this cop is not white or black, and he looks and he's got a, like a term, anything, I'm fucking calling you and I'm not rolling the window down. Because it was to the point where I was legitimately that reactive. Male Middle Eastern men fucking spun me out. Are you, are you on a bunch of drugs still at this oh, point? Oh, yeah. I'm on all these drugs until I didn't stop going. I didn't, I didn't start to slow down on these drugs until right before we had my son. Like, what does your doctor say when you call and say that? Like, that seems to me to be very alarming if you're calling me up and saying, like, if I get pulled over by someone that's not white or black, I, I'm I'd gonna panic. go crazy. I'd panic. I'd legitimately panic. So what does your doctor say when you tell him that? He goes, I'm here. I'm here if you need. We'll just deal with it. We, one day at a time, we'll deal with it as we go. And it you, never happened. When you say you're working through stuff, yeah. like what does that actually mean? Like when you sit down with your doctor, because I've never talked to any kind of like a <laughs> person like this before. Yeah. So I don't know, like what are you doing? So first he would, obviously he would review the file of when he got me and then he would just sit me down and he would, he like the first time I met him, I was with Mock too and I remember it, my like, whole body just shook and I sweat so bad, I was soaked by the end of the conversation and he'd be like, run me through what happened. Mm. So we would do exposure therapy, we would do EMDR, we do traditional talk therapy, we would do medication, um, we would do, uh, f you know, physical fitness was a big part of the therapy, making sure I was staying up on that. And then it, it got to the point where it was like, we're just gonna work on exposure therapy. So I live in a province where there's a huge population of people from overseas. We have a ton of immigration in Canada and BC, it's a, in particular, right? And so there's an area called Surrey. I would not go. I would not go. No chance. Um, uh, a lot of the women, burqas, like certain areas, um, headscarves, uh, traditional garb, like nothing, nothing wrong with that. But I wasn't ready for that interaction to happen. So I just wouldn't go there. And then I had a situation because at this point they were like, we're going to also send you back to school. Huh. So they sent me back to school and I went to a school that was predominantly a lot of these people who I wasn't quite ready to be in a room with. And then there was a bunch of school shootings that happened in America. So then now the colleges were like, we're going to do active shooter drills <laughs> and not tell the students when we're doing them. And that didn't fly with me real well. Um, they attempted to do one and I, I like I've I was gone. I was like, if that ever happens again, I need to know. And they're like, well, we can't tell you when. And I was like, then I'm not responsible if you come near me as a pretend person for how I react. Um, and once they, we started having the conversation with the college, I, I end up leaving my degree like three, three credits short because I, I couldn't do it anymore. Are you seeing any progress as you're going to like counseling? It, it, it would do this. And that's the other thing I really want to, state before I say this, healing is not linear at all. 
It doesn't mean because you start at A, you're going to get to Z, and it's going to do this straight line. Very often it's this. Mm-hmm. My experience with counseling is goodwill hunting. Have yeah. you seen this movie, Echo Charles? Yes, sir. <laughs> Robin Williams <laughs> and Matt Damon <laughs> doing um, therapy. Yeah. Right, you look a lot like Matt Damon. Thank by you. the way, the, the young pictures of Matt Damon. It is factual. Yes, actually, factual. and I I actually pulled up a picture, and uh, ex- it's pretty obvious. And I actually, I have a I have a, a friend that's pretty good friends with Matt Damon, and I like forwarded it to him. I go, dude, check this out, and he showed him. He was, showed me the little text back, and they were laughing about it. So yes, there's some similarities. Yes, but is that what therapy is kind of like? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> listen, my my therapist is an old school, old dude. He's a bad dude. He served in Bosnia, Rwanda. He does not fuck around. He doesn't take, I'm not feeling well today. No, more. Give, that's bullshit. Mm. Let's try again. Like, So this is like Goodwill Hunting. Because yeah. Goodwill Hunting, Robin Williams was a nom. Shit. Yeah. Allegedly, right? So he was yeah. a nom. Allegedly. He wasn't taking any so, shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah. Dr. Passy. Okay. But with like a cowboy hat and sometimes really fancy boots. Just depends on his day. Um, So he, yeah, we did a lot of exposure therapy. So what he would be like is like, I want you to go sit in a mall. I just want you to sit in the food court. Tell me how you feel. See how long you can stay. this dude's taking, like, if you were saying this kind of stuff to me, I'd be like, cool, I'm going to handcuff you and you can sit in a mall, like, with your hands behind your back. Right. And I'll expose you like that. Yeah. So, but we would try that shit. Seriously. And then when I was at the college, I was coming home one day. I was coming back from New West and I was driving down the road and a car cut me off right before I got onto the Alex Fraser Bridge. And it was a car full of Middle Eastern people. And I sat there and he cut me up and cut in front of me. And the driver got out of the car and came up to my window and smashed his hand on my window and started screaming at me. And so my whole body just started like convulsing, like genuine convulsing. So I just called 911. I was like, hi, I'm being assaulted by this man. Um, You're going to need to do something because I'm going to do something. She's like, ma'am, stay in the car. I'm like, he's smashing my window. Like I'm sitting here like laughing at him as he's getting more and more angry. I'm like, this is, and then the light turns gray. He jumps in the car and takes off. I grab his plate. They take the plate. They go down. They actually dealt with him and he actually got like in a lot of trouble. So I just, for me, it was like, Exposure therapy was one of the bigger ways. It doesn't, now listen, exposure therapy is hard, very difficult for a lot of people and it does not always work. Sometimes it can make it worse for individuals. It actually got to a point where they would get me to write down the the really bad stuff that happened on deployment, like all of it. Everything that's like in here, write it out into like a couple pages and then I'd have to read it to them. And so it got to the point where I was actually saying this and it was making it not worse, but I wasn't. it wasn't helping. Mm-hmm. It wasn't helping the situation. So um, then we moved on to things like EMDR and, you know, that's where you wear the little sensors in your hands and, you know, it triggers the brain, the one side of the brain and that's supposed to help. It didn't work with me. For me, it really was just starting to understand PTS and PTSD and how the brain worked. When he started, he got, he's got this whiteboard. When he started to <clears throat> explain to me, instead of treat me like a patient, but talk to me like a colleague, I started to wrap my brain around it. He's like, so this is what's happening. When you have this event, this part of your brain is lighting up. And because of a T, well, he, we didn't know at the time, but because of PTS, you know, this isn't actually doing what it should be doing. So your dopamine and your serotonin, and then he would start to explain how the brain is, you know, um, handling it, and then your cortisol, and like, that's why you're having physical reactions. So he just started to talk to me like a person and not say, hey, so what's wrong with you today? Or how are you struggling today? He'd be like, this is what's going on with your body. And I would go, Oh, so when I see that person, that's why I'm feeling that way. Oh, so see, you're just explaining to me what's happening. I can start to wrap my brain around it. I wasn't this like helpless, hopeless individual sitting across from you that just needed to be fixed. They need to be fixed. I needed to be heard and I needed to be understood and I needed to be educated. That was it. Um, And what we've now found out as of last year was I had an un part of the reason it took me so long to get to this point. Um, and again, there is no time frame that is right and healing is not linear. So it can take you 10, 20, 30 years. It can take you one to two years. It depends on how it's handled. For me, from 2009, from, the, from that operation till about 2015, that's when I was heavily, heavily medicated. Like would wake up in the middle of the night Make food, have no clue I did it. 
would have conversations with Brady and he'd be like, do you not remember the whole conversation we had last night? But nope. Would not be and able. And that's all medicine induced. Yeah, kind of? yeah, yeah. All, all like, um, what's that word? Like uh, reactions, or mm-hmm. like it's just like a something that can happen. I can't think of the word right now. It's there's a word for that. Blackout is like when you drink. Yeah, I think but we that's call it a blackout. <laughs> yeah, well, something yeah. like something that. like that. A drug yeah, induced yeah. blackout. Of and I, I actually had several situations in Ottawa when I was living by myself where I would wake up on the floor and I used to like to make peanut butter toast and I'd wake up with my cat like on the floor like I'd be passed out so I must have hit my head when I went down and I'd eaten like half a loaf of bread like I just this shit was just all medication related and so Dr. Passy got really really serious he's like hey like you know at this point I'd be, I was married Brady and I got married we knew we wanted to have kids so this the conversation had to get real about like hey you're on drugs that yes they may be helping you but at what cost if you have a child mm-hmm. right and so that's when we started to get into the serious conversation about medication. And, and that's when I started to say like, hey, I, I don't want to be on these my whole life. There's got to be a better way. And then that's when he suggested art therapy. And that's how that started. And that's the beginning of your jewelry company. Yeah, it's such a weird thing to say jewelry company because a lot of people shy away that's when I say I that. That's why I made a funny look when I made I know, it. It's, it's like, jewelry <laughs> company. It's weird because I never... Uh, yeah, yeah. I never meant to make jewelry. I never wore jewelry. It's not a space I uh, used to fuck in. It's not something I used to love. But I was like, I love jewelry. I love dressing. Like, this is not I'm a tomboy with tearaway pants. So when it came up, he just suggested art therapy of any kind. Painting, write, do something. And so that's when we started that. And I started um, going to local stores and I... I had a, well, basically Brady was like, why don't you just call some friends and get some casings? Like you have a bunch of people that can get you some stuff. Why don't you play with those? Like, I don't know what you're going to make out of it, but just go play with those. So I made some calls to some people that I end up, you know, who were, did basic with, but were now snipers in the RCR. And they sent me some like Lapua casings and then some 50 cals and then some 7.62s and 5.56. And <clears throat> they would ship them to me in a box. And uh, so at that point I had started like, sitting on the kitchen table and hammering the shit out of brass. And I would get like a uh, wire and like wire wrap things. And I'm just, I'm a mess, but I'm out of bed though. I'm out of bed. And I didn't think of suicide. I didn't brush my teeth, but I didn't, I also didn't lie in bed all day. That's serious. So that was a, that was like, I got out of bed. I sat down at the kitchen table. I was there from the moment he went to work and I was there when he got home and I didn't move, but I wasn't in bed. He was like, okay. My brain is focused on something else. So at that point, that started to grow. Um, Meaning I was like, well, I heard that crystals work. And I was like, at the point of like just desperation of like hating waking up, hating how I was feeling or not feeling at all. um, Hating the way I was reacting and fighting in my life and just the pain that was just getting up and opening my eyes every day. And so I was like, fuck it, crystals it is. And so I went to a local store (laughs) and I like found a whole wall of crystals and I was like, I like black. So I picked a bunch of black stones and um, clear rocks and started wire wrapping these just, I have photos now when I look back at the shit that I was on my website and I'm just, it's just, it's atrocious. Um, But it was, what's beautiful about it is it was the start of something really, really cool and that was the start of me finding my way out of this diagnosed life I was deemed to live for the rest of my existence and be a welfare patient and someone who's on meds and who has to be at a doctor every other day. And that's what the military told me was going to be the rest of my life. And this was a lifeline. And so I started uh, building beaded bracelets. So just a beaded bracelet with like an eight millimeter bead on it with a hole in it and I would take elastic and then I would, um, Brady bought me a a pipe cutter, a handheld pipe cutter and he built me this little block of wood and then he drilled a hole so I could put the casing in there so I could take the firing pin out and then I could hammer that instead of the kitchen table. Cause I would just, I would just sit there and hammer it on the kitchen table, like brand new kitchen table, brand new house, just married. And I'm just fucking this thing sideways. Just like, this is my workshop now. Like, and so I'm sitting there and um, I told Dr. Passy this and he's like, okay, let's, let's lean in here because we found something that's making you get up, making you alive, uh, making you happy or seem to be happy. Um, let's 
keep just keep doing it and we'll keep working on this stuff so when i would go see him he would talk to me be like hey how's your sex drive and i'd be like fine fully lie to him come to find out later on that was a tbi issue um and then he would be like so uh how'd you sleep and i'd be like didn't sleep He'd be like, okay, well, let's talk about how we can get you to sleep. And then we would start just like ticking away at little things. Like sleep is the most important thing. We understand that. I know you're friends with Huberman and he talks about sleep is like the most important thing. If you can get people to sleep, you can get them to heal. You can get them through anything. That's why you also know the other flip side. When we want people to talk, what do we do to them? We withhold sleep. Because within 24 hours, people's brains will fucking melt. Like you need sleep. So it would be like, let's focus on getting you sleep for the, like the next handful of months. How are we going to do that? How do we accomplish that? Do we need to get you moving more during the day so you're expending more energy? Do we need to look at the doses of meds? Do we need to look at your sleep schedule? And we would just tackle one task at a time. One task at a time. While all doing that, I would just build jewelry all day. So... I'd sit there, oh, I almost just made a joke, I'm not allowed to say. Um, I would sit there like I was in a factory and I would just pump out jewelry, like it's going like out of style. And I would just make these beaded bracelets. So I'd take the 762 round of the 556 casing, I would grab it with a um, pair of pliers, grab the pipe, uh, pipe cutter and cut the end off and I'd take about that much off of it there. And then I'd pop the firing, uh, the firing pin out and I'd chamfer the edges and I'd string it onto a bracelet and I'd tie a bracelet. And then uh, people started to like them. And then my husband was like, hey, so I think you might have something here. Like I can help you if you want. And so he built a website for me. And so we built a website and then we got our friend Clayton um, who came and he would take photos and then he'd, we'd put them on the website and then, you know, nothing really happened, right? Because like, just because you have a website doesn't mean things are going to sell. So, <laughs> right, Echo? Correct. Correct. So then uh, at that point it was, well, you have to cold call, start knocking on doors. Well, what the hell does that mean? I don't know. Who who buys jewelry? Stores. Okay, well, what kind of stores? Fashion stores. Well, I don't really like fashion and I'm not really into it. How am I going to get them to buy my stuff? So I would go and I would cold call people on the phone. I'd, I'd just go through a list of like boutiques in Vancouver and I would cold call people. And then the next question would be like, what's it called? I don't know. And they'd be like, do you have a line sheet? And I'm like, what's the line sheet? They'd be like, what's your margins? I was like, good question. What do you work on? Like, I just, I had to learn from the ground up. And so I started learning. And then I got my first store in South Surrey. And um, I started selling there. And then she was like, hey, there's a trade show in Las Vegas. And at this point, I was mildly pregnant. But for a small person, I was huge. And uh, she's like, there's a trade show in Las Vegas. It's called Magic. It's where all the buyers from like North America come to do their sourcing or their retail shopping for all their stores. Like, you know, all the big brands go there. Like Rebecca Minkoff goes there, like Timberland goes there and then like smaller, you know, brands go, everyone goes. You can get buy a booth just like SHOT Show, you can go and do it. So I made a backpack full of these beaded bracelets and I printed off what I thought would be line sheets and I took a friend with me and I was like, we don't have tickets to get into the show, but we're gonna get in. So we weaseled our way into the show and I went to the jewelry section of the where the buyers would go and I would stop people when they came out of meetings with, with other brands and be like, hi, my name's Kelsey Sharon and I own this business called Her Wearables because that's what it was first called. And I, I do this and I'm gonna donate the money to this and then here's some samples, here's some line sheets. And I signed 10 stores, super frowned upon. Like they don't like when you do that because people are paying thousands of dollars for these booths and I'm just like, hi, I'm in the corner and it worked. So then that night uh, we went to dinner at this restaurant called Carbone and Aria. Didn't have a reservation, just like shouldn't have been there and they got us in. They said, you got 45 minutes. So we sat down and then these two guys sat down beside me. I didn't know these guys. They were both very flamboyant and more than willing to have conversation. And I had been wearing like five or six of these. And it was just all brass casings and beads on my one arm. So it like kind of stood out. And he leaned over and he goes, what are those? I said, those are bullet casings. And he goes, why? And I said, perfect. That's why I put a bullet casing on my wrist so that now I can talk to you about veterans issues and mental health. He looks at me, he's like, okay. So I give him this you know, whole spiel. By the end of the dinner, he goes, I'd like to meet with you tomorrow. We have a, you know, we have a company and we work with some people and we connect, we connect people. We'd love to chat if you're up for it. We're like, sure. Gives us his name. We go back to the hotel, I Google his name and I'm like, that's where I've seen him. He's married to Jesse Tyler Ferguson from Modern Family. So I was like, this guy's connected to someone. 
And I don't know why, but he's connected. So I'm like, we'll meet with him. We meet with him. And he's like, my girlfriend, Beth Bears, from Two Broke Girls, is looking for a partner for jewelry for uh, her sexual assault foundation that she's working with equine therapy with. So I think you might be a cool fit. Like, would you mind if I introduced you? And I was like, it's fine. It's totally fine. Meanwhile, I'm like freaking the fuck out inside. Anyway, long and short, I meet with her and um, we have a conversation. We design a bracelet and a necklace and sh- they give me a call and they're like, hey, so Ellen's 12 days of giveaway is coming up. Um, are you able, do you have like 400 bracelets? Because Beth wants to bring them on the 12 days of giveaway on Ellen. And I'm like, i still making these on my kitchen table. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. When do you need them by? This is Thursday. They need them for Saturday. So... My neighbors come over and people help me and we're packaging and I'm just stringing bees. This is like an episode of like every reality business show where yeah. they're like, you yeah. got a big deal, but it's due by Thursday. You're yeah. like, okay, I'll get it done. So I get it done. I get them there and I turn on the TV and Beth is bouncing around in her elf costume and Ellen's got one of my mini warrior bracelets on her wrist and she's like posing it like she's you know being perfect about it like just as you would want someone to be and it it was amazing and so then we got hit and i went down to her event um for uh the sexual assault foundation and we went down and i met her and cad and everyone else and julian huff and all these people and then that's how it kind of started um she gave one to julian huff julian huff wore it somewhere and then whitney cummings wore it with julian huff because you know they're horse people and everyone's connected beth and her um and then so she would send me beth would send me photos of like her and whitney cummings be like in my bracelet and i'd be like what the fuck is happening like, this is like i just did this to help myself and like hopefully help other people and it's okay and so i get a call from my mom and she's like i'm driving for kevin hart and i was like what <laughs> You team drive with dad. What are you doing? She's like, no, I'm like team driving for, I'm I'm going to do Kevin Hart's What Now tour. And I'm driving some of his equipment around. I'm going to try to get him to meet with you. And I was like, okay, mom, I don't think you understand how this works. Fuck, I totally underestimated Kath. I totally underestimated her. By the time she got to Vancouver, she had harassed the people so much. Well, by harass, I mean, she got to know the team so well. They fell in love with her. She would see Kevin. And she'd be like, you need to meet my daughter. You need to meet her. And finally, I think he just like stopped and caved and was like, okay, I'll meet your daughter in Vancouver. Like, I'll just shut up. If this shuts you up, I will meet your daughter. So my mom's like, bring gifts. Like, make Kevin something. This is still called her wearables at this time, by the way. So I had been watching uh, Real Husbands of Hollywood, which was Kevin Hart's. Did you ever see that show? No. I've oh. never heard of it. No. Oh. Oh, you need to watch Real Husbands of Hollywood. Is it like a fake? It's yeah, it's it's like him and a bunch of his boys acting as like the real husband, like Real Housewives. It's hol- is it a TV show or a movie? yes, it's a TV show. Wait, is it like a parody? Because there's the Real Housewives of wherever. Yeah, yeah. but there's that's it's like them. a parody version, but of right. like the men. Got it. Oh my god! And so he's called people Mitches in it, like male bitches, right? So, gotcha. so I'm like thinking I'm funny, and I'm like I'm gonna write a joke in the card, <laughs> right? on the off chance I get to meet him. So we go to the show and then I get the like, the wave back from his security guy. So we go to the back and it's just my mom, myself, Brady and Kevin. And he walks over. I didn't realize Kevin and I are the same height. It's For real? When I wear like a little heel, Kevin okay. and I are the same height, which was to me was great. It was the best. Um, so I'm like here, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm looking to achieve. He opens it up and I said, I wrote a joke in there. I'm really regretting that I wrote a joke in there right now. Please don't laugh if it's not funny. He's like, do you want me to really laugh? It's funny. I was like, I mean, I would like that. So he laughs and he kind of goes, huh, yeah, that's not bad. (laughs) It just kind of gives me like a, it wasn't terrible. What was the joke? It was about him being a a Mitch. It was something along the lines of that. And so Mm -hmm. anyway, we, he opens it up and he looks at it and he goes, is this a bullet casing? I said, yeah. And he goes, huh, that's cool. And then he looks at the tag and he goes, you want men to wear this? And I said, yeah. And he goes, why is it called her wearables? Motherfucker. Damn it. And then it just, we chatted for a little bit. We took some photos and then he yells to his boys like, yo, we're going to tweet this out tonight. So he tweets it out at the time. He had like 26 million people on like Twitter. He tweets it out. I'm driving over the Alex Fraser bridge just going, oh my God. Okay. So we go and uh, at this point, Brady goes, you know, hey, if you're going to take this seriously, like we need to incorporate, maybe let's think about changing the name. Let's try and rebrand this. So at that point, 
we re- we changed the name to Brass and Unity and incorporated in 2016. And then after that, it was like we we were just getting it on all the right people at all the right time. Like Brady's friends with the nanny of, you know, at the time it was Jenna uh, Dewan and Tatum. And so like Jenna wore a bunch of my stuff to like a game. It got seen in like a bunch of things. It was on Ellen. It was on Forbes. It was on this person and this person. It was like this weird thing that was happening. And then I was just getting known in the fashion industry. So at that point, we had taken it from the kitchen table in a couple of years to over 200 retailers in North America that I'd I'd gotten every single one of my own. Like went to the trade shows, cold called, had like cell phone numbers, texting family members, like that's how I got my orders. And I signed all of these accounts and we started donating all the money. So we donated half a million dollars. And anytime the money came from the country is where the money would go. So if it, went, if it was sold in Canada, it would stay in Canada. If it was sold in the US, it would go to the US organizations. And then I started taking the business like really seriously and started really, really trying to develop like, what do I want to do? And all while doing this, I was holding it kind of together, kind of, surface level together. But at that point we had now had my son and postpartum was a hmm that's an animal that hormone well that's that's a I don't wish that on my worst enemy there is something about postpartum that's so nasty like the idea of like my cousin my cousin said this like one time it was like I want to drop my kid off the fire station like I can't do it anymore like the the what it does chemically to your brain is so damaging and like heartbreaking because it it's something that you just can't climb out of. I know people, it's it's never left them after their kids. They've struggled with it and had issues with it. So for me, when I co- started to compound some stuff, that, when that happened, and then the no sleep again, and then the stress of a kid, and then just the new life, it all started to get to be a bit too much again. So I started to lean in to the business as much as I could. It was like my solace. It was like my peace. It was the thing that was working for me all while doing treatment still and weaning off of medications. And this is when cannabis started um, right before it was legalized in Canada. At that point, I started using cannabis for sleep medication instead of actual medication. So now I had been weaning off all of these drugs and I was only on like two at that point. But what we didn't understand was the damage was done meaning being on an SSRI for 10 years has major repercussions and serious, like it can do damage to the body, long-term damage. And so at this point we did switched over to cannabis and I started to have those conversations with my in-laws and everyone like, hey, I'm a weed smoker now. Like that's a whole different type of thing when you walk into a world where cannabis for a lot of people is like the dirty drug, like the party drug, like the thing that you don't do, like losers do it and you lie on your couch and like you lose your life and like, but meanwhile, I was starting to function more because of it. Um, and so all of this is kind of happening. And then in 20, oh, was it 2019? It was right before COVID. It got real bad again. Like I was almost reverting. I was like going backwards. I wasn't having the intrusive thoughts like I was having you know, the first five years after the war where it was like I would hear something and it would just bring me all the way back, like sound, smell, temperature, everything. It was now it was like why I'm not getting any better. I'm actually getting worse. Why? And I can't stop it and I can't help it, but I'm just going backwards. And it started to get to the point where mommy was having more hard days crying on the stairs than good days. And I would try to hide this from Jack and I would try and good face just the best face I could but my irritability and then how you show up in front of your children when they're young is how they're going to show up to you and I couldn't wrap my brain around that meaning if I was irritable or I was miserable or I was exhausted even if I wasn't showing it to him he could feel that and so he would come at me like that and I'd be like why is he always so mad at me why is he so angry and he'd be like it's how you show up your energy it will be reflected back off of a child that's just how it works so I started to really know there was something wrong again. And then that's when things got really dark again. And I was starting to spiral a bit. Um, And then COVID hit. And I lost my business overnight. So we lost all 200 retailers in like a two week span. And now I went from finding a purpose in the thing that was pulling me out of the darkness to fight to losing the thing that pulled me out of the darkness. Now having to figure out myself and this and like, 
everything, putting everything into this. Like financially, emotionally, everything I had, I put into this. And not only me, but other people that were working with me and the volunteers, because I would bring in, I had some volunteers that would come in who were ex-paramedics or ex-firefighters or people that were struggling with trauma and they would just come and hang out the office because we had a couple dogs there, right? So they'd hang out, they'd package some stuff or they would just sit and talk or they would, um, we had uh, like a Nintendo Game Boy. They would just like sit there, like just hang out on the couch, be outside of their home. So it's like, now this wasn't just me I'm worried about. Now I'm worried about everybody. And at that point, um, I had gone on the uh, bike ride, uh, the 75th anniversary of D-Day, which was in France. And I was lucky enough, and my husband was lucky enough, we went over and we did a 600 kilometer bike ride for charity. And we rode uh, like the whole week before, and then we landed on Juneau Beach um, on the anniversary with a World War II veteran who was an artillery gunner from New Brunswick. And Russ Kay was walking and talking, and him and I were the only gunners on there, and he looked at me one day and he goes, you gonna be my 2IC this trip? I was like, yes sir, oh my God, yes! Like, just ball my eyes out, right? He landed on Juno Beach. He was on the first ones there. And to get to witness someone going back there for the first time, and didn't cry a tear. And I was hysterical. I just weeped, and he hugged me, and he goes, it's okay, honey, all my friends are here. And oh my God, just, that the strength in that person just unbelievable and to witness it was just extraordinary and it was such a privilege so you know we were on this bike ride and there were some people there that were some known names I didn't I didn't know anybody from a hole in the wall and I always have my bracelets and we have this active uh one that we have it's called the buddy check active and it's just like a looks like a beaded but it's rubber you can work out in it anyway I'd given these all to all the riders. So like uh, Trevor Linden was on the ride and like uh, the CEO of David Foster Foundation, like a bunch of different people came on this. It was like 150 of us, right? And so I gave all these bracelets out and on the bus ride back going to the airport, one of the guys was like, hey, like I know some people. Do you mind if I tell them about what you're doing? I was like, sure. So I come back and I get on a phone call and I'm on the phone with like one of the top publishers in North America. I'm on the phone with like a, the top PR person who works with like Rick Springfield and like Candace Bushnell. I'm like, I don't belong on this phone call. This is ridiculous. And like, this is Kelsey. We want her story to be told. And they're like telling all this. And I remember one of the publishers, she said on the phone, I'll never forget it. She goes, she's Canadian. Why would we care? <laughs> and then I saw red and reactions happened. <laughs> and the only person who stayed on the call is Kim and she's still my PR. <laughs> She still works with me. Um, but to say that is that I've been put in all these situations every single time I've tried to better myself or help someone else. So I knew as long as I kept on this path, I would be okay. So Kim says to me one day, hey, I, I have an opportunity. Um, I wanna talk, get you talked about on GMA and I wanna get someone to interview you. And so we did this big interview and she, she gets me a segment on Good Morning America about my jewelry brand. And all within doing that, she goes, hey, uh, Carson Daly wants to talk to you. He's got this new segment called Mind Matters. And at this point I'd seen it because he just interviewed Logic. And I was like, I love Logic. And I'm like, that guy wants to talk to me? He's like, yeah. I was like, okay. She goes, but like, just let you know, it's like between three people and like, I don't think you're gonna get it. <laughs> so just don't, don't get excited about it. She's super straightforward about it. And so I got it though. So people came in and she's like, hey, like this is a big opportunity. So if you're gonna start your podcast, start it now. Like start it now, this is the time to talk about it. So at this point I said to Brady, like, you know, I'm, I, we talked about me doing a podcast the year before, you know, this is the time, let's just do it. So we did it, we turned a design space and uh, I had a shipping container inside my office that was also a meditation deck on top and we turned it into a studio. <clears throat> and I had no idea what I was doing, but I just started. And I think that's the most important part is like, you have to start. You cannot know what you're doing, but you have to start or you're gonna sit and plan yourself into your like own grave. So I just started and then I did the interview with Carson and it went really well and we talked about it a little bit on there and kind of talked about how art therapy was helping me. The next day I did an interview on my show um, with uh, Matthew Griffin from Combat Flip Flops. He's a ex-ranger and um, he, sorry, former ranger, sorry, 
former ranger. And um, my husband was like, hey, why don't you reach out to them for a sponsorship? Because they put like bullet casings and flip flops, right? They were on Shark Tank. We saw that's where we first saw them. He's like, why don't you call them? So I emailed them and I was like, hey, would you guys want to ever work with us? And he's like, yeah, we go together like peanut butter jelly. It makes sense. Casings, casings, helping, helping. Yeah, let's do it. And then I was like, do you want to do the podcast? And at this point, I had never talked to a special operator. So I was super nervous. And he was like, yeah, for sure. So I was like, okay, all right. So we do the podcast. And at the end of it, he leans in because it was virtual. He leans in and he goes, because if, if you know Griff, he does this thing where he looks you in the dead of your soul and he goes, doing okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm great. Like, totally fine. And, he, and then he leans in even further and he goes, are you really doing okay? And I fucking broke in half. It's like he could see through me. He was just waiting to see when it was going to crack. And I cracked. I cracked in half and I started just losing my mind and struggling with this again. I don't know why it's not getting better. I'm doing all the right things. I'm eating all the right things. I'm working out. I'm blah, 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 blah. I'm like just giving this laundry list and he's just sitting there going, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. So do you want a solution? And I was just like, what do you mean? Like I'm doing everything I'm told. So this is the solution. And he's like, no, it's not. There's other ways. Have you ever heard of ayahuasca? And I was like, I like in passing, like it's some crazy thing you do, like some crazy drug. And he's like, okay, kind of. Look, there's a spot, like a slot open in 30 days. If you want to come, um, you're welcome to join. It's with Heroic Hearts Project and you can come and sit in ceremonies with us. The kicker is you can't be on any drugs or any medications because um, of serotonin reuptake. Like it can be a real, real problem. And I said, okay. So I said, yes. I called Brady. I said, hey, um, there's a thing I want to go do. I, you know, I want, it's called ayahuasca. And he was like, fuck it. Okay. All right. And I just kind of said, like, I'm not feeling well. I'm not getting better. I don't know what to do. I'm kind of at my wits end of here again. And it's getting worse. So like, what do I have to lose? So I called Dr. Passy. I say, hi, I'm going off of this medication that I've been on for 10 years. And he goes, well, I don't think that's how it's going to go. And I said, yeah, no, I'm, here's the thing. I'm like, not really asking though. I'm telling you I'm about to do it and I just need you to be aware because I'm going to do this thing and I know that I can't be on. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go sit with ayahuasca. And he goes, yeah, you can't be on anything. I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. And he goes, okay, I know you're not going to listen and you're going to do it anyway. And so we just kind of gave him a warning or a heads up if Brady calls or something goes wrong and, you know, things are out of whack this is what's going on. And he goes like, you know, just try to wean as much as you can. But that's like going off of an SSRI you've been on at 150 milligrams every day for the past 10 years is going to have serious repercussions. And it sure as hell did. It had major physical, psychological, tangible, painful repercussions. And I never recommend to do it that way. It's the most dangerous way to do it. You never go cold turkey off something. But I was desperate and I didn't know what else to do. And I felt like I did not have another option and I was backed into a corner. So I did that. And then <laughs> the night before I was supposed to leave, my passport expired because it was COVID. And I had had my passport in the safe. And because in Canada, you couldn't leave the country. Canada was locked. Like if you couldn't, they were saying like, if you, um, if you have to leave the country, like it has to be for like a work reason or you had to have like a, like a reason to go to the States or like a reason to leave. It was when it was like real dicey and they're not sure what's going on. So when it had expired, so what I had done is I had my Nexus card, which is like another, it's like a passport, right? And you can use it to drive across the border and travel and stuff like that but it didn't have my married name on it. It just had my maiden name. So I just like called the airline and I was like, hi, I accidentally put the wrong last name. And they're like, okay, no problem. We'll issue a new ticket. And then I just, I traveled on my Nexus card, which the reason it's kind of dicey is because once you have a passport and one name, they have to match, but I just hadn't had the systems talk yet. So they didn't know. So I, I left on that and I went down and I sat in ceremony and that's when the, the change happened. That's when the start of the real deep, true stuff that was buried, that was stuck, that I couldn't move, that I couldn't get past, that I couldn't heal from, that the medication was just masking. That's when the shit really started to heal. That's when everything started to change. And that's like a mayhem, like a journey, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. It depends. I mean, I've, since I've talked with you guys, I've, I've sat six more times. So it's, I've, 
I really started to integrate, um, again, psychedelics aren't for everyone. Psychedelics are not safe with medi certain medication and psychedelics should not be done in a non-safe and set, set and setting and psychedelics should have a major integration component on the front end and the back end. So I'm really careful to say that because it is not like a go do, sit by yourself, good luck situation. It requires weeks of integration and a proper dieta, meaning what you eat, whether it's what you eat, what you consume on TV, what you consume from um, liquid, so alcohol and all those things. You can't have pork, you're not supposed to have certain things, like you have to follow it, and if you don't, you find out why you're supposed to follow it. And then it's going into the ceremonies in a safe set and setting with facilitators that are trained who know what they're doing and know how to handle situations if they go one way or the other and then coming out of that with integration on the back end whether that's with your group or with a coach or with someone else you have to integrate that and the amount of people that I know that are big names who are going into situations and not integrating their shit and coming back and wondering why they're still struggling that's why they're struggling they're not integrating what they have learned and they are not listening that is the most important the ceremonies are one thing right? The integration is everything. If you don't do that work before and on the end, it's dangerous. Psychologically, like physically, you need to follow the rules. There's a reason why you do it a certain way. And I learned that, definitely learned that. Um, but ever since last time you and I sat, psychedelics have when I say I've leaned in. Wait, I, when we sat, we were just talking, we weren't doing psychedelics. No, we weren't. <coughs> no, Jocko was not <laughs> doing psychedelics. I didn't slip anything in. Yeah, last time you and I were doing psychedelics in the room together? No, that I can't see that ever happening. I can't see you sitting with the medicine. Yeah, no, I've, I've never um, done any drugs before. And so, other than alcohol and caffeine, um, and I don't use alcohol anymore. And I'm actually very, I've become more and more anti-alcohol as time goes on. Good. Um, I think it's really terrible. And uh, yeah, I've just never, I don't really have any desire to do any drugs. It seems like it's um, like not for me. You know what's funny is. Uh, <laughs> to you, put it simply. I, have, yes, you, have you sat with any psychedelics before, Echo? No, ma'am. It, it, you're both very like A-type not necessarily need control, but control is a big aspect of your life. And Andy asked me this too. He's like, yeah, I've never done psychedelics. I said, like, probably tell you why. It's the control thing. <clears throat> Certain, when you sit with a really strong medicine, whether it's 5-MeO, a strong psilocybin ceremony, ayahuasca, you, um, ibogaine, whatever, you don't get to control any part of any of that. What your body does, <laughs> what your mouth does, whether you vomit, whether you shit yourself, like you don't get to control a lot of what the medicine does. And when I say you you lose control, it's not like anything you've ever experienced where you're like, I can fight my way out of this. It's like, nope, you're, you're done, that's it. And the more you fight it, the more it takes hold, right? And so a lot of people I notice who have never experienced it are people that maybe lean more on the, not needing, but definitely more control like of just environments and situations, how your body feels and like always wanting to be a certain way. Like I had a Marine with us in Peru and control was a thing for him big time. And I remember when there was an incident on the one night, we had a gentleman who was with us. He's a, he's a good friend now. And I'd been in plenty of ceremonies at this point where everything had gone pretty smooth. Everyone stayed on their mat, unless it was to go to the bathroom, few people vomited on themselves. You know, it's just standard behavior. <laughs> Sounds like a good time, doesn't it? Um, but at this time, on the second night in Peru, I had an individual who was one mat in between, uh, there was one person in between us. And we were sitting there and I was the first to drink that night. And you don't choose who drinks, right? It's the maestros in the middle, the healers, the Shipibo tribe people who I sit with from Peru. And they decide who comes up first. And they have a way of doing it. You just let them do their thing. I got called up first that night. And so I went up and I took my, I got, got the medicine from her, did my prayer over it, drank it. Ugh. I just, <laughs> I just think about drinking it and like get a whole body gag. Um, and I went and sat back down on my mat. And it takes, you know, half an hour, 45 for some people. But by the time they got around to everyone finishing drinking, the last person was starting to drink and I was already shooting off to space. So at that point, that means that, well, 
Now the maestros have to drink. So that's going to be another like good half an hour, 45 minutes before they start even singing the Icaros and the prayers before ceremony even really like opens. So I sat there and I was like, oh no, here it comes. Because the visuals start Mm -hmm. and the visuals are so bright and so vivid and so intense. And then they got more intense. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they were like, oh, now they're out out of control. And now things are starting to move. And because of the TBI, vertigo and pots and things like that for me was like motion, it's not good. So I start vomiting violently, right? No one else has barely even drank. (laughs) Nothing's even started. And I'm on my hands and knees and just like just the most intense to the point where I'm driving now and I can't breathe because I can't get air in between. So I'm just like, you know, that like constant. So I'm doing this and and I just remember just Cause then it's control, and I go, I let go, I let go, I let go, and I just keep trying to say, like, I let go, I'm letting go, I trust you, and I, my whole body just drops down, (laughs) and I have got nothing, and I'm gone, and I mean, gone, gone, like not in this galaxy, gone, and things are swirling, and it's black, and it's moving, and I just hear this, wah, 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 out of the corner. And I kind of come to, and I've got the bucket in my hand, and I just kind of, it's pitch black, but it's an open air maloka. So there's screens. So like, there's a door and there's screens so you can hear the jungle. And the jungle has a tendency to respond when the medicine starts to respond. And I start to hear the maestro start to sing. Now, (laughs) I'm already in space. When they start to sing, what they do with those Icaros is they move the medicine. So now, like, it moves it within you. And so they start singing the Icaros, and it, you can feel the vibration. So they're, like, singing this really beautiful thing. And I was like, no, 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 It's too far, too far, too far. Like, I had, I had gone too far. In my mind, I thought I had gone too far, right? And I hear this slamming. And then I just hear this noise, and it sounds like a horror movie when, like, it's like a weird, like, demon where it's like that, like, that, like, like, it's like an angry cat, that deep level kind of growl. And I hear it coming out of this side. And I just go, nope, nope, we're not turning our head. We're not looking at it. We're not looking at it. Because I'm going, is anyone else hearing this? And the Icarus are getting more intense. And it got to a point where space started to vibrate, right? Like, almost like when something's winding up, where it's like, and you're waiting for that kind of boom. And so it started to kind of do this wind, and I hear this, like, and it's getting louder. And then I just slamming and slamming and slamming. And they give you a red flashlight. <laughs> the red flashlight, it's, it's like OPSEC, right? It's got the red cover on it. And so <laughs> they go, if you have to go to the bathroom, you point it at the ground, find your way to the bathroom. If you need help, point it at your chest and turn it on. So I hear this, I hear this smashing and time is just like starting to speed up and I just put it in my chest and I'm just vomiting. And so the facilitator comes over and he drinks too, but this is someone that's incredibly experienced in the medicine who can be in the medicine, but also be very present. So he like pulls me over to the bathroom, right? And I'm going pee and I cannot stop peeing. And so what I've learned now is that there's tons of different forms of purging. There's energy purging, right? So big yawns where your jaw hurts. You've yawned so much that you're having these big, huge, like, oh, like, and it's an energy movement, right? Some people just do that. Some people don't purge at all. Some people vomit. Some people shit themselves. Some people pee. And so I had been vomiting and I was like, I have to pee and I literally can't move. And as I'm in the bathroom, it's all white, just like white. There's no lights on, but it's just like that white tile. So it's quite bright. You can see the light coming in from the moon. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking down at my hands and my hands are just changing and moving and molding into these colors. And I'm like, "Mm, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. Just having this inner dialogue. Just going pee. And then I just hear bang, bang, bang. And just like people are moving in the maloka. Normally things stay pretty still. And I see one of the other guys come into the bathroom. And then another guy come into the bathroom. And then another guy and another guy. And now we're all in the bathroom, except for the facilitator and for the maestros and one other guy. And this guy is beating the fuck out of himself. 
He's so deep in the medicine and that thing that is in him took hold of him and he just starts slamming his arms and he's bow, bow, and he's punching himself and the next morning when he wakes up like his hand is swollen, his eyes are black and blue, his legs are bruised. But what had happened was he was so in the medicine and everyone around him was kind of like freaking out. The control aspect I'm getting to is one of the Marines that was in the group with me <laughs> pops his head in the curtain and he just goes, you guys good? You guys good? You guys good? You guys solid? You good? You need help? You good? We're like, no, no man, we're, we're all freaking out right now. <laughs> He's like, I got it. I got it. The facilitator runs in and goes, hey, Ryan? Hey, Ryan, you good right now? And he goes, yeah, I'm fine. Fine. And he goes, you want to come with me? And so they had to go hold him down. So Ryan snaps out of the medicine, right? Like he's still in it, but enough to be present and sits down on the guy's leg and the other guy sits down and they just hold him there while they pray over him until he just, his body gives out. So I spent probably half of that ceremony in the bathroom because what I was hearing was the thing that was coming out of him came out of him and was ripping the maloka in half and running up the ceiling. So like you could, you could hear the crawling going up the ceiling and all around and, and all the time he's like make, it's him that was actually making that noise, the guy. This thing was coming out of him and kind of going through him and making this noise and he's smashing it and so it sounds like the whole place is just falling apart. And because I was struggling so deeply with anger and rage to the point where it manifested itself and the thing that came out of him was a form of my anger. And it was trying to get into the bathroom. So I was seeing it rip through the ceiling and come try to get in, but I can't stop peeing. So I can't get off the toilet to save myself. So one of the other guys who had sat in ceremony with me last time, I said, Sam, Sam, I need you to sit here, Sam. Sam, I need you to hold my hand, Sam. He's like, Kelsey, you're peeing. I said, Sam, hold my hand. I just need you to stay with me and hold my hand. And once they kind of got him calmed down, I was able to, all of us slowly, they're like, it's safe, you're good to come back out. You're safe, it's good. So we all slowly started going back out into the pitch black. But the thing was, every time the maestros would sing, because they pray over each and every one of you, there's a male and a female, and they work their way around the room. And each one of you gets a different prayer. So like the male is known as like the surgeon. He comes in, he gets in there, does all the nasty removal, all the gross stuff. And then she comes around and bandages you up, if you will, and then prays over you and does this, does this work to you. And it's really intense when they're singing and praying to you. You can feel it's, it's, it's a lot. So <clears throat> they're like, you need to receive the prayer at the end of like, you need to, so you need to come out. But every time they sang, that thing in him would get angry and so she would start to sing and it, he would start to rear up and then I would start to freak the fuck out. And he's like, the facilitator would be like, just sit with me and just stay here. We're just gonna stay here. We're just gonna be in it. And so I was working through all of this, but the next morning I had a conversation and none of us at that night wanted to sleep by ourselves. We were all so terrified. We were ceremony closed and he was still in the medicine. He was in it the rest of the night. So like he did not leave the medicine till the morning. And he was, he beat himself silly. and. There was a lot of lessons in that. And one of those for me was I was able to see the anger and what it was doing to everyone around me. And I was able to see what it was doing to myself. I saw a visualization of it. I heard it. I could see the thing that everyone said was attached to me that I didn't, I couldn't make go away on my own. And so as, as you know, hard as it is to sometimes to let go of control, and let go of needing to be the person that handles everything, it was necessary. I needed to let go. I needed to go let someone else help me because I could no longer help myself. And so psychedelics now for me have become such a massive part of my life. I'm doing a clinical trial with a company in Canada for psilocybin soon, I'm patient zero for. Um, I use psilocybin now as a form of antidepressant for me. It almost replaced an SSRI, but not something I need to take. Only when I catch myself going into a bit of a dip, I'm able to then microdose, and it keeps me at a place where I never dip to where I can't pull myself back out again. And then I use ayahuasca when I'm working through something and only when the medicine calls, not when I choose to go. So. I've never like booked a trip or tried to, it's always presented itself to me as an opportunity or a chance to go somewhere. And that's how the medicine should be. 
And so it's been a it's been a weird transition of learning how to let go and learning how to be patient and move through emotions rather than hold emotions. Yeah, no, that that definitely makes sense. I know that for me, um, like for me, I don't know, I've always had a good grasp on that there's a lot of things that I have no control over and I'm okay with that. And even from a leadership perspective, you know, I would, <laughs> anybody that's ever worked for me knows that I'm the literal furthest thing from a control freak. I'm like the most decentralized, um, like. Is that the truth? Confirmed. Okay. Yeah, like. I, I have, you know, fourth law of combat leadership is decentralized command, and I'm absolutely that way. I'm in fact, I'm a little bit too much that way. You know, I'll, I'll let go people, let things go even more. So I've always been very comfortable with the fact that there are a lot of things you can't control. There's some things that you can't control, and I'm perfectly fine. I can kind of shrug off things that I can't control and move forward. You know, so I, I, I guess maybe, I guess maybe I do. I present controlling yes but uh <laughs> yeah i mean i mean like here's here's like just an example like my kids growing up they didn't even have curfews like you know like didn't care hey, you come home when, when you're ready like that's an example that people are always like are you serious i'm like yeah i'm like come home when you're when you're done i think kelsey you might have a little bit of a point though because you don't like to control external stuff but you seem to like to control internal stuff Yep, like kind of more hardcore than the normal person. I'd say that's probably accurate. Yeah, like if I, like I said, I know that there's things I can control. Mm -hmm. I know there's things that I can't control. The mm -hmm. only thing I can control really is like myself yeah. and how I'm going to behave and make yeah. sure that I'm doing the right thing from, you know, my perspective. So a lot of people, and I'm assuming maybe this applies to you, at, at the very least a little mm -hmm. bit, maybe a lot, where <laughs> drugs make you kind of lose control no matter what drug it is yeah, really yeah, yeah. even alcohol you yeah. lose control of your mind in certain ways that's yeah. for sure now what you're talking about is you know that's next another level, level that's of next level. loss of control listen there's levels to this shit yes ma'am yeah. there just is and but yeah. that's okay i mean that comes in time and it you, you are like you do uh the perception you do put out even though it is you're controlling yourself so whether it's like your 4 30 in the morning wake up or it's you know just getting in the workout it's like you do control your life to a t and so i think because when you're talking about maybe you on social or what you're doing on social the perception is that you're like that with all things but that's mm -hmm. only because yeah. Yeah. people don't see the things that you're not controlling on right and maybe if they didn't serve with you they they just assume this guy's that's how it works. But yeah. yeah, anything, you know, alcohol, anything that you take, whether it's a psychedelic, uh, alcohol, anything that's going to change your perception is going to give you a lack of control internally, whether we like it or not. And that is a hard thing for some people to grasp. And even when you're in the medicine, it's almost impossible to let go because what are you letting go to and what are you allowing in? At what point are you letting go too far? Are you gone all the way? Do you ever come back? Like that's the... Yeah, my, thing, my thought is no. <laughs> I th you know what? <laughs> my thought is I'm not coming back. Well, <laughs> that's what I was afraid of in Peru. Yeah. There was a moment where I was like during that where I was like if I, if I fully let go here, I'm concerned I won't snap back. But that's fear speaking, right? That's the voice in my head. That's the thing that I talk about. That's the thing that says, no, we're not doing this, or no, you're too tired, or no, you can't do this, or no, you're not big enough, or why would they talk to you? It's like, that's the voice you just have to just sh sh shut the fuck up and push down because it doesn't get to be in control anymore. And that's the difference is the medicine has taught me that I don't always get to have control and sometimes it's okay to let go of it um, as long as I'm aware that I don't abuse it. I don't play with this medicine. It's not like a for fun. Like this stuff is not fun. And anybody, so far, it does not sound fun. It's not. <laughs> and anybody who's like, I have oh. no temptations to do this stuff right now. <laughs> Zero. I mean, listen. There's some where you're less like purging and less violent. Like I mean, five meo. It's a quick fifteen minute. You know, it's a DMT. It's a different thing. I think even fifteen minutes of this does not sound <laughs> fun. <laughs> I would like to see you try it because I know how much you would fight it tooth and nail. But that's the thing is you can't fight it. Like it doesn't. You'll 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 go. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, I I'm sorry to disappoint you. You'll I never. probably won't be doing any of these things. Yeah. So, and I think this kind of applies to a lot of psychoactive substances mm -hmm. where if you start with the reason anyone would choose to do that yeah. isn't it because they don't like the results of their controlling of yeah. their mind or lack thereof so i would think you're in a whole separate boat where you're like yeah i like to have full control over my mind therefore my behavior that you know that stuff and i like the way it's going 
So why would I give it up to what's right. whatever yeah. the goddess's I, name is? Goddess's yeah. name. It's like, well, I you're talk, all I, she and all this stuff. I was talking to some of my friends that have done the journey, yeah, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, you should do it. And I was like, no, I'm probably not going to yeah. do it. And they're like, oh, you know, you, you, you should. And I was like, well, I feel like I'm driving down the highway at like 85 miles an hour. And I feel like pulling over to the side and just taking apart my engine and then putting it back <laughs> together doesn't seem like a smart move. It's not ideal. It's like yeah. running pretty good. And yeah. they're like, "Well, you could be going 95." And and I was like, "No, I think I'm. I think I'm actually going pretty good. I think I'm kind of like, you know, like I'm looking at my RPMs and they're smooth and the yeah, cool, like the temperature's good." And they're like, well, we should ask your wife what she thinks. I was like, go ask my yeah. wife what she thinks. She'd be like, dude, this guy's fine. Like, let's not, let's not, let's not mess up this engine right now. I actually agree with you, especially for your situation where, because I'm actually more kind of on your okay. side with it, just, just from this alone. Okay. Where, at the very least, it's gonna offer. We're taking you, sides now. Oh. Yes. Okay. Well, table has been divided. Well, let's, no fa- let's, be like face that, it, let's face it, but you're, you know, but okay. <laughs> if we were forced to take sides, I'm yeah. going to be leaning a little bit towards, because I think that new perspective that from what I understand, because my brother and I know a lot of people who've taken yeah. one trip or another on different journey, it's journey. Called, yes. Speaking. Yes. Correct. Yes. How dare we? Um, so I know people who have done it and they all kind of report back the similar thing where it's like, man, it offered this perspective that was very like eye-opening you know yeah. and it improved their perspective you know on things um you know varying levels of lasting results but at the very least the experience improved their their outlook on things i think it's it's ha- what you're intending to go and do and how much work are you willing to do afterwards to keep the lasting effects yeah, I dig Th- it. that's the 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 trip the the trip the journey is is just the catalyst it's just the pin drop right mm. The, the rest of it comes afterwards. The real work is after. Because now you've explored, you've, the mirror has been put in front of you, whether you like it or not. The stuff you're seeing is not something you want to see, but you're seeing now because this is what you've, you've chose to do. Now I'm going to show you what you need to see to work on it. So like, for example, excuse me, the first, the first experience I talked about where I, I did it with Griff and those guys, um, that was very much, if you were to take a line and you were to put the future in the past, the first trip was the very bottom of the past. The stuff that was stuck, the trauma, the Afghan stuff, the stuff I couldn't undo, the stuff I couldn't work through. So those first three trips were that. The second time I went, well, because it's, listen, let me, stop it, stop it. You stop it, listen. There, you do them in over three days. So you do one each night. So that's one ceremony. Oh, so you've done it two sessions of three each? I've done three sessions of three each. So nine. So nine. Yes. So the first one was very much the Afghan stuff. That's the one that I spoke about on the last show where I talked about like Chris and going through the other side and all of those really just getting the closure moments of survivor's guilt, really, really working through that there. Um, And then actually came out of that one with no more chronic pain in my shoulder that's permanently separated with no collarbone. So that's a weird thing all on its own. So I... The body hold, you know, the body keeps the score. That's a real thing. The trauma is held in the body. So when you can work that out too. And then the second time I went, so that would have been ceremony four, five, six. Those ones were getting closer to more of my future issues. Like the stuff that was newer issues, not so much the Afghan, but more of the deeper, the deeper rooted things that I was trying to work through, right? Stuff that I was really, really struggling with. And then the last group of ceremonies I went through I'm not going to sugarcoat it. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons I went was because of this. Because I was not coping. Period. And so I made a call to Jesse at Heroic Hearts Project. And I was like, hey, bro. He goes, how you doing? Not great. (laughs) What do you need? You know what I need. (laughs) Okay. When you need to go? As soon as you got me. He goes, okay. Let me, let me see. Sure enough, one thing moved all on its own naturally, the other thing. And then next thing you know, it was like, you can go then. So I went and I went into that with a very serious intention. And that was to learn how to become a better, more present wife. Because at this point, Brady was super sick and I was trying to be the rock. So I had no emotions. I wasn't empathetic. I wasn't compassionate. And it wasn't because I wasn't feeling those things. It was because the spouse needed me to be the tough one because he had been the tough one for so many years, right? He had been the one that pulled me out of bed, got me moving, got me up, made sure I didn't end up killing myself. And he was the one who was the rock. So it was like, I needed to be the rock, but I didn't know how to do that empathetically. I knew how to do it operationally. 
I knew this is what you need. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to fix it. Not, hey, I'm going to sit with you when you're not feeling well and just be with you. I was like, no, I got, we got shit we need to fix. Like, and so I went into this going, I need to be more empathetic wife and I need to let go of this anger because you lived rent free in my head for two years, ruthlessly. And I was like, I can't carry this shit anymore. I can't do this anymore. It's not fair to anyone. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to my family. It's not fair, period. And so I went in and I told the, I told the maestros, I said, I'm angry. And I'm angry at a level I cannot fucking control. And I can't make it stop as I say it with a smile. Like I was like, I'm so angry. It's bubbling. And I said, I'm having a lot of pain in my head. And so when I went into those ceremonies, they were very, they don't, when you have this meeting with, sorry, when you have this meeting with the maestros, you don't, um, they don't talk back to you. They just listen to you. And then they whisper in Spanish and then, <laughs> then you leave. And then you go and you do the, the vomitivo, which you're going to love. You're going to guess vomitivo is, yes, you're vomiting, but it's forced vomiting. You drink this uh, lemongrass tea. It's cold. And there's a big jug and you all sit outside of like one of the little huts and you each get a cup. It's about yay big. And you fill it up and you have to drink it continuously until you start vomiting. And the whole point is- What are you is, doing Thursday night? <laughs> 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 Megan Vomitivo, mm. clearly. Ugh. So you do that though because you're going into ceremony the next day, and if somebody didn't follow the dieta or they didn't fully cleanse themselves properly, this takes everything out. And they kind of say it like, this is like the farmer prepping the garden or the prepping the fields, <laughs> right? Before, the, before the, 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 they come in with the medicine and they plant the seeds. And so you do this, and it's, that's a fun experience for everyone involved. And, um, and then you go into the ceremony after that. But one of the nights, though, I had said that, I had said that to the, the maestro, you know, about my head and he came over when he was working on me and they tell you like, these people are pretty physical. So like heads up, if they tell you to do something, don't freak out, don't be weirded out. Like this is, they've been doing this for thousands of years and this is lineage, like just do what they say. They don't speak English either. So the one night he comes over to me and he's done praying over me and I'm in the medicine, but I'm not vomiting on myself for a minute. and he just gets up and grabs my head on the sides and just starts pushing from the front and the back and just pushing and just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And then he stands up and he just grabs, they have this, it's like a perfume, but it's like their each person, each maestro has their own and it's like prayed over and they use it and sometimes they'll spit it on you and sometimes they'll pour it on you and it's kind of like a, like a holy water, but there's a joke there. So, um, he goes and stands on top of me and he just and he blows into me and I felt from the tip of my head all the way down if you were to take a couple inches off my body almost like my aura I just felt everything just drop out and my whole body just kind of dropped and I was exhausted and I asked them the next day when we were we were doing the flower bath and he said um he he just looked at uh the the translator and goes ask her how is her head feeling today and it was the first day I didn't have a headache so I was like, shit, okay, all right, we're gonna do whatever. The last night, she comes over and she's praying over me. And I'd been expressing, and because we do group and all of these things, and so I'm talking about what I'm struggling with and I'm frustrated with and all of this. And the next night she goes in and at the end of ceremony, she comes over to me and I'm one of the last ones she prays on. And she goes, she grabs my shirt and she starts pulling, pulling it up. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? So I just lift up my shirt, it's pitch black. And I'm, I don't care. I've had a baby in a hospital. Everyone's seen everything. And she's she starts pouring it onto her. And then she just comes over and she grabs the palm of her hand from the tip of my neck all the way down right before my pelvic bone. And she just starts slamming all the way down. Just a boom. And she's just slapping my chest. And she just boom, boom, boom. And then I just feel this sharp pain come under my right rib. And it's like her eyes light up and she just starts pushing. Like she's gonna trying to break my lower rib there. And she's violently just pop, pop pop, pop, and then just boom again. And then she just sits up and she just, and she's vomits into her bucket. <laughs> and I just go, <laughs> what, what just happened? And they, and it was gone, the pain was gone. And afterward, the next day, we were doing the flower bath and we were saying bye to them. And I 
went up to her and I just started smiling and I just started bawling my eyes out. And I took my necklace off and gave it to her and she took her earrings off and she put them on me and then she said something in Spanish and, and the translator said, like, everything's gonna be okay now. And I looked down at my watch and it was a year to the day that Brady dropped with his TBI that put in the hospital. So it was like this whole circle of things started happening. And at this point, I had found out earlier, March that year, I, was, I had gone uh, undiagnosed TBI. So that was one of the problems of what was going on with me. I went down to the Resiliency uh, Brain Center in Coppell, Texas. Rebecca does some work with them, with Defenders of Freedom. And when Brady was struggling um, with his TBI, and by I mean struggling, I mean he, we were sitting in the garage and I was smoking some weed before bed. And we were sitting there and we listened to a podcast before bed in the garage, leave the garage door open, it's nice out, put podcast on, most of the time it's Rogan, we sit there and smoke weed and we just hang out and we talk about it. Some of the neighbors come over and it's just whatever, relax. He's sitting there and I'm kind of out like pacing, watering the flowers and he just goes, hey hun, I don't feel so good. And I'm like, what do you mean? Because he's always pretty healthy, he's standard. And he goes, he didn't grab his left side, he grabbed his right side. And he goes, something's really, really wrong. And he stood up and then just fucking went gray and dropped. And my neighbors, our family doctor, and she was at work and her husband just happened to be outside and Jack was already in bed. So I started screaming for him to come over. And I called 911 and they put me on hold. <laughs> God dang. So uh. Uh, BC has a massive shortage of paramedics and ambulance drivers, it's unbelievable. So they put me on hold and I told, I told Mark, I was like, get him in the car, just get him in the car. And it was the first moment I had almost like a, the first time I had ever had like a real true flashback moment of me not being able to move fast enough. Like when I was in the ditch trying to get to the body, it's like I couldn't get upstairs to get my shorts. I couldn't get my keys fast enough. It was like this, it was the first time I had felt that again. And so they got him into the car and I rushed him and the ambulance called on the way and they're like, we're gonna need you to pull over. I'm like, we're gonna need you to fuck off. Like I'm already at the hospital, like you're useless. And just click kind of thing, pull up to the hospital, bring Brady in. And he's sitting there in the waiting room and he's just gray and he's just violently shaking. And the nurse, <laughs> the nurse comes around and gets him in triage and this overweight, unhealthy nurse looks at my husband and goes, have you had any substances today? And he goes, well, I like, literally like a couple puffs of cannabis. She gives him the dirty look and Brady's like, I need help. And she's like, no. So they wouldn't help him. They deemed him a drug addict on the spot because he used cannabis. So they wouldn't provide proper care. Mm -hmm. So now at that point during COVID, no doctors would see us in person. No one would help us. Absolutely fucking nothing. So this is happening and I've got nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. And I remember seeing on Instagram a while ago, my buddy Ronald Farrell, who's a former ranger as well, who knew Griff, um, <clears throat> post this stuff with a lady in a white coat at this place in Texas, and he was working on his brain. Like this TBI stuff, right? And I look at Brady, and we're kind of having this conversation, and I'm like, the doctors don't know what's wrong with him. They're telling him it's mental health. They're telling him, like, we, we pay the money, we go do the MRI, we do the scans, nothing's showing up. We do the blood work. It's like, we don't know what we're looking for. None of the doctors are helping us. And so I call Ron and I send him a voice message and I'm bawling my eyes out going, I don't know what you're doing, but is there any chance any of these doctors are willing to help us? And he's like, can I have permission to say, play this to like Doc G and them? And I was like, yeah, yeah. So he plays it. And like, so Resiliency Brain Center, they treat civilians and um, ex-military. And a lot of times it's like special operators. So there's like, when I went down, there was like rangers, there's like Delta guys, there's SEALs, like they treat the gnarliest of the gnarly. And so she goes, we can get him in. Um, this was a Wednesday and Brady was in Texas on a Sunday. So Brady did a two week intensive program with Doc Gaudet and Doc Eisenman. Um, and he ended up doing amazing and it took a long time after that like don't get me wrong it we found out it, he had a tbi from when he was racing supercross so they went completely undiagnosed and so like hormone imbalances vertigo um dysautonomia like you name it he was having it he couldn't work he couldn't function he couldn't get out of bed um depression was kicking in severely he was dropping weight like going out of style and all the while canada was like he's fine it's mental health it's covid it's like there's more to this. And so they helped them. But then the deal was if 
we get them in, we know there's got to be something wrong with you. Because you've been talking, I've been kind of expressing it like, I have low-grade migraines, I have stomach issues, I have major vertigo, I have anger problems, I have a really hard time making decisions and like really just kind of sticking with something. And they're like, yep, that sounds right. And she's like, you know, you don't have to live like that, right? And I was like, well, yeah, once Brady, you know, da, da, da. she's like, okay, Brady comes down, will you come down after? And I was like, well, I'm, we can't afford both of us. And she's like, let me introduce you to Donna Cranston. And that's the CEO of Defenders of Freedom. And Donna, they're a 501, 3C, so a veteran organization, and they pay for brain treatment for veterans to go through this program. But Americans, so they got special permission to bring me down, and I was their first female combat veteran they'd ever treated. And right before I went to that, I said, well, let's make it harder. Let's make, let's, let's make it harder on myself. I'm gonna go down and do the Warrior Angel 4x4x48. <laughs> because it's for vets and for Heroic Hearts Project and I owe Heroic Hearts, Heroic Hearts Project a lot. Like I owe them the time they put into me to help me. I, if I can go show up somewhere, if it just means running, I can do that, I'll go do that. I'll go hurt myself for them and we'll fundraise. So I made a plan. Brady came back, I went down to do the four by four by 48, which was one of the wildest experiences I've ever had. We did it in the Houston forest and we did it with Andrew and Adam Marr. And then Marcus was there and Jesse was there and all the guys were there, like Bill Anthes and them from Between the Ears and his wife. Um, and it was this really, a really, really amazing therapeutic event. And we did peyote and there was a tribe that was brought in and like, it was cathartic as fuck. Like it was the best experience. And then the day after we, like the night we finished, I drove to Houston, uh, I drove to Dallas and then I went into a two week uh, inpatient kind of deal with resiliency all because Defenders of Freedom was like someone's struggling no one's going to help her in Canada we're going to step up and help her so they they helped saved me because what I realized is my inability to make decisions was because my my prefrontal cortex isn't working because of the TBI my inability to sleep was uh, a lot of it was because I was struggling hormonally. So everything, my cortisol was out of whack. Um, my dysautonomia and stuff was happening. Um, POTS was happening. So that's why I was getting car sick constantly. I was having stomach issues all the time. I had a low grade migraine all the time. It looked like I was concussed all the time. I looked stoned when I wasn't stoned. My eyes were just always kind of a little bit lower. Um, and that was all from an undiagnosed traumatic brain injury. And so I went through the treatment there and I came out and I've been doing fucking fantastic ever since but I did ayahuasca after that and it was nuts it's a different thing when your whole brain starts firing not just parts of your brain <laughs> that's a different level I stepped up another level with that but what I found was that microdosing with psilocybin and working really hard like I was telling you when I came in you're like oh here you can drink this and I'm like I'm gonna drink this because that's making a difference for me. The ketones are making a difference for me in a really big way um, because I'm struggling with blood sugar issues because of the TBI. So the ketones keep me from crashing and have all these sugar lows, but they also are just fuel for the brain in general. Do you eat sugar? Not a lot, no, no. Do you eat carbohydrates? Or are you like in a ketonic state? I'm not, in, no, I'm not. I eat carbs, like, but okay. not, not a ton okay. of carbs. Like I'll mm. have a piece of toast in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, but we don't eat like potatoes and like all that stuff. Are you on any um, other drugs like, uh, what are they called, pharmaceutical drugs anymore? No, I haven't been on any since the first time I went down to ayahuasca. When I dropped that last one, that was the last time I was on anything. And you got a book coming out mm -hmm. to get us up to speed. Yeah. The book is called Brass and Unity. It is. Which is also the name of your... Podcast uh, business. Podcast and business, everything. Instagram. Everything. It's all brass and unity. Yeah. When does the book come out? July 11th. So we are, the publisher wants pre-sales. They want it on the New York Times bestseller list. So they want to give me ample time to get it done. Yeah. Well, that's what you do. That's the, that's, that's what you do. You, the pre-sales, all the pre-sales that you do count in the first week of sales. Right. So that's right. how you get on the big list. Um, it's silly. It sounds silly to some people. And like, don't get me wrong. Like, I get it. It's But the reason I want it is because I was told I'd never get a book published ever. So why not shoot for the moon? Oh, yeah. No, definitely go for it. It's free advertising. When you get on the list, if you get on the list, then yep. you um, get free advertising from that. From that. So it's well, all good. It's, it's, I've been really lucky because um, last time I was in here, we were working on a couple different deals with some things. But in between that time frame, um, we the Afghan pullout happened. And I got drug into that in a really weird way. 
in a very like uh, unnecessary but necessary way. And so that was a wild experience and something crazy to, that we added a couple, we added like 20 pages from. Um, we were able to, Griff called again. So who am I to say no to the guy that helped me? Yeah, either that or block his number. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Just like one of the other, something really intense. Um, but yeah, so he called and he said, I have a nine pack of VIP Canadians and uh, Canada's not answering the phone. So I got on Instagram and started doing what I do, which is network really, really well. And uh, I called a couple people and no one really had answers. And um, I said, well, I'm gonna call Dean and Alana. <laughs> Cause I said, there's no way in hell they're not involved in this somehow. There's no way. So I call Alana and at this point, Dean had been on the show and Alana had been on the show and Dean and I had built a, a good friendship. We spent the last shot show, we were doing stuff over there together and Alana wasn't there. I think I know you through Dean. You do I know me through Dean. that's my original connection with yeah. you through Dean, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, so Alana, I message her and I say, hey, I'm assuming you're probably involved in this somehow. And she goes, you probably guessed right then, yeah, why, what do you need? And I said, look, I've got uh, a nine pack. I've got the head of the women's rights for the Afghan commission. And I've got her daughter, who's the national, I think she was the cricket, national cricket coach. Some, some like, they were on a lovely list is all I was being told. Um, and then they got their three-year-old. And then I got the rest of the daughters and a couple of husbands. And she's like, what do you need for me? And I said, well, I said I would try and move them because they have Canadian visas, but they're Afghan passport holders. And I said, but I need my documents cleared. And the, uh, the paperwork for the IRGC paperwork for Canada, they put, Canada put two people on it to answer all of the emails from every Canadian Afghani that was trying to get out of the country. Cute, right? Mm -hmm. Cut to a snap election by Trudeau, all in the same week of the pullout. So I get a phone call from CBC and they say, hey, Kelsey, we want to interview about how you feel about how the Afghan pullout is going. And we're going to interview a handful of you. I said, so we're gonna gaslight some veterans on national television, are we? And um, she's like, well, we just wanna have this discussion. And so then I told her what was really going on in Afghanistan. And then she, we hung up and then I got a phone call the next day. And she's like, well, so the interview has been canceled. There's been a snap election and we've been told there's a media blackout on anything Afghanistan related. I was like, fucking fantastic. Canada. So it's a good place right now. So we've got all these Canadians who are trying and nothing's working. And I say, Alana, I need some, I do need the help. And she goes, okay, send me the docs. So now we're on Kabul time. So her and I are staying awake while she's working to move people with their contracting company. And I'm just trying to get this one family out. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. All I have is signal and all I have is Instagram. <laughs> That's it, we'll figure it out. And so I, uh, one phone number got me to another phone number who got me to someone else who ended up getting me to a person on the ground named Austin, who you actually met this weekend. Right on. Um, and I didn't know his name at the time, it was just A. And I said, hey, I got these people. And he goes, I don't know who you've been talking to, but I just left a meeting and there's seven different units that are gonna be going out looking for your family here soon. He's like, you've been annoying a lot of people. <laughs> I said, yes, that's me. I will get someone to answer whether they like it or not. Um, and so cut to uh, a couple days, um, one of the day, the day right before the bombing, we end up having to move them to a different safe house, which was a bit of a shit show. Cause at that point, the three-year-old was at the gate and got beat by the Taliban with a butt stock of an AK-47. So we had a bit of an issue now. Um, and then the Americans came and took the high value, the main high value from the group, which means the rest of them were gonna be left behind. Even though I told them not to split up, they did. So we move into a second safe house and I was doing this all using grid coordinates on Google. And so um, at this point, the husband of the mother, the husband and the father of the child, he's a student in New York. So he's stuck in New York and he's messaged me on Signal going, what's going on, what's going on? And they're messaging me on Signal and then I'm dealing with other people trying to just get a route or a place to get them inside this airport. And everyone's doing this, you know this. Everybody was like going around the government, backdooring people, calling people. We were all just, anybody was just trying to get anybody on any plane. And so I said to this guy, Austin, I was like, hey, um, I owe you one if you can help me out. And he goes, yeah, 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 let's just, let's get this going here. He's like, I'm gonna give you a 45 minute window. You're gonna be within that airport in 45 minutes. And I can't help you after this. Cause we had blown two windows already. We had missed two windows. One, because they were too afraid to leave 
because this was right after the bombing. So the bomb went off. Now everyone's too afraid to go anywhere. And then we were getting warnings that there were more bombs being placed near mosques. So they didn't want to leave at all. And the kid was getting worse. So then he said, I just need them to be within 45 minutes. So then we had to move them to a different safe house. So I find a grid. I send them the grid. I tell the husband to chill the fuck out because he's not listening. And he's freaking out. And then they're kind of freaking out because now I've got them on a 24-hour watch where they're watching the phone to make sure. Because the Americans said to me, like, give me their phone number. I'm going to call. If they don't answer, we're on to the next one. So they're on a 24-hour watch. Everyone's kind of getting heightened and no one's sleeping. And then I still haven't got the documents cleared to get them on a plane. And then Alana finally calls and goes, hey, I made a call. I got them cleared. Here's the information. Sends it all to me. So she did some backdoor deal to get it all kind of dialed for me with the British. And so we get that. And all while this is happening, I'm doing this over voice notes. So I'm having voice notes back and forth with the family on the ground and then voice notes with, excuse me, with Enya on the phone. And the cool thing about that now looking back is as annoying as I am and I always send voice notes, this is fucking something cool to have now to look back at because no one would believe it because it's goddamn ridiculous. So next thing you know, we get a 45 minute window I put him in a taxi and I say, I need you to just go. I'm going to give you a grid and I need you to go sit in the taxi there. So they do. They go sit in the taxi and they're waiting. I said, and then I, Austin texts and he goes, I need you to send me a photo of them. So they send like a photo of them like smiling in the taxi and he's like, send me a fucking photo of their whole body. Like he starts because he's going in and out and in and out and he's just like, I don't have time to mess around. You need to just give me what I need. And so they get out. I like, get out, take a picture. So they get out, they take a picture. He goes, does somebody have a bright colored scarf? I was like, I don't like where this is going. And I said, yes, why? And he goes, tell me what color. I said, I got a red scarf. He's like, okay, perfect. So he's like, I'm going to give you this 45 minute window. When I say go, you need to move him to the next grid I give you. So we're all kind of sitting and they're waiting. And then gunfire is kind of going off. So they're starting to freak out because they're like, we can't be on the street. We need to go. And then he finally says go. And he gives me a grid. And at this point, we had been awake I'd been awake for four four days. So like trying to sleep every couple hours because we're running on Kabul time. And I'm in <laughs> I'm in Vancouver in my cul-de-sac screaming into my phone, leaning against my Tesla, where all my neighbors are just like, what is she the crazy lady yelling about now? And I'm like, run through the open fire, run! <laughs> like I'm losing my shit into the phone and I'm trying to watch Jack play and they're just like, what the fuck? So... This is all happening. And I said to Brady, I'm like, it's go time. You need to you need to deal with him. You need to deal with him. And so he takes Jack and, and we're doing the thing. And I'm going back and forth on the phone. We get him to the grid and they're standing outside. And you can hear it in the background. And there's like guns going off and cops are screaming. And she's, Wawa Lush starts screaming. She's like, they're telling me to stop waving the scarf. They're going to shoot on me. They're going to shoot on me. Like they tell me to leave the area. And I said, you need to go to like the service road. I need you to stand there. I've never, by the way, I've never been in Kabul. So I'm using Google Mm -hmm. to figure this out. So this happens and he goes, I'm gonna pop smoke, tell him to stand there. And so they pop smoke and she voice messages me losing it. They're throwing tear gas, we have to run, we have to run. I'm like screaming at the top of my lungs. Like I could never be a handler because I am not calm. And I'm just like, stay in the fucking smoke. Like I'm just losing my shit at her because we were told at this point that because of who the mom was, they were they were going to be found. It was like, take them or die. Like that was the conversation I was being told. And so I was starting to freak out because they were the, I was the only option they had left. And if it didn't happen, what was going to happen to them? Was it going to be another way I left Afghanistan, like in a fucking disgrace and not the way I wanted to leave? Or could I actually pull this off and redeem some sort of something, right? Just anything. Because the way I left those kids last time, was I was the thing of nightmares. I wanted to be the thing that helped for once. So when they pop smoke, he says to me, um, I said, hey dude, thank you for doing this. And he goes, "What? I have it in the book, um, but he basically there's a screenshot and he's like, well, we weren't gonna trust it, leave it to Canadians. They're not even a real fucking country anyway. And so <laughs> I'm just like, this is great timing. He goes, tell him to stand there in the smoke and start waving the red scarf. So I tell her to start waving the scarf. Cops come over and they're pointing guns and they're screaming at them and she's screaming. And he goes, I'm about to send my buddy D out. He's in shorts and a t-shirt with no kit. He's got a huge beard and big muscles. He gets shot in the head, it's on you. Fucking fantastic, this is a good day. So they're screaming and I just keep telling him, stay in the smoke and like they're like, no we can't. I said, I finally snapped and I said, 
and I listened to it back today because I can't believe I said it. And I, she thanked me afterwards, but I was like, if, and I screamed at the top of my lungs, if you do not run into the smoke, you're going to fucking die and your head is going to be cut off. Run into the fucking smoke. And I was losing my shit. So you ran into the smoke and then everything went dead silent. Like no one was communicating with me. And then I just got a text message from Austin and it just said jackpot. And they pulled the family and it was the, I was standing on the back deck and Brady and Jack were inside the house and the screen door was, the door was open, the screen door was there and Jack came running over because as soon as it hit jackpot, I just fell down and I just started fucking bawling my eyes out. And Jack goes, mommy, did we win? And I was like, you're fucking right, we won. And like, yes, we won. And like, we beat the Taliban, one family. I did one thing, I got one family. That's all I wanted to do. And it was a bunch of like, like school age girls. Um, Shabnam is in Ottawa doing her doctorate. She had a guest lecture spot at Ottawa University. Wawala and her husband and her child are in New York and Farhan is never gonna have to go back there. And the rest of the girls are in school and are functioning. So I'm like, okay, you know what? If that's how I left Afghanistan the first time, that's fine. But that's not how I chose to leave forever. So I did that uh, in between the books. So we added that into the book and we did, um, got permission from the family and um, Enya, the husband wrote a quote on the back and um, I got permission to just transcribe the voice notes. So when you read it, it's like the, you can see that she's not English speaking. <laughs> yeah, and it's you, funny to read. Yeah, it's, I was, they're like, can we correct this? I was like, no, no, the editor's like, we have to. I'm like, no, you no. can't, you can't correct it. And so then they let me put some photos in and then the day that they actually made it um, into the States, they sent me a video of Enya seeing Farhan for the first time again. And then now they send me like videos on the birthdays and stuff. And I'm going to see them when I go to New York to do some press and some things like that. And we haven't met in person yet. So I'm like really stoked to do that. But I was only able to do that because like Alana answered the phone like on a random, like again, my podcast got me to someone who then got me to that person who then got me to her who I was able to. So it's just, you know, everything happens. <clears throat> the way it's supposed to happen, whether it's painful, whether it's necessary, whether it's fucking shitty, there's lessons in every single thing that we do and we just have to choose to see them. Well, I'm glad you uh, got the W. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good way to close out that deal. That was the, oh, man, I remember just lying on the couch being like, there's no fucking way I can do this. Like, what am I doing? I just started using Instagram, man. Mm -hmm. I think everybody did, but it just, it took the right person to be like, I'm going outside of the chain and I'm gonna do something because it's the right thing to do, not because I have to do it, but because it's the right thing to do. And also this bitch is not gonna stop texting me excessively if I don't do what she's asked. Yeah, it's the free market. I mean, this is really like the free market versus the government system. I right. mean, everyone that, every, I mean, look, the government did get people out, but the yeah. free market got, <laughs> the free market folks really got a lot of stuff done, which was awesome. And whether it's, you know, people like Chad and Tim Kennedy that mm -hmm. got out, you know, thousands of people, mm -hmm. great, that's awesome. For you helping to get out nine people, that's freaking awesome too. Like everybody counts. I just couldn't sit there and watch it. Like I couldn't sit in my cushy office and watch it and not try. Yeah, and this whole conversation has made me realize that it must be really weird to be your neighbor. <laughs> um, when I come your home, your neighbors must be like, dude. Well, when I first moved, when I first moved to that house in a cul-de-sac, so it's like a fishbowl, right? Mm -hmm. When I first moved to that cul-de-sac, there was multiple RCMP officers in the house and in, in houses there and things like that. And the first experience they ever had with me, well, the the neighbor actually wrote about it. One of the neighbors is married to uh, an individual who's Muslim, which is not a big deal. It's totally fine. I can be fine with that now. First five years, real rough. Then I started to learn about things and understand things and educate myself, and I was fine. Um, anyway, <laughs> I just moved in. We were there maybe a week. One of the neighbors was taking Christmas lights down, and she was over there, and I, you know, got the guts and was like, I'm going to go introduce myself. I'm going to go be a good neighbor. I don't normally do that. I walked over, said, hello, nice to meet you. She goes, hello, and he goes, hello, and we're talking, and she thinks it's funny, and she leans down, and she goes, are you the one with the veteran plates on your car? And I said, yes, um, and she goes, well, my husband and children are Muslim, so you're not gonna kill them, are you? <laughs> 
And my response, being me, was, I don't kill the children. You ask a stupid question, you're going to get a stupid answer. So they've learned about me. Uh, they've learned that there's things I don't like. There's things I like. Uh, and they've learned to just accept me for me. I come home from Peru. I go lie in the middle of the cul-de-sac and look at the stars and smoke a joint for hours. And they're like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> like I said, must be very interesting to be your neighbor. <laughs> oh, man. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a trip, I say the least. But you know what? Well... As hard as we are as our, on our neighbors, is like we have we have a good amount of them that would would do anything for us, and I would show up for any of them. Um, I just wish there'd be less houses; they just keep piling mm -hmm. more in, and so that's my only squawk is I need some space. And um, actually, after your show, because of your show, I had a I had a bit of an issue where I had to call some police in the states, make sure someone didn't cross a border. And, you know, it just, it got to the point where privacy became a priority. Where I live, where my son goes to school, mm -hmm. it started to become a priority. Yeah, those are good things to think about. Yeah, yeah. So, and it got a little crazier when we started, like, so when I was on last time, the book was about to come out. We ended up pulling it and we ended up getting a publishing deal with a U.S. publisher, which was great. Um, I went with Post Hill through Simon & Schuster and they did uh, the book with, uh, what is it called? Stuart Scheller's book. Um, so I knew they were more military-esque and I went with them and they, they really trusted me with this and let me add a bunch of chapters and like really revamp what I wanted to do. And um, when it came time for the book to be published, that's when the McDonough's came forward and, and bought the rights to be produced and turned into a TV series. And that's why we changed the names in the book because those are the names that are gonna be used in, the, in either the movie or the series. So it'll just overlap really smoothly. Um, and so when we got that opportunity, it, we wanted to make sure it was kind of tied together with Neil and whenever they were ready for like deadline to come out and announce it and whenever the book was ready. So it overlapped really well and I was really, really lucky and um, a lot of people supported me on this and then I was able to take it to other people in our community and be like, read this. Would you review it? Tell me what you think about it. Um, and if, if you do like it, would you put a quote in it? And I had so many people offer to do that. Um, and that was a really cool experience because it's like being at your own funeral. Because this book is my life and people are talking about your life to your face. Um, and so that was a, a bit of a trip to kind of get those things back and kind of see what people really thought or whether they just wanted to make me happy or not. But like some of them put some interesting uh, quotes in it. But I had a lot of SEALs and Rangers and British uh, special operators and members of the British Empire and doctors who were all willing to put their name on the book. And then Neil McDonough himself. And I was really, 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 really fortunate to be able to actually get this to the finish line because it's been such a long process. And then to know that it's hopefully going to end up on screen and hopefully I just hope someone learns something like whether it's leadership or an individual because I can tell you right now last time I did your show and I text Helen like the day after because I never ever been inundated like that before with people who needed help and people just saying your interview made me cry and it made me cry because it made me realize how many of the same things I was going through but I was unwilling to listen to myself or talk to myself about or even tell anyone about so it opened a door and that's all I needed was I needed the door opened so that I could kick it all the way off the fucking hinges so that people don't have to keep doing this anymore and nor that this is this is all fixable. We can heal from this. The, the generation of this going from 22 to 44 a day is bullshit and unacceptable and it never needs to be like this at all. It takes buddy checks. It takes accountability and effort on ourselves to heal ourselves and that's what's happening now. And that's why you're seeing legislation change and why you're seeing psychedelics being integrated and other people showing up for each other. Do your buddy checks, period. Work with organizations who do buddy checks, who care about the longevity of someone's health and not just sending them on a psychedelic trip. Work with people who do integration. Work with people who look at TBIs. So we started condensing down the organizations I work with and only focusing on a handful of them because there's so many of them that are doing, there's like 46,000. I had a, I had the CEO of the boot campaign, Shelly Kirkland on the show. She's a good friend and her and I had this conversation and I was like, why is it that there's all these amazing organizations and yet the suicides are going up? What's happening here? And she's like, well, no one's talking. And it's because we have all of these spots all over the United States and Canada of all these amazing organizations that are doing tons of work. Like 46,000 is like the number in the US. It's like a ridiculous amount of people that work for veterans. It's insane nonprofit level. But none of them talk. 
And it's like, this is compartmentalization. We understand that communication is key. We need to talk. So I've been talking to a couple different individuals like Moral Compass Federation who they have, um, I believe the organization that Tim and them have, say, is it Save, Save Our Save Alice? Alice? Yeah, they're a part of it as well, like Flanders Field. Like there's a bunch of different ones. They're a part of it and it's like a coalition of forces. So it's like these people all specialize in something. Because what I found out after your show was the amount of work I had to do just to get somebody in a certain state help, right? So I for like, <clears throat> until the episode went down, I literally spent all that entire time just trying to get people to different organizations. Okay, call them, they don't do what I need. Okay, do you know somebody that might do what I need? Well, you could try them. And then I would just do that until we got people into spots. And then I really started to look at things like who's really doing the heavy lifting. And then I started to really align myself with them. So like we do a, our, in September, we do our buddy check bracelet, the You Matter one with Boot Campaign for Suicide Prevention. So we work with Boot Campaign on that. <clears throat> Defenders of Freedom, we work with, with to get people TBI. So really specific, really driven traumatic brain injury support. And then with Honor House in Canada, that's the only Canadian organization we work with. And they're doing a tour right now where they're raising a million dollars for their 120 acre ranch up in Ashcroft, British Columbia that deals with operational stress injury only. It's like 10 cabins um, and a main house and they bring people up and they just work heavy, heavy stuff, whether it's families or big groups. Um, so we work with them. They're the only Canadians I, I give money to. I know them, I love them, and I think they're they're like Ronald McDonald for first responders and veterans. They don't just do vets. And you can go and stay there for free and they'll look after your entire family. No duration, like time limit. They're insane people for that. And then I work with, so we've got Heroic Hearts Project, All Secure Foundation, which is Jen and Tom Satterley. Um, those are good friends. And I, I really believe in what they're doing for, for relationships because I think it's so important when you're looking at a family unit, right? If you want the, the whole family unit to work, these two have to work. It can't just be the kids above the parents. It has to be the parents first. Everything else works together when there's communication. So I really, really love them. So it's, And then there's vets with is Marcus Capone, which you know Marcus well mm -hmm. and Amber. Um, and so try to highlight and help any of these organizations to try to get more attention and because the work they're doing is the work that's really making the difference, right? I'm, I'm tired of supporting all these different organizations where I'm not seeing the money go where it needs to. And that's why I've cut it down to just these handfuls. I've seen the work. I've been a part of the work. I've experienced the work. And I know the difference it's making long term, not just short term. So all of these people I put in the book and then we're going to donate portions of the proceeds again of the book to all these different organizations. And then Rebecca Rouse and I partnered and we're working on a new book together as well. So my goal is get this thing on the list so that when her and I do it, we're going to donate the portion of the proceeds to Defenders of Freedom from her and our book as well. So we're just trying to use everything that I'm doing and anything that I'm doing, whether it's my podcast and the sponsors I have to the business and the buddy check bracelet and the book and now the film to put the money in the hands of the organizations that are doing the boots on the ground work because I can't fix everyone. And it's also not my responsibility to fix everyone. But if I can help fund the people that have that responsibility, I can live with that. And you can find all this stuff at brassandunity.com? Yeah, everything's at brassandunity.com. Um, we have a Patreon now for Brass and Unity for the people that join. Um, that's another thing we started after your show. We have a thing on Instagram, we do Mental Health Monday. So we go live and then we have a group on Signal. So we have people from all over the world that join this group and it's just like a, a support network of any type. You don't have to be military. And then we issue challenges every month. So whether it's physical or psychological, we issue three points every single month and we want you to do them uh, every single day for 30 days and try to stack habits so that we can get people feeling better healing and moving forward and that can be everything from we're going to walk two kilometers a day we're going to drink two liters of water we're going to do five minutes of breath work and then the next month we're going to read 10 pages of a book we're going to uh, eliminate a negative habit um, and then we're going to stop alcohol this month like and we're just stacking these habits and so after your show we were able to garner a big enough group where we started the signal group chat and you can get onto it through Patreon and you can just be a part of, we have people everywhere in the world, it's nuts. I've never experienced anything like it. You got this guy in Italy, you got a guy in Australia who never walked, a, barely walked a day in his life. And now this guy's walking six, seven kilometers a day, it's insane. We had a guy who used to drink nine cans of Coca-Cola a day, he's down to zero soda. <laughs> so it's like, this stuff can work with community. We just need to realize that we need to stop being the people who act as if we, not that we're bigger than everyone else, but like we've all been through serious shit. We all are worth 
the time and we're all worth the effort. And if we put the effort in, others will show up for you to help support that. And community is everything to what I do. Everything. It means I don't care if I make money. I never have. It's never been a part of it. Community. Our community is in this dire straits because there's no reason why these suicide numbers need to be keep going up. There's no reason. We have too many communication devices. We have too many people who care. We need to start showing up for each other and calling each other. Buddy check. It's not fucking difficult. Five fine people on your phone, be accountable to those people. And then get another five, get those five people to get five other people to be accountable to. But make the phone calls. That's why I work with like Zach Bell, Veteran with the Sign. That's why I work with all these people because they care about the outcome. They don't care about the money. They care about the outcome. Is that person going to stay alive or am I going to have to go to that person's funeral? Well, no, they're going to stay alive because I made the call when I knew they were off. Like, don't be afraid to say something. What's that saying? See something, say something. If we all said something, most of the time, I'll bet you there'll be some people that would still be with us. We just need to put the effort in. <sighs> yep. Um, it's been a rough... Uh couple months for us in the SEAL community, that's for damn sure. I heard. Um, Instagram. Yeah. Brass and Unity. Brass and Unity. Facebook, Brass and Unity. YouTube, Brass and Unity. You also have Kelsey Sharon. Yeah. They finally. Kelsey underscore Sharon. Yeah, they finally decided that that was verifiable enough. Uh, It was funny. Once the deadline article came out, they're like, oh, she's not a weirdo. We'll give her a blue check mark. Mm. I was like, oh, that's how that works, huh? Does blue check mark mean you're not a weirdo? I mean, I think it means that you're a weirdo. You're just like a little easier to track down. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So now everything's everything's there. Everything's on social. You can get a hold of us. Uh, That's my thing I will say, and I mean this. Don't comment. If you comment, I'm not reading it. I don't read comments anymore. I said that to Andy and he was like, I'm gonna send you some comments and I'm gonna say, go fuck yourself. Like, don't send me your comments. DM me, if it even starts with anything I don't like, I won't even open it. So (laughs) if you need help, you can DM us, I will help you. If you need support, we will help you. If you genuinely want help, that's fine. But if you get on there and you make comments about my big heavies or that I was too aggressive or that I'm too rough and I swear too much and blah, blah, fuck off. I don't have time for it anymore. You don't get to live in my head anymore. I played this game before. I'm not playing it again. Simple as that. So keep it positive, people, which is a good overall recommendation for life. I think so in general. Anything else? We miss anything? Go check out those organizations. Go check out those organizations. That's and it. you can and the easiest way to find them is Brass and Unity. You got links to them on there? We got them all on the donation pages, okay. places you can find them. And then check out the people we work with. They matter, they make a difference. Cured nutrition, uh, ketones, they'll make a difference in your life. I've been really lucky to have Daisy May. They're on it's the crown on my head that I wear that people think I don't have a forehead, so it's fine. We just wear the hat all the time and it's like it's quiet up there. Got it. Got yeah. it. Awesome. Well, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming down to Dago once again and hanging out. Appreciate it. Thanks for your service and thanks for what you're doing right now to uh, try and help out as many people as you can. Well, thanks for having me back. Can't say I expected it, but I am uh, happy to be here. Right on. And with that, Kelsey Sharon has left the building. Um, Lots to think about. Definitely some mental health issues to think about. And I would say, personally, mental health is going to be helped out, aided much by physical health. Mm-hmm. And I, look, I can't recommend drinking things that make you uh, throw up and all that stuff. Because yeah. I don't have any experience in that area of life, right? Yeah. But I yeah. do have experience drinking protein. Sure. Drinking ready to drink protein. Oh, yeah, all day. I'm going to recommend, yep. hey, if you want to go in that direction, First of all, I think she said a bunch of stuff about doctors and uh, the pat, like whatever you're doing. There's a protocol. Follow the protocol, right? Yes. Yeah. In the meantime, I know some protocol. Yeah. You're gonna need protein. Yeah. Go to jockofuel.com get protein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true, man. Go to jockofuel.com get some protein. Yep. Get some get some pow pow. Right. Oh, yeah. Hell the yeah. new official term for for powdered protein is pow pow. Yep. Pow. So get some of that. Mulk, pow pow, get some RTD. I'm I'm about to have one, by the way. I had two already. Oh yeah, you're just over there getting after it. Oh yeah, the I mix the. So this is what I did this time. It's not my first time. You drink half the chocolate, half the banana. 
you mix them. Dang. Then you mix them together for that banana chocolate. <laughs> hey, man, you got to get creative with these things, you know, to make the, 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 the whole experience more enjoyable. Ready to drink. Check that out. Get your, obviously, I mean, the only reason we're basically functioning right now is because we got Jocko Discipline Go. Get yourself some Go, the good energy drink. You know what? So check this out. <clears throat> Time War. Mm-hmm. Time War. We released Time War. It's got, obviously, vitamins, minerals, some anti-aging stuff in there. So check this out. I, we're at the muster. Mm-hmm. I'm at the muster, and I'm looking at the downstage monitor. You know what that means? Yeah, so when you're standing down. on stage... You there's a there's two big monitors right down there, mm-hmm. and they have like what's next on the schedule. They have like your notes for your PowerPoint thing, sure. and I don't have a lot of notes. Anyways, I get there, I'm on stage, I'm looking, I go, and I ask the AV guy, I go, "Hey man, are these? Do we get bigger downstage monitors?" And he's like, "No," and I go, "Do you have this in some new setting for the font?" And he goes, "No, it's the same." It's yeah. the same. It's literally the same exact thing that we always run. Mm. And I was like, "Oh, dang!" <laughs> I could see. Yeah, I could l- literally see better. Now, yeah. look, I have good vision. Knock on wood, bro. Knock on wood. Yeah. Right? I don't. Ha- I don't wear glasses, mm-hmm. and I'm 51 years old. Mm-hmm. But you know, sometimes I would be like, oh, I'd be looking at that thing down there. You know, yeah. sometimes you're 10 feet away from looking across the stage, and you're looking. It's 20 feet away. Yeah. Sometimes I would. It'd be. I'd be able to read it. But it'd be a little bit of a, you know? Yeah, yeah. And but honestly, different. most of the time when I'm looking at my slides, it says add notes here because I don't actually have any notes when <laughs> sure. I talk. I just, I'm talking. Sure. But even seeing add notes here, I was like, why is that so clear? Yeah. So I don't know what's going on. Yep. I'm not uh, making scientific claims here, yep. but, I, but I literally could see better. And we've got like lutein in there. We've got ingredients in there that absolutely help. They're, it's, they are meant for ocular supplementation and I'm gonna say bro like literally squared away and and vision improvement yeah so time war go get it give it a shot see how it makes you feel it is legit yeah it's funny that uh, because you you know how you get in the routine of taking something you know and you know so a lot of like especially supplements and vitamins like this kind of stuff it's not like drugs like let's say certain drugs like caffeine or Mm -hmm. alcohol or something you feel it right then and there that's how drugs are right even if you take a pill it's like a couple minutes few minutes later you're like oh i I feel it Mm because it's like psychoactive but supplements like a lot of times they take a while so, you know, I just get it like joint warfare. That ex- exact thing happened to me with joint warfare yeah. where I'm, I just start taking it. And of course, the next day you're not feeling it. But it was like later that week or early the next week. I was like, you know how like when you warm up, I'm very in touch with my body. Right. That's, you know. And, you know, when you warm up, you're like, oh, that warm up set. I know exactly like the level of stiffness, mm-hmm. soreness, energy, even like with my breath and stuff. Like I'm really, really in touch with it. So there's a small evaluation that goes down. And I remember doing my first warm-up, I was like, oh, I'm feeling like a pop in my step, pep in my step, a kind pop. of a good pop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a pop in your no, joints. No, pop in the <laughs> no, I mean, I felt like, you know, you have that snap in mm-hmm. your body. Yeah. Like, you just feel like more like powerful or whatever. Yeah. The warm-up seemed like, oh, man, I kind of don't even need to warm up. The stiffness is already gone. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm just, and it's one of those things where I'm, oh, I'm feeling abnormally good today. I was like, yeah, that's good. Then the next day, I was kind of the same deal where I'm like, dang, I'm kind of feeling good. And you don't really remember yep. because it's not this new thing. You've been doing it for like a week, week and a half already. You yep. see what I'm saying? Then you think back, wait, what's what could be caught? You're like, exa- oh, that's, that's the that's the factor. That's right there. exactly it. That's what I had too because I've been on Time War for like six months now. When was the last muster? I, I wasn't on Time War yet, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so then all of a sudden I go, and I was like walking around the stage going, I can still see him around. I can see him around. I was... <laughs> And I, and I thought to myself, what is different? Yeah. What is different? And I was like, oh, literally taking a supplement that has ocular health ingredients yeah. in it, and I can see better now. The thing was just working. The Hallelujah, whole time. <laughs> bro! It's freaking awesome. Yeah. For, for so sure. yeah, it's get good. check out the Time War. Um, it's awesome. You can get this stuff at jogglefuel.com. You can get you can get it at Wawa. Look, we got moved a little bit. We got some. We got the imperialists. Mm-hmm. The empire, oh, the yeah. big beverage empires, sure. they're trying to attack the rebels, yeah. which is go. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They're trying to attack. They're trying to snuff us out. Like we're over here, Star Wars style, freaking yep. American Revolution style. They they they're putting, they're throwing their resources at us, trying to crush us we're down there in that little corner. Yep. But go in there, ask for it. Number one, God, I just found out too. We were crushing. We we had Mulk in Wawa for a little while before the imperialistic empires came and bought some of our slots, mm. and we were crushing. People were picking. People were picking Mulk mm. over. Let's call them the other protein options. Oh damn! But and that's what freaked out the big, the big papas. They were like, "Oh, we can't have the, we can't have these guys coming up." So they bought the space for the protein. Yes, they definitely bought the space for the protein. All of them. Damn. And they bought like two out of five slots for drinks, and they bought the primes. And these are things that look to Wawa's credit, they let us in there because they 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 had a good uh, amount of requests for it. Yeah. But then, you know, they, they're running a business. Yeah. I get it. They're running a business. It's a deal. Yeah. But also, they want to have some options for the people. Yeah. And so let's face it. We're, we're literally selling something that's good for people. They know that, too. So when now when I walk into Wawa, I want to I want to go or a protein or whatever. What? All I, I got to shift my eyes down, down. Down. Yep. And you can't get a protein there right now. Okay. So now what you, what you do is you go, hey. You hit them up on social media like, hey, we had, we had some Jocko Mulk in here. We were all feeling good. We were running our you know, construction equipment better. Mm-hmm. You know, We were doing a good job. Now we're getting fed trash. Yep. So can you yes. help us live? Can you help us be better? So yeah. that's what you do at Wawa. Yeah. We're in Vitamin Shop. By the way, b- best brand in bot- Vitamin Shop. Did you see that? Yes. Victory is ours. Yes, victory that was freaking ours. awesome. Thank you, everybody, for the support there. Military Commissaries, Hannaford's Dash Stores, Wake Foreign ShopRite, Circle K in Florida. H-E-B and Meyer. We're in H-E-B and Meyer, and we're also in Harris Teeter now. Nice. So so check those out. Go in there. Get it on. You don't have to order. You can pick it right up at the store, yep. and you're good to hook. Yeah, especially those smoke RTDs. That's mm-hmm. like the thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a little, stop right it's in. Like a, it's, just a, it's just a move. It's a move. It's a little bit of a game changer. <laughs> <laughs> that and a time war. Yep. That freaking time war is no joke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling like I'm freaking Superman walking around with X-ray vision up in this piece. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's How like, crazy is that? Your vision is probably back to where it was, like you know, in your 20s or whatever. You know, the yeah. you know that prime time when yeah. all your freaking what it would collagen, hyaluronic acid, Dude, you know, all the stuff that's keeping it. you young. And you just went back there, but you got used to being, you know, your 50 year old eyes. Yeah. And now you're back to 20s, and now you can really feel Dude. The, the harness the power. So there you go. Uh, check it out, jockofuel.com, originusa.com. If you need hunt gear, if you need jujitsu gear, if you need rash guards, if you need geese, if you need t-shirts, if you need joggers, if you need jeans, which you need, get yourself some Delta 68s. Mm-hmm. Cause then things are freaking the best things you can put on your legs. It's true. It's part of my uniform, by the way. Delta 68. It's 100%. Yeah, you know, the, when you said that, the, what, do you, what do you call them, the tiers of uniform? You know, you have your camis, oh, you got your dress up. blues, you yeah. got your, you know, the, the Delta 68 is Delta my top 68. dress uniform. That is a good dress move. OriginUSA.com, made in America. We just brought out a new gi, the Nano Pro. Have you tried it yet? You have mine. Why? I think it's actually sitting over there, bro. All right, there you you want to come and get on the mats? You can throw that gi on, homie. Come on now. <laughs> I got to come and get it. <laughs> yeah, you got to come and get it. All right, yes, sir. But they are the best gi ever. Mm. Best gi ever. We did it again. So check that out, originusa.com. Made in America. And look, we got freaking the Chinese right now surrounding. They're make, doing exercises off of Taiwan. They're making moves. Mm. And we're sitting over here without a good supply chain. Except for us, we'll, we'll be able to make geese, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They want to go to war? Cool. Bring your own geese, people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Made in America. It's a real thing, man. It is no joke. That's what we're doing. We're bringing back that supply chain, and we're bringing back manufacturing to America. OriginUSA.com. Go check it out. It's true. Also, Jocko has a store called Jocko Store. So you go to JockoStore.com. That's where you can get your discipline equals freedom shirts. Good. Good shirts. Get it there. Also, we have the shirt locker, which is a monthly subscription scenario. You get a new shirt every month. It's a good one. I was at the muster. Oh, I saw a lot of people represent. And you know what's massive, cool? Massive it's cool is it, it's just the next thing, right? Yeah. It's like a next level thing. Yeah. It's like, yep, you're in the game. Yeah. It's funny because like 
every to see your reaction is funny because you don't you're not always updated on the new one, yeah. the new shirt, you know. <laughs> so like you'll be smiling and we'll be like, where did that shirt come from? Yeah, it's a good one because it's a good one. Yeah. It's like when you were a little kid and you put on a new pair of shoes. And maybe you think you run a little bit faster. <laughs> You see people yep. with that shirt on, they're walking. They're walking fast. With a little bit more, you know, a little bit more oomph. A yep. little bit more authority in the world. It's so true. So get on that, yep. get on that, uh, jockostore.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to jockounderground.com. We talked about, you know, we done, we covered some different subjects on there. We're trying to ex- explain things in the world mm-hmm. that don't really quite fit into Jocko Podcast, but. Definitely things we need to know about. So that's jockounderground.com. It's also a platform that we own that we can't get kicked off of because we own it, fool. Like, you know, when you were a kid, you're like, one day I'm going to own a restaurant. Yeah. I'm going to get, I'll be able to go in there and get a chocolate shake <laughs> and a freaking triple burger. Oh, yeah. I still you know? think that. By yeah. The way. So there you go. Well, now we have our own little platform. It's not a restaurant, really, but kind of cool still. Yeah. <laughs> Improve your life. I'll tell you that. Yep. Uh, that's eight dollars and eighteen cents a month. Hey, if you can't if you can't afford it, we still want you in the underground. We still want you to have the knowledge. Just email assistance at jockounderground.com. But if you can kick in a little bit, that helps too. That's how we keep the 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 mainframe up and running. Did I say mainframe? Yes, sir. Kind of a technologist Approved. over here. Approved. Uh, YouTube channel. Subscribe to that. Subscribe to the Origin USA YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Jocko Fuel YouTube. We've got all kinds of YouTube channels there going on. Psychological warfare. Flipsidecanvas.com. You got Dakota Meyer. I've written a bunch of books. Check them out. You know what they are. Uh, also, we have Echelon Front. It's our leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com. We just did a muster. Biggest muster ever. Sold out. We sell out everything. So if you want to come to one of our events, go to echelonfront.com, click events, and see which one you want to go to. FTX, Council, Battlefield. Like, what do you want to come and do? Check that out. We also have online training, extremeownership.com. We are doing, well, we're constantly going online. We're interacting. We have courses that you can take. We're putting up new courses on a regular basis. Leadership is not something that you just know how to do. It's not something you're born with. You gotta learn it and then you gotta train it and you gotta practice it. And it's not something for just like, oh, I'm the CEO, I need leadership training. No, you're a new person at a command, new person at a company, new person in a family, and you gotta interact with other people. You need to know how to lead. That's what we're doing. Extremeownership.com, come learn how to lead in life. And if you want to help service members, active and retired, of course, Kelsey's got um, her brassandunity.com. She's got a bunch of charities that she's working to support. So go check those out. Also, if you want to help service members, active and retired, you want to help their families, want to help Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. And if you want to donate or get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And also don't forget about Micah Fink, who's got heroesandhorses.org. We just got a report from him from the field. Apparently, he just whittled a stick and then killed a mountain lion with it, and he's eating it at this time while he is in an ice bath (laughs) in a river. (laughs) So Micah Fink is out there. He's really helping a lot of vets uh, find themselves by getting lost in nature. So go check that out as well. If you wanna connect with Kelsey, once again, brassandunity.com, brassandunity.com. Her Instagram is Brass and Unity. Her Facebook is Brass and Unity. Her YouTube is Brass and Unity. She's also on there at Kelsey underscore Sharon. It's S-H-E-R-E-N. And for us, Echoes at Echo Charles, um, at Jocko Willink. Just look, be careful because there's an algorithm on there and it's got your name written on it. So just watch out. Thanks again to Kelsey for joining us and thanks to all the troops that are out there around the world right now that are standing watch and protecting our freedom and our way of life. And the same goes to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all first responders. Thank you for protecting us here at home. And to everyone else out there, look, you may not be in combat, literally, but combat and life are very similar. They are a struggle. They are a struggle, and sometimes you can get pulled down. 
and you got to get yourself back up and you do that by working hard by being disciplined and getting up there and taking the high ground that's what you do go make it happen and until next time this is echo and jocko out